Chapter 1, Part 1 of The Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book 2, by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Roy Haynes. Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book the Second of the rights of things, of property in general. The former book of these commentaries, having treated at large of the jura personarum, or such rights and duties as are annexed to the persons of men, the objects of our inquiry in this second book will be the jura rerum, or those rights which a man may acquire in and to such external things as are unconnected with his person. These are what the writers on natural law style the rights of dominion, or property, concerning the nature and original of which I shall first premise a few observations before I proceed to distribute and consider its several objects. There is nothing which so generally strikes the imagination and engages the affections of mankind as the right of property, or that sole and despotic dominion which one man claims and exercises over the external things of the world in total exclusion of the right of any other individual in the universe. And yet, there are very few that will give themselves the trouble to consider the original and foundation of this right. Pleased as we are with the possession, we seem afraid to look back to the means by which it was acquired, as if fearful of some defect in our title or at best, we rest satisfied with the decision of the laws in our favor without examining the reason or authority upon which those laws have been built. We think it enough that our title is derived by the grant of the former proprietor, by descent from our ancestors, or by the last will and testament of the dying owner. Not caring to reflect that accurately and strictly speaking, there is no foundation in nature or in natural law why a set of words upon parchment should convey the dominion of land, why the sun should have the right to exclude his fellow creatures from a determinate spot of ground because his father had done so before him, or why the occupier of a particular field or of a jewel, when lying on his deathbed and no longer able to maintain possession, should be entitled to tell the rest of the world which of them should enjoy it after him. These inquiries, it must be owned, would be useless and even troublesome in common life. It is well if the mass of mankind will obey the laws when made, without scrutinizing too nicely into the reasons of making them. But when law is to be considered not only as a matter of practice, but also as a rational science, it cannot be improper or useless to examine more deeply the rudiments and grounds of these positive constitutions of society. In the beginning of the world, we are informed by Holy Writ, the all-bountiful Creator gave to man dominion over all the earth and over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. This is the only true and solid foundation of man's dominion over external things, whatever airy metaphysical notions may have been started by fanciful writers upon this subject. The earth, therefore, and all things therein, are the general property of all mankind, exclusive of other beings, from the immediate gift of the Creator. And while the earth continued bare of inhabitants, it is reasonable to suppose that all was in common among them, and that every one took from the public stock to his own use such things as his immediate necessities required. These general notions of property were then sufficient to answer all the purposes of human life and might perhaps still have answered them had it been possible for mankind to have remained in a state of primeval simplicity. As may be collected from the manners of many American nations when first discovered by the Europeans, 
and from the ancient method of living among the first Europeans themselves, if we may credit either the memorials of them preserved in the golden age of the poets, or the uniform accounts given by historians of those times, wherein erent omnia communa et indivisa omnibus valute unum conctis patrimonium esse. Not that this communion of goods seems ever to have been applicable, even in the earliest ages, to aught but the substance of the thing, nor could be extended for the use of it. For by the law of nature and reason, he who first began to use it acquired therein a kind of transient property that lasted so long as he was using it and no longer. Or, to speak with greater precision, the right of possession continued for the same time only that the act of possession lasted. Thus, the ground was in common, and no part of it was the permanent property of any man in particular. Yet whoever was in the occupation of any determinate spot of it, for rest, for shade, or the like, acquired for the time a sort of ownership, from which it would have been unjust and contrary to the law of nature to have driven him by force. But the instant that he quitted the use or occupation of it, another might seize it without injustice. Thus also a vine or other tree might be said to be in common, as all men were equally entitled to its produce. And yet, any private individual might gain the sole property of the fruit which he had gathered for his own repast a doctrine well illustrated by Cicero, who compares the world to a great theatre, which is common to the public, and yet the place which any man has taken is for the time his own. But when mankind increased in number, craft, and ambition, it became necessary to entertain conceptions of more permanent dominion, and to appropriate to individuals not the immediate use only, but the very substance of the thing to be used. Otherwise, innumerable tumults must have arisen, and the good order of the world been continually broken and disturbed, while a variety of persons were striving who should get the first occupation of the same thing, or disputing which of them had actually gained it. As human life also grew more and more refined, abundance of conveniences were devised to render it more easy, commodious, and agreeable. As habitations for shelter and safety, and raiment for warmth and decency. But no man would be at the trouble to provide either, so long as he had only usufructory property in them, which was to cease the instant that he quitted possession. If, as soon as he walked out of his tent, or pulled off his garment, the next stranger who came by would have a right to inhabit the one and to wear the other. In the case of habitations in particular, it was natural of observe that even the brute creation, to whom everything else was in common, maintained a kind of permanent property in their dwellings, especially for the protection of their young that the birds of the air had nests, and the beasts of the field had caverns, the invasion of which they esteemed a very flagrant injustice, and would sacrifice their lives to preserve them. Hence, a property was soon established in every man's house and home stall, which seemed to have been originally mere temporary huts or movable cabins, suited to the design of Providence for more speedily peopling the earth, and suited to the wandering life of their owners, before any extensive property in the soil or ground was established. And there can be no doubt but that movables of every kind became sooner appropriated than the permanent substantial soil, partly because they were more susceptible of a long occupancy, which might be continued for months together without any sensible interruption, and at length by usage ripen into an established right but principally because few of them could be fit for use till improved and meliorated by the bodily labor of the occupant, which bodily labor, bestowed upon any subject which before lay in common to all men, is universally allowed to give the fairest and most reasonable title to an exclusive property therein. The article of food was a more immediate call, and therefore a more early consideration. 
such as were not contented with the spontaneous product of the earth, sought a more solid refreshment in the flesh of beasts, which they obtained by hunting. But the frequent disappointments incident to that method of provision induced them to gather together such animals as were of a more tame and sequacious nature and to establish a permanent property in their flocks and herds, in order to sustain themselves in a less precarious manner, partly by the milk of the dams, and partly by the flesh of the young. The support of these, their cattle, made the article of water also a very important point. And therefore, the book of Genesis, the most venerable monument of antiquity considered merely with a view to history, will furnish us with frequent instances of violent contentions concerning wells, the exclusive property of which appears to have been established in the first digger or occupant, even in such places where the ground and herbage remained yet in common. Thus we find Abraham, who was but a sojourner, asserting his right to a well in the country of Abimelech, and exacting an oath for his security, because he had digged that well. And Isaac, about ninety years afterwards, reclaimed his father's property, and after much contention with the Philistines, was suffered to enjoy it in peace. All this, while the soil and pasture of the earth remained still in common as before, and open to every occupant except perhaps in the neighborhood of towns where the necessity of a sole and exclusive property in the lands for the sake of agriculture was earlier felt and therefore more readily complied with. Otherwise, when the multitude of men and cattle had consumed every convenience on one spot of ground, it was deemed a natural right to seize upon and occupy such other lands as would more easily supply their necessities. This practice is still retained among the wild and uncultivated nations that have never been formed into civil states like the Tartars and others in the East, where the climate itself and the boundless extent of their territory conspire to retain them still in the same savage state of vagrant liberty which was universal in the earliest ages, and which Tacitus informs us continued among the Germans till the decline of the Roman Empire. We have also a striking example of the same kind in the history of Abraham and his nephew Lot. When their joint substance became so great that pasture and other conveniences grew scarce, the natural consequence was that a strife arose between their servants, so that it was no longer practicable to dwell together. This contention Abraham thus endeavored to compose. Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between thee and me. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. If thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. This plainly implies an acknowledged right in either to occupy whatever ground he pleased, that was not preoccupied by other tribes. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere, even as the garden of the Lord. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan and journeyed east, and Abraham dwelt in the land of Canaan. Upon the same principle was founded the right of migration, or sending colonies to find out new habitations when the mother country was overcharged with inhabitants, which was practiced as well by the Phoenicians and Greeks as the Germans, Scythians, and other northern people. And so long as it was confined to the stocking and cultivation of desert, uninhabited countries, it kept strictly within the limits of the law of nature. But how far the seizing on countries already peopled and driving out or massacring the innocent and defenseless natives merely because they differed from their invaders in language, in religion, in customs, in government, or in color, how far such a conduct was consonant to nature, to reason, or to Christianity deserved well to be considered by those who have rendered their names immortal by thus civilizing mankind. 
As the world by degrees grew more populous, it daily became more difficult to find out new spots to inhabit without encroaching upon former occupants. And by constantly occupying the same individual spot, the fruits of the earth were consumed and its spontaneous produce destroyed without any provision for a future supply or succession. It therefore became necessary to pursue some regular method of providing a constant subsistence. And this necessity produced or at least promoted and encouraged the art of agriculture. And the art of agriculture, by a regular connection and consequence, introduced and established the idea of a more permanent property in the soil than had hitherto been received and adopted. It was clear that the earth would not produce her fruits in sufficient quantities without the assistance of tillage. But who would be at pains of tilling it if another might watch an opportunity to seize upon and enjoy the product of his industry, art, and labor? Had not, therefore, a separate property in lands, as well as movables, been vested in some individuals, the world must have continued a forest, and men have been mere animals of prey, which, according to some philosophers, is the genuine state of nature. Whereas now, so graciously has providence interwoven our duty and our happiness together, the result of this very necessity has been the ennobling of the human species by giving it opportunities of improving its rational faculties as well as of exerting its natural. Necessity begat property, and in order to ensure that property, recourse was had to civil society, which brought along with it a long train of inseparable concomitants, states, governments, laws, punishments, and the public exercise of religious duties. Thus connected together, it was found that a part only of society was sufficient to provide by their manual labor for the necessary subsistence of all. And leisure was given to others to cultivate the human mind, to invent useful arts, and to lay the foundations of science. End of chapter 1, part 1. Chapter 1, Part 2 of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book 2, by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes. Of Property in General. Part 2. The only question remaining is how this property became actually vested. Of what is it that gave a man an exclusive right to retain in a permanent manner that specific land which before belonged generally to everybody, but particularly to nobody? And, as we before observed, that occupancy gave the right to the temporary use of the soil, so it is agreed upon all hands that occupancy gave also the original right to the permanent property in the substance of the earth itself, which excludes everyone else but the owner from the use of it. There is indeed some difference among the writers on natural law concerning the reason why occupancy should convey this right and invest one with this absolute property. Grotius and Pufendorf insisting that this right of occupancy is founded upon a tacit and implied assent of all mankind, that the first occupant shall become the owner. And Barbarak and Titius, Mr. Locke and others, holding that there is no such implied assent, neither is it necessary that there should be. For the very act of occupancy alone being a degree of bodily labor, is from a principle of nature justice without any consent or compact sufficient of itself to gain a title, a dispute that favors too much of nice and scholastic refinement. However, both sides agree in this, that occupancy is the thing by which the title was in fact originally gained. 
every man seizing to his own continued use such spots of ground as he found most agreeable to his own conscience, provided he found them unoccupied by any one else. Property, both in lands and movables, being thus originally acquired by the first taker, which taking amounts to a declaration that he intends to appropriate the thing to his own use, it remains in him, by the principles of universal law, till such time as he does some other act which shows an intention to abandon it. For then it becomes, naturally speaking, publici juris once more, and is liable again to be appropriated by the next occupant. So if one is possessed of a jewel, and casts it into the sea or a public highway, this is such an express dereliction that a property will be vested in the first fortunate finder that will seize it to his own use. But if he hides it privately in the earth or other secret place, and it is discovered, the finder acquires no property therein. For the owner hath not by this act declared any intention to abandon it, but rather the contrary. And if he loses or drops it by accident, it cannot be collected from thence that he designed to quit the possession. And therefore, in such case, the property still remains in the loser who may claim it again of the finder. And this, we may remember, is the doctrine of the law of England with relation to treasure trove. But this method of one man's abandoning his property and another's seizing the vacant possession, however well founded in theory, could not long subsist in fact. It was calculated merely for the rudiments of civil society and necessarily ceased among the complicated interests and artificial refinements of polite and established governments. In these it was found that what became inconvenient or useless to one man was highly convenient and useful to another, who was ready to give in exchange for it some equivalent that was equally desirable to the former proprietor. Thus mutual convenience introduced commercial traffic and the reciprocal transfer of property by sale, grant, or conveyance which may be considered either as a continuance of the original possession, which the first occupant had, or as an abandoning of the thing by the present owner, and an immediate successive occupancy of the same by the new proprietor. The voluntary dereliction of the owner, and delivering the possession to another individual, amount to a transfer of the property. The proprietor declaring his intention no longer to occupy the thing himself, but that his own right of occupancy shall be vested in the new acquirer. Or, taken in the other light, if I agree to part with an acre of my land to Titius, the deed of conveyance is an evidence of my having abandoned the property, and Titius, being the only or first man acquainted with such my intention, immediately steps in and seizes the vacant possession. Thus, the consent expressed by the conveyance gives Titius a good right against me, and possession or occupancy confirms that right against all the world besides. The most universal and effectual way of abandoning property is by the death of the occupant. When, both the actual possession and intention of keeping possession ceasing, the property which is founded upon such possession and intention ought also to cease, of course. For naturally speaking, the instant a man ceases to be, he ceases to have any dominion. Else, if he had a right to dispose of his acquisitions one moment beyond his life, he would also have a right to direct their disposal for a million ages after him, which would be highly absurd and inconvenient. All property must therefore cease upon death, considering men as absolute individuals and unconnected with civil society. Or then, by the principles before established, the next immediate occupant would acquire a right in all that the deceased possessed. But, as under civilized governments which are calculated for the peace of mankind, such a constitution would be productive of endless disturbances, 
the universal law of almost every nation, which is a kind of secondary law of nature, has either given the dying person a power of continuing his property by disposing of his possessions by will, or, in case he neglects to dispose of it, or is not permitted to make any disposition at all, the municipal law of the country then steps in and declares who shall be the successor, representative, or heir of the deceased. That is, who alone shall have a right to enter upon this vacant possession in order to avoid that confusion which its becoming again common would occasion. And farther, in case no testament be permitted by the law, or none be made, and no heir can be found so qualified as the law requires, still, to prevent the robust title of occupancy from again taking place, the doctrine of Eschets is adopted in almost every country, whereby the sovereign of the state and those who claim under his authority are the ultimate heirs and succeed to those inheritances to which no other title can be formed. The right of inheritance or descent to the children and relations of the deceased seem to have been allowed much earlier than the right of devising by testament. We are apt to conceive at first view that it has nature on its side, yet we often mistake for nature what we find established by long and inveterate custom. It is certainly a wise and effectual but clearly political establishment since the permanent right of property vested in the ancestor himself was no natural but merely a civil right. It is true that the transmission of one's possession to posterity has an evident tendency to make a man a good citizen and a useful member of society. It sets the passions on the side of duty and prompts a man to deserve well of the public when he is sure that the reward of his services will not die with himself but be transmitted to those with whom he is connected by the dearest and most tender affections. Yet, reasonable as this foundation of the right of inheritance may seem, it is probable that its immediate original arose not from speculations altogether so delicate and refined, and, if not from fortuitous circumstances, at least from a plainer and more simple principle. A man's children or nearest relations are usually about him on his deathbed and are the earliest witnesses of his decease. They became, therefore, generally the next immediate occupants, till at length, in process of time, this frequent usage ripened into general law. And, therefore, also in the earliest ages, on failure of children, a man's servants, born under his roof, were allowed to be his heirs, being immediately on the spot when he died. For we find the old patriarch Abraham expressly declaring that since God had given him no seed, his steward Eliezer, one born in his house, was his heir. While property continued only for life, testaments were useless and unknown. And when it became inheritable, the inheritance was long indefeasible and the children or heirs at law were incapable of exclusion by will. Till at length it was found that so strict a rule of inheritance made heirs disobedient and headstrong, defrauded creditors of their just debts, and prevented many provident fathers from dividing or charging their estates as the exigence of their families required. This introduced, pretty generally, the right of disposing one's property, or a part of it, by testament. That is, by written or oral instructions properly witnessed and authenticated according to the pleasure of the deceased, which we therefore emphatically style his will. This was established in some countries much later than in others. With us in England, till modern times, a man could only dispose of one-third of his movables from his wife and children, and in general, no will was permitted of lands till the reign of Henry the Eighth, and then only of a certain portion. For it was not till after the Restoration 
that the power of devising real property became so universal as at present. Wills, therefore, and testaments, rights of inheritance and successions, are all of them creatures of the civil or municipal laws and accordingly are in all respects regulated by them. Every distinct country having different ceremonies and requisites to make a testament completely valid. Neither does anything vary more than the right of inheritance under different national establishments. In England, particularly, this diversity is carried to such a length as if it had been meant to point out the power of the laws in regulating the succession to property and how futile every claim must be that has not its foundation in the positive rules of the state. In personal estates, the father may succeed to his children. In landed property, he never can be their immediate heir by any the remotest possibility. In general, only the eldest son, in some places only the youngest, in others all the sons together have a right to succeed to the inheritance. In real estates, males are preferred to females, and the eldest male will usually exclude the rest. In the division of personal estates, the females of equal degree are admitted together with the males, and no right of primogeniture is allowed. This one consideration may help to remove the scruples of well-meaning persons who set up a mistaken conscience in opposition to the rules of law. If a man disinherits his son, by a will duly executed, and leaves his estate to a stranger, there are many who consider this proceeding as contrary to natural justice, while others so scrupulously adhere to the supposed intention of the dead, that if a will of lands be attested by only two witnesses instead of three, which the law requires, they are apt to imagine that the heir is bound in conscience to relinquish his title to the devisee but both of them certainly proceed upon very erroneous principles, as if, on the one hand, the son had by nature a right to succeed to his father's lands, or as if, on the other hand, the owner was by nature entitled to direct the succession of his property after his own decease. Whereas the law of nature suggests that on the death of the possessor, the estate should again become common, and be open to the next occupant unless otherwise ordered for the sake of civil peace by the positive law of society. The positive law of society, which is with us the municipal law of England, directs it to vest in such person as the last proprietor shall by will, attended with certain requisites, appoint. And in defect of such appointment, to go to some particular person who, from the result of certain local constitutions, appears to be the heir at law. Hence it follows that where the appointment is regularly made, there cannot be a shadow of right in any one but the person appointed, and where the necessary requisites are omitted, the right of the heir is equally strong and built upon as solid a foundation as the right of the devisee would have been supposing such requisites were observed. But, after all, there are some few things which, notwithstanding the general introduction and continuance of property, must still unavoidably remain in common, being such wherein nothing but an usufructory property is capable of being had. And therefore, they still belong to the first occupant during the time he holds possession of them, and no longer. Such, among others, are the elements of light, air, and water, which a man may occupy by means of his windows, his gardens, his mills, and other conveniences. Such also are the generality of those animals which are said to be ferae naturae, or of a wild and untamable disposition which any man may seize upon and keep for his own use or pleasure. All these things, so long as they remain in possession, every man has a right to enjoy without disturbance. But if once they escape from his custody, 
or he voluntarily abandons the use of them, they return to the common stock, and any man else has an equal right to seize and enjoy them afterwards. Again, there are other things in which a permanent property may subsist, not only as to the temporary use, but also the solid substance, and which yet would be frequently found without a proprietor, had not the wisdom of the law provided a remedy to obviate this inconvenience. Such are the forests and other waste grounds which were omitted to be appropriated in the general distribution of lands. Such also are wrecks, estrays, and that species of wild animals which the arbitrary constitutions of positive law have distinguished from the rest by the well-known appellation of game. With regard to these and some others, as disturbances and quarrels would frequently arise among individuals, contending about the acquisition of this species of property by first occupancy, the law has therefore wisely caught up the root of dissension by vesting the things themselves in the sovereign of the state, else in his representatives appointed and authorized by him, being usually the lords of manners. And thus, the legislature of England has universally promoted the grand ends of civil society, the peace and security of individuals, by steadily pursuing that wise and orderly maxim of assigning to everything capable of ownership a legal and determinate owner. End of chapter 1, part 2. Chapter 2 of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book 2, by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes. Of Real Property and First of corporeal hereditaments. The objects of dominion or property are things, as contradistinguished from persons, and things are by the law of England distributed into two kinds, things real and things personal. Things real are such as are permanent, fixed, and immovable, which cannot be carried out of their place, as lands and tenements. Things personal are goods, money, and all other movables which may attend the owner's person wherever he thinks proper to go. In treating of things real, let us consider, first, their several sorts or kinds, secondly, the tenures by which they may be holden, thirdly, the estates which may be had in them, and fourthly, the title to them and the manner of requiring and losing it. First. With regard to their several sorts or kinds, things real are usually said to consist in lands, tenements, or hereditaments. Land comprehends all things of a permanent, substantial nature, being a word of a very extensive signification, as will presently appear more at large. Tenement is a word of still greater extent, and though in its vulgar acceptation it is only applied to houses and other buildings, yet in its original, proper, and legal sense it signifies everything that may be holden, provided it be of a permanent nature, whether it be of a substantial and sensible or of an unsubstantial, ideal kind. Thus, liberum tenementum, franken tenement, or freehold, is applicable not only to lands and other solid objects, but also to offices, rents, commons, and the like. And as lands and houses are tenements, so is an advowson a tenement, and a franchise, an office, a right of common, a peerage, or other property of the like unsubstantial kind are all of them, legally speaking, tenements. But an hereditament says Sir Edward Coke, is by much the largest and most comprehensive expression. 
for it includes not only lands and tenements, but whatsoever may be inherited, be it corporeal or incorporeal, real, personal, or mixed. Thus an heirloom or implement of furniture, which by custom descends to the heir together with an house, is neither land nor tenement, but a mere movable. Yet, being inheritable, is comprised under the general word hereditament, and so a condition, the benefit of which may descend to a man from his ancestor, is also an hereditament. Hereditaments, then, to use the largest expression, are of two kinds, corporeal and incorporeal. Corporeal consists of such as affect the senses, such as may be seen and handled by the body. Incorporeal are not the objects of sensation, can neither be seen nor handled, are creatures of the mind, and exist only in contemplation. Corporeal hereditaments consist wholly of substantial and permanent objects, all of which may be comprehended under the general denomination of land only. For land, says Sir Edward Coke, comprehendeth in its legal signification any ground, soil, or earth whatsoever, as arable, meadows, pastures, woods, moors, waters, marshes, furzes, and heath. It legally includeth also all castles, houses, and other buildings, for they consist, saith he, of two things, land, which is the foundation, and structure thereupon, so that if I convey the land or ground, the structure or building passeth therewith. It is observable that water is here mentioned as a species of land, which may seem a kind of solecism. But such is the language of the law, and I cannot bring in action to recover possession of a pool or other piece of water by the name of water only either by calculating its capacity as for so many cubic yards, or by superficial measure for 20 acres of water, or by general description as for a pond, a watercourse, or a rivulet. But I must bring my action for the land that lies at the bottom, and must call it 20 acres of land covered with water. For water is a movable, wandering thing, and must of necessity continue common by the law of nature, so that I can only have a temporary, transient, usufructory property therein. Wherefore, if a body of water runs out of my pond into another man's, I have no right to reclaim it. But the land which that water covers is permanent, fixed, and immovable, and therefore in this I may have a certain substantial property of which the law will take notice, and not of the other. Land hath also, in its legal signification, an indefinite extent upwards as well as downwards. Cujus ele folum, jus ele ufque ad coelum, is the maxim of the law, upwards. Therefore, no man may erect any building or the like to overhang another's land and downwards whatever is in a direct line between the surface of any land and the center of the earth belongs to the owner of the surface, as is every day's experience in the mining countries, so that the word land includes not only the face of the earth, but everything under it or over it. And therefore, if a man grants all his lands, he grants thereby all his mines of metal and other fossils, his woods, his waters, and his houses, as well as his fields and meadows. Not but the particular names of the things are equally sufficient to pass them, except in the instance of water, by a grant of which nothing passes but a right of fishing. But the capital distinction is this that by the name of castle, messuage, toft, croft, or the like, nothing else will pass except what falls with the utmost propriety under the term made use of, but by the name land, which is nomen generalissimum, everything terrestrial will pass.
End of chapter two. Chapter three, part one of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, book two, by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes. Incorporeal Herodidiments. Part 1. An incorporeal hereditament is a right issuing out of a thing corporate, whether real or personal, or concerning, or annexed to, or exercisable within the same. It is not the thing corporate itself, which may consist in lands, houses, jewels, or the like, but something collateral thereto, as a rent issuing out of those lands or houses, or an office relating to those jewels. In short, as the logicians speak, corporeal hereditaments are the substance which may always be seen, always handled. Incorporeal hereditaments are but a sort of accidents, which inhere in and are supported by that substance, and may belong or not belong to it, without any visible alteration therein. Their existence is merely an idea, an abstracted contemplation, though their effects and profits may be frequently objects of our bodily senses. And indeed, if we would fix a clear notion of an incorporeal hereditament, we must be careful not to confound together the profits produced and the thing, or hereditament, which produces them. An annuity, for instance, is an incorporeal hereditament, for though the money, which is the fruit or product of this annuity, is doubtless of a corporeal nature, yet the annuity itself, which produces that money, is a thing invisible, has only a mental existence, and cannot be delivered over from hand to hand. So tithes, if we consider the produce of them, as the tenth sheaf or tenth lamb, seem to be completely corporeal. Yet, they are indeed incorporeal hereditaments, for they, being merely a contingent right, collateral to or issuing out of lands, can never be the object of sense. They are neither capable of being shown to the eye, nor of being delivered into bodily possession. Incorporeal hereditaments are principally of ten sorts, advowsons, tithes, commons, ways, offices, dignities, franchises, corities or pensions, annuities, and rents. Advowson is the right of presentation to a church or ecclesiastical benefice. Advowson, ad vocatio, signifies Incliatelem recipere, the taking into protection, and therefore is synonymous with patronage, patronatus, and he who has the right of advowson is called the patron of the church. For when lords of manors first built churches on their own demesnes and appointed the tithes of those manors to be paid to the officiating ministers, which before were given to the clergy in common, from whence was formerly mentioned, arose the division of parishes, the Lord, who thus built a church and endowed it with glebe or land, had of common right a power annexed to nominating such a minister as he pleased, provided he were canonically qualified, to officiate in that church of which he was the founder endower, maintainer, or, in one word, the patron. This instance of an advowson will completely illustrate the nature of an incorporeal hereditament. It is not itself the bodily possession of the church and its appendages, but it is a right to give some other man a title to such bodily possession. The advowson is the object of neither the sight nor the touch, and yet, 
it perpetually exists in the mind's eye and in contemplation of the law. It cannot be delivered from man to man by any visible bodily transfer, nor can corporal possession be had of it. If the patron takes corporal possession of the church, the churchyard, the glebe, or the like, he intrudes on another man's property, for to these the parson has an exclusive right. The patronage can therefore be only conveyed by operation of law, by verbal grant, either oral or written, which is a kind of invisible mental transfer, and being so vested, it lies dormant and unnoticed, till occasion calls it forth, when it produces a visible corporeal fruit by entitling some clerk whom the patron shall please to nominate to enter and receive bodily possession of the lands and tenements of the church. Advousins are either avousins appendant or avousins in gross. Lords of manors, being originally the only founders and, of course, the only patrons of churches, the right of patronage or presentation, so long as it continues annexed to the possession of the manor, as some have done from the foundation of the church to this day, is called an avousin appendant and it will pass or be conveyed together with the manor as incident and appendant thereto by a grant of the manor only, without adding any other words. But where the property of the avowson has been once separated from the property of the manor by legal conveyance, it is called an avowson in gross or at large, and never can be appendant any more but it is for the future annexed to the person of its owner and not to his manor or lands. Avousins are also either presentative, collative, or donative. An advousin presentative is where the patron hath a right of presentation to the bishop or ordinary, and moreover to demand of him to institute his clerk if he find him canonically qualified and this is the most usual advousin. An advousin collative is where the bishop and patron are one and the same person, in which case the bishop cannot present to himself, but he does, by the one act of collation or conferring the benefice, the whole that is done in common cases by both presentation and institution. An advousin donative is when the king or any subject by his license doth found a church or chapel and ordains that it shall be merely in the gift or disposal of the patron, subject to his visitation only and not to that of the ordinary, and vested absolutely in the clerk by the patron's deed of donation without presentation, institution, or induction. This is said to have been anciently the only way of conferring ecclesiastical benefices in England, the method of institution by the bishop not being established more early than the time of Archbishop Becket in the reign of Henry II. And therefore, though Pope Alexander III, in a letter to Becket, severely inveighs against the prava consuetudo, as he calls it, of investiture conferred by the patron only, this, however, shows what was then the common usage. Others contend that the claim of the bishops to institution is as old as the first planting of Christianity in this island, and in proof of it, they allege a letter from the English nobility to the Pope in the reign of Henry III, recorded by Matthew Paris, which speaks of presentation to the bishop as a thing immemorial. The truth seems to be that, where the benefice was to be conferred on a mere layman, he was first presented to the bishop in order to receive ordination, who was at liberty to examine and refuse him. But where the clerk was already in orders, the living was usually vested in him by the sole donation of the patron. Till about the middle of the 12th century, when the Pope 
and his bishops endeavored to introduce a kind of feudal dominion over ecclesiastical benefices and, in consequence of that, began to claim and exercise the right of institution universally as a species of spiritual investiture. However this may be, if, as the law now stands, the true patron once waives this privilege of donation and presents to the bishop, and his clerk is admitted and instituted, the advowson is now become forever presentative and shall never be donative any more. For these exceptions to general rules and common right are ever looked upon by the law in an unfavorable view and construed as strictly as possible. If, therefore, the patron in whom such peculiar right resides does once give up that right, the law, which loves uniformity, will interpret it to be done with an intention of giving it up forever and will thereupon reduce it to the standard of other ecclesiastical livings. A second species of incorporeal hereditaments is that of tithes, which are defined to be the tenth part of the increase yearly arising and renewing from the profits of lands, the stock upon lands, and the personal industry of the inhabitants. The first species being usually called predial, as of corn, grass, hops, and wood, the second mixed, as of wool, milk, pigs, etc., consisting of natural products, but nurtured and preserved in part by the care of man, and of these the tenth must be paid in gross, the third personal, as of manual occupations, trades, fisheries, and the like, and of these only the tenth part of the clear gains and profits is due. It is not to be expected from the nature of these general commentaries that I should particularly specify what things are tithable and what not, the time when or the manner and proportion in which tithes are usually due. For this, I must refer to such authors as have treated the matter in detail, and shall only observe that, in general, tithes are to be paid for everything that yields an annual increase as corn, hay, fruit, cattle, poultry, and the like, but not for anything that is of substance of the earth, or is not an, of an annual increase, as stone, lime, chalk, and the like, nor for creatures that are of a wild nature, or ferai naturai, as deer, hawks, etc., whose increase, so as to profit the owner, is not annual, but casual. It will rather be our business to consider, one, the original of the right of tithes, two, in whom that right at present subsists, three, who may be discharged either totally or in part from paying them. As to their original, I will not put the title of the clergy to tithes upon any divine right though such a right certainly commenced, and I believe certainly ceased, with the Jewish theocracy. Yet, an honorable and competent maintenance for the ministers of the gospel is, undoubtedly, jure divino, whatever the particular mode of that maintenance may be. For, besides the positive precepts of the New Testament, natural reason will tell us that an order of men who are separated from the world and excluded from other lucrative professions for the sake of the rest of mankind, have a right to be furnished with the necessities, conveniences, and modern enjoyments of life at their expense, for whose benefit they forego the usual means of providing them. Accordingly, all municipal laws have provided a liberal and decent maintenance for their national priests or clergy. Ours in particular have established this of tithes, probably in imitation of the Jewish law, and perhaps, considering the degenerate state of the world in general, it may be more beneficial to the English clergy to found their title on the law of the land than upon any divine right whatsoever, unacknowledged and unsupported by temporal sanctions. We cannot precisely ascertain the time when tithes were first introduced into this country. Possibly, 
They were contemporary with the planting of Christianity among the Saxons by Augustine the monk about the end of the 6th century. But the first mention of them, which I have met with in any written English law, is in a constitutional decree made in a synod held A.D. 786, wherein the payment of tithes in general is strongly enjoined. This canon or decree, which at first bound not the laity, was effectually confirmed by two kingdoms of the Heptarchy, in their parliamentary conventions of estates respectively, consisting of the kings of Mercia and Northumberland, the bishops, dukes, senators, and the people, which was a few years later than the time that Charlemagne established the payment of them in France, and made that famous division of them into four parts, one to maintain the edifice of the church, the second to support the poor, the third the bishop, and the fourth the parochial clergy. The next authentic mention of them is in the Foedus Eduardi et Gutruni, or the laws agreed upon by King Guthrun the Dane and Alfred and his son Edward the Elder, successive kings of England, about the year 900. This was a kind of treaty between those monarchs, which may be found at large in the Anglo-Saxon laws wherein it was necessary, as Guthrun was a pagan, to provide for the subsistence of the Christian clergy under his dominion, and accordingly we find the payment of tithes not only enjoined, but a penalty added upon non-observance, which law is seconded by those of Athelstan about the year 930. And this is as much as can certainly be traced out with regard to their legal original. 2. We are next to consider the persons to whom they are due, and upon their first introduction, as hath formerly been observed, though every man was obliged to pay tithes in general, yet he might give them to whatever priest he pleased, which were called arbitrary consecrations of tithes, or he might pay them into the hands of the bishop, who distributed among his diocese and clergy the revenues of the church, which were then in common. But when dioceses were divided into parishes, the tithes of each parish were allotted to its own particular minister, first by common consent, or the appointments of lords of manors, and afterwards by the written law of the land. However, Arbitrary consecrations of tithes took place again afterwards, and became in general use till the time of King John, which was probably owing to the intrigues of the regular clergy or monks of the Benedictine and other rules under Archbishop Dunstan and his successors, who endeavored to wean the people from paying their dues to the secular or parochial clergy, a much more valuable set of men themselves, and were then in hopes to have drawn, by sanctimonious pretense to extraordinary purity of life, all ecclesiastical profits to the coffers of their own societies. And this will naturally enough account for the number and riches of the monasteries and religious houses which were founded in those days, and which were frequently endowed with tithes. For a layman, who was obliged to pay his tithe somewhere, might think it good policy to erect an abbey, and there pay them to his own monks, or grant them to some abbey already erected. Since for this dotation, which really cost the patron little or nothing, he might, according to the superstition of the times, have masses forever sung for his soul. But, in process of years, the income of the poor laborious parish priests being scandalously reduced by these arbitrary consecrations of tithes, it was remedied by Pope Innocent III about the year 1200 in decretial epistle sent to the Archbishop of Canterbury and dated from the Palace of Lateran, which has occasioned Sir Henry Hobart and others to mistake it for a decree of the Council of Lateran held A.D. 1179, which only prohibited what was called the infudation of tithes, or their being granted to mere laymen. 
whereas this letter of Pope Innocent to the Archbishop enjoined the payment of tithes to the parsons of the respective parishes where every man inhabited, agreeable to what was afterwards directed by the same Pope in other countries. This epistle, says Sir Edward Coke, bound not the lay subjects of this realm, but, by being reasonable and just, and, he might have added, being correspondent to the ancient law, it was allowed of, and so became lex terre. This put an effectual stop to all the arbitrary consecrations of tithes, except some footsteps which still continue in those portions of tithes which the parson of one parish hath, though rarely, a right to claim in another, for it is now universally held that tithes are due of common right to the parson of the parish unless there be a special exemption. This parson of the parish, we have formerly seen, may be either the actual incumbent or else the appropriator of the benefice, appropriations being a method of endowing monasteries, which seems to have been devised by the regular clergy by way of substitution to arbitrary consecrations of tithes. End of chapter 3, part 1. Chapter 3, part 2 of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, book 2, by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Roy Haynes Of Incorporeal Hereditaments Part 2 3. We observe that tithes are due to the parson of common right, unless by special exemption. Let us therefore see, thirdly, who may be exempted from the payment of tithes and how. Lands and their occupiers may be exempted or discharged from the payment of tithes, either in part or totally, first, by a real composition, or secondly, by custom or prescription. First, a real composition is when an agreement is made between the owner of the lands and the parson or vicar, with the consent of the ordinary and the patron, that such lands shall for the future be discharged from payment of tithes by reason of some land or other real recompense given to the parson in lieu and satisfaction thereof. This was permitted by law because it was supposed that the clergy would be no losers by such composition. Since the consent of the ordinary, whose duty it is to take care of the church in general and of the patron, whose interest it is to protect that particular church, were both made necessary to render the composition effectual. And hence have arisen all such compositions as exist at this day by force of the common law. But experience showing that even this caution was ineffectual, and the possessions of the church being, by this and other means, every day diminished, the disabling statute 13 Elizabeth C. 10 was made, which prevents, among other spiritual persons, all parsons and vicars from making any conveyances of the estates of their churches other than for three lives or 21 years, so that now, by virtue of this statute, no real composition made since 13 Elizabeth is good for any longer term than three lives or 21 years, though made by consent of the patron and the ordinary, which has indeed effectually demolished this kind of traffic. Such compositions being now rarely heard of unless by authority of Parliament. Secondly, a discharge by custom or prescription is where time out of mind such persons or such lands have been either partially or totally discharged from the payment of tithes. And this immemorial usage is binding upon all parties, as it is in its nature 
and evidence of universal consent and acquiescence, and with reason supposes a real composition to have been formally made. This custom or prescription is either de modo dicimande or de non dicimando. A modus dicimandi, commonly called by the simple name of modus only, is where there is by custom a particular manner of tithing allowed, different from the general law of taking tithes in kind, which are the actual tenth part of the annual increase. This is sometimes a pecuniary compensation, as two pence an acre for the tithe of land. Sometimes it is a compensation in work and labor, as that the parson shall have only the twelfth cock of hay, and not the tenth, in consideration of the owner's making it for him. Sometimes, in lieu of a large quantity of crude or imperfect tithe, the parson shall have a less quantity when arrived to a greater maturity, as a couple of fowls in lieu of tithe eggs, and the like. Any means, in short, whereby the general law of tithing is altered and a new method of taking them is introduced, is called a modus dicimandi, or a special manner of tithing. To make a good and sufficient modus, the following rules must be observed. 1. It must be certain and invariable, for a payment of different sums will prove it to be no modus, that is, no original real composition because that must have been one and the same from its first original to the present time. 2. The thing given, in lieu of tithes, must be beneficial to the parson and not for the emolument of third persons only. Thus, a modus to repair the church in lieu of tithes is not good because that is an advantage to the parish only. But to repair the chancel is a good modus for that is an advantage to the parson. 3. It must be something different from the thing compounded for. One load of hay, in lieu of all tithe hay, is no good modus. For no parson would, bona fide, make a composition to receive less than his due in the same species of tithe. And therefore, the law will not suppose it possible for such composition to have existed. 4. One cannot be discharged from payment of one species of tithe by paying a modus for another. Thus, a modus of 1d for every milk cow will discharge the tithe of milch kine, but not of barren cattle, for tithe is, of common right, due for both, and therefore a modus for one shall never be a discharge for the other. 5. The recompense must be in its nature as durable as the tithes discharged by it, that is, an inheritance certain, and therefore a modus that every inhabitant of a house shall pay 4d a year in lieu of the owner's tithes is no good modus, for possibly the house may not be inhabited, and then the recompense will be lost. 6. The modus must not be too large, which in law is called a rank modus, as if the real value of the tithes be 60 pounds per annum, and a modus is suggested of 40 pounds, this modus will not be good, though one of 40 shillings might have been valid. For in these cases of prescriptive or customary moduses, the law supposes an original real composition to have been regularly made, which being lost by length of time, the immemorial usage is admitted as evidence to show that it once did exist, and that from thence such usage was derived. Now, time of memory, hath been long ago ascertained by the law to commence from the reign of Richard I, and any custom may be destroyed by evidence of its non-existence in any part of the long period from his days to the present. Wherefore, as this real composition is supposed to have been an equitable contract, or the full value of the tithes at the time of making it, if the modus is set up 
so rank and large that it beyond dispute exceeds the value of the tithes in the time of Richard I, this modus is bello de se and destroys itself. Or, as it would be destroyed by any direct evidence to prove its non-existence at any time since that era, so also it is destroyed by carrying in itself this internal evidence of a much later original. A prescription de non dicimando is a claim to be entirely discharged of tithes and to pay no compensation in lieu of them. Thus the king, by his prerogative, is discharged from all tithes. So a vicar shall pay no tithes to the rector, nor the rector to the vicar, for ecclesia decimos non salvit ecclesia. But these privileges are personal both to the king and the clergy, for their tenant or lessee shall pay tithes of the same land, though in their own occupation it is not tithable. And, generally speaking, it is an established rule that in lay hands, modus de non dicimando non valet. But spiritual persons or corporations as monasteries, abbots, bishops, and the like, were always capable of having their lands totally discharged of tithes by various ways, as 1. by real composition, 2. by the Pope's Bull of Exemption, 3. by unity of possession, as when the rectory of a parish and lands in the same parish both belong to a religious house, those lands were discharged of tithes by this unity of possession. 4. By prescription, having never been liable to tithes, by being always in spiritual hands. 5. By virtue of their order, as the Knights Templars, Cistercians, and others whose lands were privileged by the Pope with a discharge of tithes. Though, upon the dissolution of abbeys by Henry VIII, most of these exemptions from tithes would have fallen with them, and the lands become tithable again, had they not been supported and upheld by the statute 31 Henry VIII C13, which enacts that all persons who should come to the possession of the lands of an abbey then dissolved should hold them free and discharged of tithes in as large and ample a manner as the abbeys themselves formerly held them and from this original have sprung all the lands which, being in lay hands, do at present claim to be tithe-free. For if a man can show his lands to have been such abbey lands, and also immemorially discharged of tithes by any of the means before mentioned, this is now a good prescription de non dicimando. But he must show both these requisites, for abbey lands without a special ground of discharged are not discharged of course. Neither will any prescription de non dicimando avail in total discharge of tithes unless it relates to such abbey lands. Common or right of common appears from its very definition to be an incorporeal hereditament, being a profit which a man has in the land of another as to feed his beasts, to catch fish, to dig turf, to cut wood or the like. And hence, common is chiefly of four sorts, common of pasture, of piscary, of turbery, and of his stovers. 1. Common of pasture is a right of feeding one's beasts on another's land. For in those waste grounds, which are usually called commons, the property of the soil is generally in the lord of the manor, as in common fields it is in the particular tenants. This kind of common is either a pendant, a pertinent, because of vicinage, or in gross. Common a pendant is a right belonging to the owners or occupiers of arable land to put commonable beasts upon the lord's waste and upon the land of other persons within the same manner. Commonal beasts are either beasts of the plough 
or such as manure the ground. This is a matter of most universal right, and it was originally permitted not only for the encouragement of agriculture, but for the necessity of the thing. For when lords of manors granted out parcels of land to tenants for services either done or to be done, these tenants could not plough or manure the land without beasts. These beasts could not be sustained without pasture, and pasture could not be had but in the lord's wastes, and on the unenclosed fallow grounds of themselves and the other tenants. The law, therefore, annexed this right of common as inseparably incident to the grant of the lands. And this was the original of common appendant, which obtains in Sweden and the other northern kingdoms much in the same manner as in England. Common appurtenant is where the owner of land has a right to put in other beasts besides such as are generally commonable, as hogs, goats, and the like, which neither plough nor manure the ground. This, not arising from the necessity of the thing, like common appendant, is therefore not of common right, but can only be claimed by immemorial usage and prescription, which the law esteems sufficient proof of a special grant or agreement for this purpose. Common because of vicinage or neighborhood is where the inhabitants of two townships, which lie contiguous to each other, have usually intercommoned with one another, the beasts of the one straying mutually into the other's fields without any molestation from either. This is indeed only a permissive right, intended to excuse what in strictness is a trespass in both, and to prevent a multiplicity of suits, and therefore either township may enclose and bar out the other, though they have intercommoned time out of mind. Neither hath any person of one town a right to put his beasts originally into the other's common, but if they escape and stray thither of themselves, the law winks at the trespass. Common and gross, or at large, is such as is neither a pendant nor a pertinent to land, but is annexed to a man's person, being granted to him and his heirs by deed, or it may be claimed by prescriptive right, as by parsons of a church or the like corporation's soul. This is a separate inheritance, entirely distinct from any landed property, and may be vested in one who has not a foot of ground in the manor. All these species of pasturable common may be, and usually are limited, as to number and time. But there are also commons without stint, and which last all year. By the statute of Merton, however, and other subsequent statutes, the lord of a manor may enclose so much of the waste as he pleases for tillage or wood ground, provided he leaves common sufficient for such as are entitled thereto. This enclosure, when justifiable, is called, in law, approving, an ancient expression signifying the same as improving. The Lord hath the sole interest in the soil, but the interest of the Lord and commoner in the common are looked upon in law as mutual. They may both bring actions for damage done, either against strangers or each other, the Lord for the public injury, and each commoner for his private damage. 2, 3. Common of Piscary is a liberty of fishing in another man's waters, as common of Turbury is a liberty of digging turf upon another's ground. There is also a common of digging for coals, minerals, stones, and the like. All these bear a resemblance to common of pasture in many respects, though in one point they go much farther. Common of pasture, being only a right of feeding on the herbage and vesture of the soil, which renews annually, but common of turbury and the rest are a right of carrying away the very soil itself. Or, common of estovers, from estoffer to furnish, is a liberty of taking necessary wood 
for the use or furniture of a house or farm from off another's estate. The Saxon word boat is of the same signification with the French estovers, and therefore houseboat is a sufficient allowance of wood to repair or to burn in the house, which latter is sometimes called fireboat. Plowboat and cartboat are wood to be employed in making and repairing all instruments of husbandry, and hayboat or hedgeboat is wood for repairing of hays, hedges, or fences. These boats or estovers must be reasonable ones, and such any tenant or lessee may take off the land let or demise to him without waiting for any leave, assignment, or appointment of the lessor unless he be restrained by special covenant to the contrary. These several species of commons do all originally result from the same necessity as common pasture, viz., for the maintenance and carrying on of husbandry, common of piscary being given for the sustenance of the tenant's family, common of turbury and fireboat for his fuel, and houseboat, plowboat, cartboat, and hedgeboat for repairing his house, his instruments of tillage, and the necessary fences of his grounds. End of chapter 3, part 2. Chapter 3, part 3 of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, book 2, by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes of Incorporeal Hereditaments, Part 3. 4. A fourth species of incorporeal hereditaments is that of ways, or the right of going over another man's ground. I speak not here of the king's highways, which lead from town to town, nor yet of common ways leading from a village into the fields, but of private ways in which a particular man may have an interest and a right, though another be owner of the soil. This may be grounded on a special permission, as when the owner of the land grants to another a liberty of passing over his grounds to go to church, to market, or the like, in which case the gift or grant is particular and confined to the grantee alone. It dies with the person, and if the grantee leaves the country, he cannot assign over his right to any other nor can he justify taking another person in his company. A way may be also by prescription, as if all the owners and occupiers of such a farm have immemorially used to cross another's ground. For this immemorial usage supposes an original grant, whereby a right-of-way thus appurtenant to land may clearly be created. A right-of-way may also arise by act and operation of law. For if a man grants me a piece of ground in the middle of his field, he at the same time tacitly and impliedly gives me a way to come at it, and I may cross his land for that purpose without trespass. For when the law doth give anything to one, it giveth impliedly whatsoever is necessary for enjoying the same. By the law of the twelve tables at Rome, where a man had the right of way over another's land, and the road was out of repair, he who had the right of way might go over any part of the land he pleased, which was the established rule in public as well as private ways. And the law of England, in both cases, seems to correspond with the Romans. 5. Offices, which are a right to exercise a public or private employment, and the fees and emoluments thereunto belonging, are also incorporeal hereditaments, whether public, as those of magistrates, or private, as of bailiffs, receivers, and the like. For a man may have an estate in them, either to him and his heirs, or for life, or for a term of years, 
or during pleasure only, save only that offices of public trust cannot be granted for a term of years, especially if they concern the administration of justice, for then they might perhaps vest in the executors or administrators. Neither can any judicial office be granted in reversion, because, though the grantee may be able to perform it at the time of the grant, yet before the office falls he may become unable and insufficient, but ministerial offices may be so granted, for those may be executed by deputy. Also, by Statute 5 and 6, Edward the Sixth, C. 16, no public office shall be sold under pain of disability to dispose of or hold it. For the law presumes that he who buys an office will by bribery, extortion, or other unlawful means make his purchase good to the manifest detriment of the public. 6. Dignities bear a relation to offices. Of the nature of these we treat it at large in the former book. It will therefore be here sufficient to mention them as a species of incorporeal hereditaments wherein a man may have a property or a state. 7. Franchises are a seventh species. Franchise and liberty are used as synonymous terms, and their definition is a royal privilege or branch of the king's prerogative subsisting in the hands of a subject. Being therefore derived from the crown, they must arise from the king's grant, or, in some cases, may be held by prescription, which, as has been frequently said, presupposes a grant. The kinds of them are various, and almost infinite. I will here briefly touch upon some of the principal, premising only that they may be vested in either natural persons or bodies politic in one man or in many. But the same identical franchise that has before been granted to one cannot be bestowed on another, for that would prejudice the former grant. To be a county palatine is a franchise vested in a number of persons. It is likewise a franchise for a number of persons to be incorporated and subsist as a body politic with a power to maintain perpetual succession and do other corporate acts. And each individual member of such corporation is also said to have a franchise or freedom. Other franchises are to hold a court leet, to have a manor or lordship, or at least to have a lordship paramount, to have waifs, wrecks, estrays, treasure trove, royal fish, forfeitures and diodans, to have a court of one's own, or liberty of holding pleas and trying causes, to have the cognizance of pleas, which is still a greater liberty, being an exclusive right, so that no other court shall try causes arising within that jurisdiction, to have a bailiwick, or liberty exempt from the sheriff of the county, wherein the grantee only and his officers are to execute all process, to have a fair or market with the right of taking toll, either there or at any other public places, as at bridges, wharfs, and the like, which tolls must have reasonable cause of commencement, as in consideration of repairs or the like, else the franchise is illegal and void. Or, lastly, to have a forest, chase, park, warren, or fishery, endowed with privileges of royalty, which species of franchise may require a more minute discussion. As to a forest, this, in the hands of a subject, is properly the same thing with a chase, being subject to the common law and not to the forest laws. But a chase differs from a park in that it is not enclosed, and also in that a man may have a chase in another man's ground as well as his own, being indeed the liberty of keeping beasts of chase or royal game therein, protected even from the owner of the land with a power of hunting them thereon. A park is an enclosed chase, 
extending only over a man's own ground. The word park, indeed, properly signifies any enclosure, but yet it is not every field or common which a gentleman pleases to surround with a wall or paling and to stock with a herd of deer that is thereby constituted a legal park. For the king's grant, or at least immemorial prescription, is necessary to make it so. Though now the difference between a real park and such enclosed grounds is in many respects not very material, only that it is unlawful at common law for any person to kill any beasts of park or chase, except such as possess these franchises of forest, chase, or park. Free Warren is a similar franchise, erected for preservation or custody, which the word signifies, of beasts and fowls of Warren, which, being ferae naturae, every one had a natural right to kill as he could. But upon introduction of the forest laws at the Norman conquest, as will be shown hereafter, these animals being looked upon as royal game and the sole property of our savage monarchs, this franchise of free warren was invented to protect them. By giving the grantee a sole and exclusive power of killing such game so far as his warren extended on condition of his preventing other persons. A man, therefore, that has the franchise of warren is in reality no more than a royal gamekeeper. But no man, not even the lord of a manor, could by common law justify sporting on another's soil, or even his own, unless he had the liberty of free warren. This franchise is almost fallen into disregard, since the new statutes for preserving the game, the name being now chiefly preserved in grounds that are set apart for breeding hares and rabbits. There are many instances of keen sportsmen in ancient times who have sold their estates and reserved the free warren or right of killing game to themselves, by which means it comes to pass that a man and his heirs may have sometimes free warren over another's ground. A free fishery or exclusive right of fishing in a public river is also a royal franchise and is considered as such in all countries where the feudal polity has prevailed, though making such grants, and by that means appropriating what seems to be unnatural to restrain, the use of running water was prohibited for the future by King John's great charter, and the rivers that were fenced in his time were directed to be laid open, as well as the forests to be disafforested. This opening was extended by the second and third charters of Henry the Third, to those also that were fenced under Richard the First, so that a franchise of free fishery ought now to be at least as old as the reign of Henry the Second. This differs from a several fishery, because he that has a several fishery must also be the owner of the soil, which in a free fishery is not requisite. It differs also from a common piscary before mentioned in that the free fishery is an exclusive right, the common of piscary is not so, and therefore in a free fishery a man has a property in the fish before they are caught, in a common piscary not till afterwards. Some indeed have considered a free fishery not as a royal franchise, but merely as a private grant of a liberty to fish in the several fishery of the grantor. But the considering such a right as originally a flower of the prerogative, till restrained by Magna Carta, and derived by royal grant previous to the reign of Richard I, to such as now claim it by prescription, may remove some difficulties in respect to this matter, with which our books are embarrassed. 8. Charities are a right of sustenance, or to receive certain allotments of victual and provision for one's maintenance, in lieu of which, especially when due from ecclesiastical persons, a pension or sum of money is sometimes substituted. And these may be reckoned another species of incorporeal hereditaments, 
though not chargeable on or issuing from any corporeal inheritance, but only charged on the person of the owner in respect of such his inheritance. To these may be added 9. Annuities, which are much of the same nature, only that these arise from temporal, as the former from spiritual persons. An annuity is a thing very distinct from a rent charge, with which it is frequently confounded. A rent charge being a burden imposed upon and issuing out of lands, whereas an annuity is a yearly sum chargeable only upon the person of the grantor. Therefore, if a man by deed grant to another the sum of twenty pounds per annum, without expressing out of what lands it shall issue, no land at all shall be charged with it, but it is a mere personal annuity, which is of so little account in the law, that if granted to an eleemosynary corporation, it is not within the statutes of Mortmain, and yet a man may have a real estate in it, though his security is merely personal. 10. Rents are the last species of incorporeal hereditaments. The word rent, or render, reditus, signifies a compensation or return, it being in the nature of an acknowledgment given for the possession of some corporeal inheritance. It is defined to be a certain profit issuing yearly out of lands and tenements corporeal. It must be a profit, yet there is no occasion for it to be, as it usually is, a sum of money. For spurs, capons, horses, corn, and other matters may be rendered, and frequently are rendered, by way of rent. It may also consist in services or manual operations, as to plough so many acres of ground, to attend the king or the lord to the wars, and the like, which service, in the eye of the law, are profits. This profit must also be certain or that which may be reduced to a certainty by either party. It must also issue yearly, though there is no occasion for it to issue every successive year, but it may be reserved for every second, third, or fourth year. Yet, as it is to be produced out of the profits of the land and tenements, as a recompense for being permitted to hold and enjoy them, it ought to be reserved yearly, because those profits do annually arise and are annually renewed. It must issue out of the thing granted and not be part of the land or thing itself, wherein it differs from an exception in the grant, which is always of part of the thing granted. It must, lastly, issue out of lands and tenements corporeal, that is, form some inheritance whereunto the owner or grantee of the rent may have recourse to distrain. Therefore, a rent cannot be reserved out of an advowson, a common, an office, a franchise, or the like. But a grant of such annuity or sum may operate as a personal contract and oblige the grantor to pay the money reserved or subject him to an action of debt. Though it doth not affect the inheritance, and is no legal rent in contemplation of law. There are at common law three manner of rents. Rent service, rent charge, and rent sec. Rent service is so called because it hath some corporeal service incident to it, as at the least fealty or the feudal oath of fidelity. For if a tenant holds his land by fealty and ten shillings rent, or by the service of ploughing the lord's land and five shillings rent, these pecuniary rents, being connected with personal services, are therefore called rent service. And for these, in case they be behind or arrear, at the day appointed, the lord may distrain of common right without reserving any special power of distress provided he hath in himself the reversion or future estate of the lands and tenements after the lease or particular estate of the lessee or grantee is expired. A rent charge is where the owner of the rent 
hath no future interest or reversion expectant in the land, as where a man by deed maketh over to others his whole estate in fee simple, with a certain rent payable thereout, and adds to the deed a covenant or clause of distress, that if the rent be a rear or behind, it shall be lawful to distrain for the same. In this case, the land is liable to the distress, not of common right, but by virtue of the clause in the deed. And therefore, it is called a rent charge, because in this manner, the land is charged with a distress for the payment of it. Rent sec, reddita secus, or barren rent, is in effect nothing more than a rent reserved by deed, but without any clause of distress. There are also other species of rents which are reducible to these three. Rents of assize are the certain established rents of the freeholders and ancient copyholders of a manor which cannot be departed from or varied. Those of the freeholders are frequently called chief rents, reditus capitalis, and both sorts are indifferently denominated quit rents, quieti reditus because thereby the tenant goes quit and free of all other services. When these payments were reserved in silver or white money, they were anciently called white rents or blanche farms, reditus albi, in contradistinction to rents reserved in work, grain, etc., which were called reditus nigri or blackmail. Rack rent is only a rent of the full value of the tenement or nearer it. A free farm rent is a rent charge issuing out of an estate in fee of at least one-fourth of the value of the lands at the time of its reservation. For a grant of lands reserving so considerable a rent is indeed only letting lands to farm in fee simple instead of the usual methods of life or years. These are the general divisions of rent, but the difference between them, in respect to the remedy for recovering them, is now totally abolished, and all persons may have the like remedy by distress for rent sec, rents of assize, and chief rents, as in case of rents reserved upon lease. Rent is regularly due and payable upon the land from whence it issues, if no particular place is mentioned in the reservation. But in case of the king, the payment must be either to his officers at the exchequer or to his receiver in the country. And strictly, the rent is demandable and payable before the time of sunset on the day whereon it is reserved, though some have thought it not absolutely due till midnight. With regard to the original of rents, something will be said in the next chapter, and as to the distresses and other remedies for their recovery, the doctrine relating thereto, and the several proceedings thereon, these belong properly to the third part of our commentaries, which will treat of civil injuries and the means whereby they are redressed. End of chapter 3, part 3. Chapter 4, part 1 of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book 2, by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes. Of the Feudal System, Part 1. It is impossible to understand, with any degree of accuracy, either the civil constitution of this kingdom or the laws which regulate its landed property without some general acquaintance with the nature and doctrine of feuds or the feudal law, a system so universally received throughout Europe upwards of twelve centuries ago that Sir Henry Spellman does not scruple to call it the law of nations in our Western world. This chapter will be therefore dedicated to this inquiry, and though 
In the course of our observations in this and many other parts of the present book, we may have occasion to search pretty highly into the antiquities of our English jurisprudence, yet surely no industrious student will imagine his time misemployed when he is led to consider that the obsolete doctrines of our laws are frequently the foundation upon which what remains is erected and that it is impractical to comprehend many rules of the modern law in a scholarlike scientific manner without having recourse to the ancient. Nor will these researches be altogether void of rational entertainment as well as use, as in viewing the majestic ruins of Rome or Athens, of Baalbek or Palmyra, it administers both pleasure and instruction to compare them with the drafts of the same edifices in their pristine proportion and splendor. The constitution of feuds had its original from the military policy of the northern or Celtic nations, the Goths, the Huns, the Franks, the Vandals, and the Lombards, who all migrating from the same Officina Gentium, as Craig very justly entitles it, poured themselves in vast quantities into all the regions of Europe, at the declension of the Roman Empire. It was brought by them from their own countries and continued in their respective colonies as the most likely means to secure their new acquisitions. And to that end, large districts or parcels of land were allotted by the conquering general to the superior officers of the army and by them dealt out again in smaller parcels or allotments to the inferior officers and most deserving soldiers. These allotments were called fioda, feuds, fiefs, or fees, which last appellation in the northern languages signifies a conditional stipend or reward. Rewards or stipends they evidently were, and the condition annexed to them was that the possessor should do service faithfully, both at home and in the wars, to him by whom they were given for which purpose he took the juramentum fidelitatis, or oath of fealty, and in case of the breach of this condition and oath, by not performing the stipulated service, or by deserting the Lord in battle, the lands were again to revert to him who granted them. Allotments thus acquired naturally engage such as accepted them to defend them, and, as they all sprang from the same right of conquest, no part could subsist independent of the whole. Wherefore, all givers as well as receivers were mutually bound to defend each other's possessions. But as that could not effectually be done in a tumultuous, irregular way, government, and to that purpose subordination, was necessary. Every receiver of lands or feudatory was therefore bound when called upon by his benefactor or immediate lord of his feud or fee to do all in his power to defend him. Such benefactor or lord was likewise subordinate to and under the command of his immediate benefactor or superior, and so upwards to the prince or general himself. And the several lords were also reciprocally bound in their respective gradations to protect the possessions they had given. Thus, the feudal connection was established, a proper military subjection was naturally introduced, and an army of feudatories were always ready enlisted and mutually prepared to muster, not only in defense of each man's own several property, but also in defense of the whole, and every part of this their newly acquired country, the prudence of which constitution was soon sufficiently visible in the strength and spirit with which they maintained their conquests. The universality and early use of this feudal plan among all those nations which in complacence to the Romans we still call barbarous may appear from what is recorded of the Cimbri and Teutons, nations of the same northern original as those whom we have been describing at their first eruption into Italy about a century before the Christian era. They demanded of the Romans, ut martus populus aliquid sibi terre deret, 
quasi stupendem caeterum ut velet minibus atque armis sui uteretor, the sense of which may be thus rendered. They desired stipendary lands, that is, feuds, to be allowed them, to be held by military and other personal services whenever their lords should call upon them. This was evidently the same constitution that displayed itself more fully about 700 years afterwards, when Sally, Burgundians, and Franks broke in upon Gaul, the Visigoths on Spain, and the Lombards upon Italy, and introduced with themselves this northern plan of polity, serving at once to distribute and to protect the territories they had newly gained. And from hence it is probable that the Emperor Alexander Severus took the hint of dividing lands conquered from the enemy among his generals and victorious soldiery on condition of receiving military service from them and their heirs forever. Scarce had these northern conquerors established themselves in their new dominions when the wisdom of their constitutions, as well as their personal valor, alarmed all the princes of Europe that is, of those countries which had formerly been Roman provinces but had revolted or were deserted by their old masters in the general wreck of the empire. Wherefore most, if not all of them, thought it necessary to enter into the same or similar plan of policy. For whereas before the possessions of their subjects were perfectly allodial, that is, wholly independent and held of no superior at all, now they parceled out their royal territories or persuaded their subjects to surrender up and retake their own landed property under the like feudal obligation of military fealty. And thus, in the compass of a very few years, the feudal constitution, or the doctrine of tenure, extended itself over all the Western world, which alteration of landed property, in so very material a point, necessarily drew after it an alteration of laws and customs, so that the feudal laws soon drove out the Roman, which had hitherto universally obtained, but now became for many centuries lost and forgotten, and Italy itself, as some of the civilians with more spleen than judgment have expressed it, Belluinas atque ferinas, i menesque longo badorum legis acipit. But this feudal polity, which was thus by degrees established all over the continent of Europe, seems not to have been received in this part of our island, at least not universally, and as part of the national constitution, till the reign of William the Norman. Not but that it is reasonable to believe, from abundant traces in our history and laws, that even in the times of the Saxons, who were a swarm from what Sir William Temple calls the same northern hive, something similar to this was in use, yet not so extensively, nor attended with all the rigor that was afterwards imported by the Normans, for the Saxons were firmly settled in this island at least as early as the year 600, and it was not till two centuries after that the feuds arrived to their full vigor and maturity even on the continent of Europe. This introduction, however, of the feudal tenures into England by King William does not seem to have been effected immediately after the conquest, nor by the mere arbitrary will and power of the conqueror, but to have been consented to by the great council of the nation long after his title was established. Indeed, from the prodigious slaughter of the English nobility at the Battle of Hastings and the fruitless insurrections of those who survived, such numerous forfeitures had accrued that he was able to reward his Norman followers with very large and extensive possessions, which gave a handle to the monkish historians and such as have implicitly followed them to represent him as having by right of the sword seized on all the lands of England and dealt them out again to his own favorites. A supposition grounded upon a mistaken sense of the word conquest, which, in its feudal acceptation, signifies no more than acquisition, and this has led many hasty writers into a strange historical mistake, 
and one which upon the slightest examination will be found to be most untrue. However, Certain it is that the Normans now began to gain very large possessions in England, and their regard for feudal law, under which they had long lived, together with the king's recommendation of this policy to the English, as the best way to put themselves on a military footing, and thereby to prevent any future attempts from the continent, were probably the reasons that prevailed to effect its establishment here and perhaps we may be able to ascertain the time of this great revolution in our landed property with a tolerable degree of exactness. For we learn from the Saxon Chronicle that in the 19th year of King William's reign, an invasion was apprehended from Denmark, and the military constitution of the Saxons being then laid aside, and no other introduced in its stead, the kingdom was wholly defenseless which occasioned the king to bring over a large army of Normans and Bretons who were quartered upon every landholder and greatly oppressed the people. This apparent weakness, together with the grievances occasioned by a foreign force, might cooperate with the king's remonstrances and the better incline the nobility to listen to his proposals for putting them in a posture of defense. For as soon as the danger was over, the king held a great council to inquire into the state of the nation, the immediate consequence of which was the compiling of the great survey called Doomsday Book, which was finished in the next year. And in the latter end of that very year, the king was attended by all his nobility at Sarum, where all the principal landholders submitted their lands to the yoke of military tenure, became the king's vassals, and did homage and fealty to his person. This seems to have been the era of formally introducing the feudal tenures by law, and probably the very law thus made at the Council of Sarum is that which is still extant and couched in these remarkable words, Statuinos ut omnes liberi omnes, poedre e sacramento affirmen, quod intra et extra universum Regnum Angle Vilmo Regi Domino, suo fideles esse volunt, teras et honores illius omni fidelitate, ubique servare comeo, et tre contra inimicos, et talieni genus defendere. The terms of this law, as Sir Martin Wright has observed, are plainly feudal, for, first it requires the oath of fealty, which made in the sense of the feudists every man that took it a tenant or vassal, and secondly, the tenants obliged themselves to defend their lord's territories and titles against all enemies foreign and domestic. But what puts the matter out of dispute is another law of the same collection, which exacts the performance of the military feudal services as ordained by the general council. Omnis comites et barones et milites, et servientes, et universi liberi homines, totius regni nostri predicti, abent et tenant, se semper bene in armis et in equis, ut decet et uporte, et sint semper prompte et bene parate, at servitium sum integrum nobis explendum, et peregendem cum opis fueret, secundum quod nobis debente defiodis, et de tenemente sui de jure facere, et de sic utilos statuimos per comin concilium, totius regne nostri praedicti. This new polity, therefore, seems not to have been imposed by the conqueror, but nationally and freely adopted by the general assembly of the whole realm, in the same manner as other nations of Europe had before adopted it, upon the same principle of self-security, and, in particular, they had the recent example of the French nation before their eyes, which had gradually surrendered up all its allodial or free lands into the king's hands, who restored them to the owners as a beneficium or feud to be held to them and such of their heirs as they previously nominated to the king. And thus, by degrees, 
all the Olodio estates of France were converted into feuds, and the freemen became the vassals of the crown. The only difference between this change of tenures in France and that in England was that the former was effected gradually by the consent of private persons. The latter was done at once all over England by the common consent of the nation. In consequence of this change, it became a fundamental maxim and necessary principle, though in reality a mere fiction, of our English tenures that the king is the universal lord and original proprietor of all the lands in his kingdom, and that no man doth or can possess any part of it, but what has mediately or immediately been derived as a gift from him to be held upon feudal services. For this being the real case in pure, original, proper feuds, other nations who adopted this system were obliged to act upon the same supposition, as a substruction and foundation of their new polity, though the fact was indeed far otherwise. And indeed, by thus consenting to the introduction of feudal tenures, our English ancestors probably meant no more than to put the kingdom in a state of defense by establishing a military system, and to oblige themselves, in respect of their lands, to maintain the king's title and territories with equal vigor and fealty, as if they had received their lands from his bounty upon these express conditions as pure, proper, beneficiary feudatories. But whatever their meaning was, the Norman interpreters, skilled in all the niceties of the feudal constitutions, and well understanding the import and extent of the feudal terms, gave a very different construction to this proceeding and thereupon took a handle to introduce not only the rigorous doctrines which prevailed in the Duchy of Normandy, but also such fruits and dependencies, such hardships and services as were never known to other nations, as if the English had, in fact, as well as theory, owed everything they had to the bounty of their sovereign lord. Our ancestors, therefore, who were by no means beneficiaries, but had barely consented to this fiction of tenure from the crown as the basis of a military discipline, with reason looked upon these deductions as grievous impositions and arbitrary conclusions from principles that, as to them, had no foundation in truth. However, this king and his son William Rufus kept up with a high hand all the rigors of the feudal doctrines. But their successor, Henry I, found it expedient, when he set up his pretensions to the crown, to promise a restitution of the laws of Edward the Confessor, or ancient Saxon system, and accordingly, in the first year of his reign, granted a charter, whereby he gave up the greater grievances, but still reserved the fiction of feudal tenure, for the same military purposes which engaged his father to introduce it. But this charter was gradually broken through, and the former grievances were revived and aggravated by himself and succeeding princes, till in the reign of King John they became so intolerable that they had occasioned his barons or principal feudatories to rise up in arms against him, which at length produced the famous Great Charter at Runningmead, which, with some alterations, was confirmed by his son Henry III and though its immunities, especially as altered on its last edition by his son, are very greatly short of those granted by Henry I, it was justly esteemed at the time a vast acquisition to English liberty. Indeed, by the farther alteration of tenures that has since happened, many of these immunities may now appear, to a common observer, of much less consequence than they really were when granted. But this, properly considered, will show not that the acquisitions under John were small, but that those under Charles were greater. And from hence also arises another inference, that the liberties of Englishmen are not, as some arbitrary writers would represent them, mere infringements of the king's prerogative extorted from our princes by taking advantage of their weakness, but a restoration of that ancient constitution 
of which our ancestors had been defrauded by the art and finesse of the Norman lawyers rather than deprived by the force of the Norman arms. End of chapter 4, part 1. Chapter 4, part 2 of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book 2, by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes. Of the Feudal System, Part 2. Having given this short history of their rise and progress, we will next consider the nature, doctrine, and principal laws of feuds, wherein we shall evidently trace the groundwork of many parts of our public polity, and also the original of such of our own tenures as were either abolished in the last century or still remain in force. The grand and fundamental maxim of all feudal tenure is this that all lands were originally granted out by the sovereign and are therefore holden either immediately or immediately of the crown. The grantor was called the proprietor or lord, being he who retained the dominion or ultimate property of the feud or fee, and the grantee, who had only the use and possession, according to the terms of the grant, was styled the feudatory or vassal which was only another name for the tenant or holder of the lands, though on account of the prejudices we have justly conceived against the doctrines that were afterwards granted on this system, we now use the word vassal opprobriously as synonymous to slave or bondman. The manner of the grant was by words of gratuitous and pure donation, de diet concessi, which are still the operative words in our modern infudations or deeds of fiefment. This was perfected by the ceremony of corporal investiture, or open and notorious delivery of possession in the presence of other vassals, which perpetuated among them the era of the new acquisition at a time when the art of writing was very little known. And therefore, the evidence of property was reposed in the memory of the neighborhood who, in case of a disputed title, were afterwards called upon to decide the difference, not only according to external proofs adduced by the party's litigant, but also by the internal testimony of their own private knowledge. Besides an oath of fealty, or profession of faith to the Lord, which was the parent of our oath of allegiance, the vassal or tenant upon investiture did usually homage to his Lord openly and humbly kneeling, being ungirt, uncovered, and holding up his hands, both together between those of the Lord who sat before him, and there professing that he did become his man from that day forth of life and limb and earthly honor, and then he received a kiss from his Lord, which ceremony was denominated homagium, or manhood, by the feudists, from the stated form of words divinio besteromo. When the tenant had thus professed himself to be the man of his superior or lord, the next consideration was concerning the service, which, as such, he was bound to render in recompense for the land he held. This, in pure, proper, and original feuds, was only twofold, to follow or do suit to the Lord in his courts in time of peace, and in his armies or warlike retinue when necessity called him to the field. The Lord was, in early times, the legislator and judge over all his feudatories, and therefore the vassals of the inferior lords were bound by their fealty to attend their domestic courts barren, which were instituted in every manner or barony for doing speedy and effectual justice to all the tenants, in order as well as to answer such complaints as might be alleged against themselves as to form a jury or homage for the trial of their fellow tenants. And upon this account, in all the feudal institutions both here and on the continent, 
they are distinguished by the appellation of the peers of the court, pares curtis, or pares curiae. In like manner, the barons themselves, or lords of inferior districts, were denominated peers of the king's court, and were bound to attend him upon summons, to hear causes of greater consequence in the king's presence and under the direction of his grand judiciary, till, in many countries, the power of that officer was broken and distributed into other courts of judicature, the peers of the king's court still reserving to themselves, in almost every feudal government, the right of appeal from those subordinate courts in the last resort. The military branch of service consisted in attending the Lord to the wars, if called upon, with such a retinue, and for such a number of days, as were stipulated at the first donation, in proportion to the quantity of the land. At the first introduction of feuds, as they were gratuitous, so also they were precarious and held at the will of the Lord, who was the sole judge of whether his vassal performed his services faithfully. Then they became certain for one or more years. Among the ancient Germans, they continued only from year to year, an annual distribution of lands being made by their leaders in their general councils or assemblies. This was professedly done lest their thoughts should be diverted from war to agriculture, lest the strong should encroach on the possessions of the weak and lest luxury and avarice should be encouraged by the erection of permanent houses and too curious an attention to convenience and elegant superfluities of life. But, when the general migration was pretty well over, and a peaceable possession of their new acquired settlements had introduced new customs and manners, when the fertility of the soil had encouraged the study of husbandry, and an affection for the spots they had cultivated began naturally to arise in the tillers, a more permanent degree of property was introduced, and feuds began now to be granted for the life of the feudatory. But still feuds were not yet hereditary, though frequently granted by the favor of the Lord to the children of the former possessor, till, in process of time, it became unusual, and was therefore thought hard to reject the heir if he were capable to perform the services, and therefore infants, women, and professed monks who were incapable of bearing arms were also incapable of succeeding to a genuine feud. But the heir, when admitted to the feud which his ancestor possessed, used generally to pay a fine or acknowledgment to the Lord in horses, arms, money, and the like, for such renewal of the feud, which was called a relief because it re-established the inheritance, or in the words of the feudal writers, incertum et ecaducum eredatum relevabat. This relief was afterwards, when feuds became absolutely hereditary, continued on the death of the tenant, though the original foundation of it had ceased. For in process of time, Feuds came by degrees to be universally extended beyond the life of the first vassal to his sons, or perhaps to such one of them as the Lord should name. And in this case, the form of the donation was strictly observed. For if the feud was given to a man and his sons, all his sons succeeded him in equal portions. And as they died off, their shares reverted to the Lord, and did not descend to their children or even to their surviving brothers, as not being specified in the donation. But when such a feud was given to a man and his heirs in general terms, then a more extended rule of succession took place, and when a feudatory died, his male descendants in infinitum were admitted to the succession. When any such descendant, who thus had succeeded, died, his male descendants were also admitted in the first place, and, in defect of them, such of his male collateral kindred as were of the blood or lineage of the first feudatory, but no others. For this was an unalterable maxim in the feudal succession, that none was capable of inheriting a feud, but such as was of the blood of, that is, lineally descended from, 
the first feudatory. And the descent, being thus confined to males, originally extended to all the males alike. All the sons, without any distinction of primogeniture, succeeding to equal portions of the father's feud. But this being found upon many accounts inconvenient, particularly by dividing the services and thereby weakening the strength of the feudal union, and honorary feuds, or titles of nobility, being now introduced, which were not of a divisible nature, but could only be inherited by the eldest son. In imitation of these, military feuds, or those we are now describing, began also in most countries to descend according to the same rule of primogeniture to the eldest son in exclusion of all the rest. Other qualities of feuds were that the feudatory could not alien or dispose of his feud. Neither could he exchange, nor yet mortgage, nor even devise it by will without the consent of the Lord. Or, the reason of conferring the feud being the personal abilities of the feudatory to serve in war, it was not fit he should be at liberty to transfer this gift either from himself or his posterity, who were presumed to inherit his valor, to others who might prove less able. And, as the feudal obligation was looked upon as reciprocal, the feudatory, being entitled to the Lord's protection in return for his own fealty and service, Therefore, the Lord could no more transfer his seigneury or protection without the consent of his vassal than the vassal could his feud without consent of his Lord, it being equally unreasonable that the Lord should extend his protection to a person to whom he had exceptions, and that the vassal should owe subjection to a superior not of his own choosing. These were the principal and very simple qualities of the genuine or original feuds, being then all of a military nature and in the hands of military persons. Though feudatories, being under frequent incapacities of cultivating and manuring their own lands, soon found it necessary to commit part of them to inferior tenants, obliging them to such returns in service, corn, cattle, or money as might enable the chief feudatories to attend their military duties without distraction, which returns, or reditus, were the original of rents. And by this means the feudal polity was greatly extended. These inferior feudatories, who held what are called in the Scots law rare fiefs, being under similar obligations of fealty, to do suit of court, to answer the stipulated renders or rent service, and to promote the welfare of their immediate superiors or lords. But this, at the same time, demolished the ancient simplicity of feuds, and an inroad being once made upon their constitution, it subjected them, in a course of time, to great varieties and innovations. Feuds came to be bought and sold, and deviations were made from the old fundamental rules of tenure and succession, which were held no longer sacred when the feuds themselves no longer continued to be purely military. Hence, these tenures now to be divided into feoda propria et impropria, proper and improper feuds, under the former of which divisions were comprehended such and such only of which we have before spoken, and under that of improper or derivative feuds were comprised all such as do not fall within the other description. Such, for instance, as were originally bartered and sold to the feudatory for a price. Such as were held upon base or less honorable services, or upon a rent in lieu of military service. Such as were in themselves alienable without mutual license and such as might descend indifferently to either males or females. But where a difference was not expressed in the creation, such new created feuds did in all other respects follow the nature of an original, genuine, and proper feud. But as soon as the feudal system came to be considered in the light of a civil establishment rather than as a military plan, 
the ingenuity of the same ages which perplexed all theology with the subtlety of scholastic disquisitions and bewildered philosophy in the mazes of metaphysical jargon began also to exert its influence on this copious and fruitful subject in pursuance of which the most refined and oppressive consequences were drawn from what originally was a plan of simplicity and liberty equally beneficial to both lord and tenant and prudently calculated for their mutual protection and defence from this one foundation in different countries of europe very different superstructures have been raised what effect it has produced on the landed property of england will appear in the following chapters end of chapter four part two Chapter 5, Part 1 of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book 2, by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes. Of the Ancient English Tenures, Part 1. In this chapter, we shall take a short view of the ancient tenures of our English estates, or the manner in which lands, tenements, and hereditaments might have been holden, as the same stood in force till the middle of the last century, in which we shall easily perceive that all the peculiarities, all the seeming and real hardships that attended those tenures were to be accounted for upon feudal principles and no other being fruits of and deduced from feudal policy almost all the real property of this kingdom is by the policy of our laws supposed to be granted by dependent upon and holden of some superior lord by and in consideration of certain services to be rendered to the lord by the tenant or possessor of this property the thing holden is therefore styled a tenement the possessors thereof, tenants, and the manner of their possession, a tenure. Thus, all the land in the kingdom is supposed to be holden, immediately or immediately, of the king, who is styled the Lord Paramount, or above all. Such tenants, as held under the king immediately, when they granted out portions of their lands to inferior persons, became also lords with respect to those inferior persons, as they were still tenants with respect to the king, and thus partaking of a middle nature were called mean or middle lords. So that if the king granted a manor to A, and he granted a portion of the land to B, now B was said to hold of A and A of the king, or, in other words, B held his lands immediately of A, but immediately of the king. The king, therefore, was styled Lord Paramount. A was both tenant and lord, or was a mean lord, and B was called Tenant Paravail, or the lowest tenant, being he who is supposed to make a veil or profit of the land. In this manner are all the lands of the kingdom holden, which are in the hands of subjects. For, according to Sir Edward Coke, in the law of England we have not properly a lodium, which we have seen, is the name by which the feudists abroad distinguish such estates of the subject as are not holden of any superior. So that at the first glance we may observe that our lands are either plainly feuds or partake very strongly of the feudal nature. All tenures being thus derived or supposed to be derived from the king, those that held immediately under him, in right of his crown and dignity, were called tenants in capite, or in chief, which was the most honorable species of tenure, but at the same time subjected the tenants to greater and more burdensome services than inferior tenures did. This distinction ran through all the different sorts of tenure, of which I now proceed to give an account. 1. There seem to have subsisted among our ancestors four principal species of lay tenures to which all others may be reduced, the grand criteria of which 
were the natures of the several services or renders that were due to the lords from their tenants. The services, in respect of their quality, were either free or base services. In respect of their quantity and time of exacting them, were either certain or uncertain. Free services, such as were not unbecoming the character of a soldier or a freeman to perform, as to serve under his lord in the wars, to pay a sum of money, and the like. Base services were such as were fit only for peasants or persons of a servile rank, as to plough the lord's land, to make his hedges, to carry out his dung, or other mean employments. The certain services, whether free or base, were such as were stinted in quantity, and could not be exceeded on any pretense, as to pay a stated annual rent, or to plough such a field for three days. The uncertain depended upon unknown contingencies, as to do military service in person, or pay an assessment in lieu of it when called upon, or to win the horn whenever the Scots invaded the realm, which are free services, or to do whatever the Lord should command, which is a base or villain service. From the various combinations of these services have arisen the four kinds of lay tenures which subsisted in England till the middle of the last century, and three of which subsist to this day. Of these, Bracton, who wrote under Henry III, seems to give the clearest and most compendious account of any author, ancient or modern, of which the following is the outline or abstract. Tenements are of two kinds, frank tenement and villainage. And of frank tenements, some are held freely in consideration of homage and night service, others in free sockage with the service of fealty only. And again, of villainages, some are pure and others privileged. He that holds in pure villainage shall do whatever is commanded him and always be bound to an uncertain service. The other kind of villainage is called villain sockage. And these villain sockmen do villain services, but such as are certain and determined, of which sense seems to be as follows. First, where the service was free, but uncertain, as military service with homage, that tenure was called tenure in chivalry, per servitum militare, or by night service. Secondly, where the service was not only free, but also certain, as by fealty only, by rent and fealty, etc., that tenure was called liberum socagium, or free sockage. These were the only freeholdings or tenements. The others were villainous or servile, as thirdly, where the service was base in its nature and uncertain as to time and quantity, the tenure was purum villainagium, absolute or pure villainage. Lastly, where the service was base in its nature, but reduced to a certainty, this was still villainage, but distinguished from the other by the name of privileged villainage, villainagium privilegiatium, or it could still be called sockage from the certainty of its services, but degraded by their baseness into the inferior title of villanium socagium, villain sockage. 1. The first, most universal, and esteemed the most honorable species of tenure was that by night service, called in Latin servitium militare, and in law French chivalry, or service de chevalier, answering to the fife de aubert of the Normans, which name expressly given it by the mirror. This differed in very few points, as we shall presently see, from a pure and proper feud, being entirely military, and the genuine effect of the feudal establishment in England. To make a tenure by night service, a determinate quantity of land was necessary, which was called a knight's fee, viodem militare, the value of which, not only in the reign of Edward II, but also of Henry II, and therefore probably at its original in the reign of the conqueror, was stated at twenty pounds per annum, and a certain number of these knights' fees were requisite to make up a barony. 
and he who held this proportion of land, or a whole fee, by night service, was bound to attend his lord to the wars for forty days in every year if called upon, which attendance was his reditus, or return, his rent or service for the land he claimed to hold. If he held only half a night's fee, he was only bound to attend twenty days, and so in proportion. And there is reason to apprehend that this service was the whole that our ancestors meant to subject themselves to, the other fruits and consequences of this tenure being fraudulently superinduced as the regular, though unforeseen, appendages of the feudal system. This tenure of night service had all the marks of a strict and regular feud. It was granted by words of pure donation, edi et concessi, was transferred by investiture, or delivering corporal possession of the land, usually called livery of fifen, and was perfected by homage and fealty. It also drew after it these seven fruits and consequences as inseparably incident to the tenure in chivalry, viz. aids, relief, premier sizen, wardship, marriage, fines for alienation, and a shet, all of which I shall endeavor to explain and show to be a feudal original. 1. Aids were originally mere benevolences granted by the tenant to his lord in times of difficulty and distress, but in process of time they grew to be considered as a matter of right and not of discretion. These aids were principally three. First, to ransom the Lord's person if taken prisoner, a necessary consequence of the feudal attachment and fidelity, insomuch that the neglect of doing it, whenever it was in the vassal's power, was, by the strict rigor of the feudal law, an absolute forfeiture of his estate. Secondly, to make the Lord's eldest son a knight, a matter that was formerly attended with great ceremony, pomp, and expense. This aid could not be demanded till the heir was fifteen years old or capable of bearing arms, the intention of it being to breed up the eldest son and heir apparent of the seigneury to deeds of arms and chivalry for the better defense of the nation. Thirdly, to marry the lord's eldest daughter by giving her a suitable portion, for daughter's portions were in those days extremely slender few lords being able to save much out of their income for this purpose, nor could they acquire money by other means, being wholly conversant in matters of arms, nor, by the nature of their tenure, could they charge their lands with this or any other encumbrances. From bearing their proportion to these aids, no rank or profession was exempted, and therefore, even the monasteries, till the time of their dissolution, contributed to the knighting of the founder's male heir, of whom the lands were holden, and the marriage of his female descendants. And one cannot but observe in this particular the great resemblance which the lord and vassal of the feudal law bore to the patron and client of the Roman Republic, between whom also there subsisted a mutual fealty or engagement of defense and protection. With regard to the matter of aids, there were three which were usually raised by the client, viz., to marry the patron's daughter, to pay his debts, and to redeem his person from captivity. But besides these ancient feudal aids, the tyranny of lords by degrees exacted more and more, as aids to pay the lord's debts, probably in imitation of the Romans, and aids to enable him to pay aids or reliefs to his superior lord, from which the last, indeed, the king's tenants in Capite were, from the nature of their tenure, excused, as they held immediately of the king, who had no superior. To prevent this abuse, King John's Magna Carta ordained that no aids be taken by the king without consent of Parliament, nor in any wise by inferior lords, save only the three ancient ones above mentioned. But this provision was omitted in Henry III's charter, and the same oppressions were continued till the 25 Edward I, when the statute called Conformatio Chartarum was enacted, which in this respect revived King John's charter 
by ordaining that none but the ancient aids should be taken. But though the species of aids was thus restrained, yet the quantity of each aid remained arbitrary and uncertain. King John's Charter indeed ordered that all aids taken by inferior lords should be reasonable, and that the aids taken by the king of his tenants in capite should be settled by Parliament but they were never completely ascertained and adjusted till the statute Westminster 1.3 Edward I C36, which fixed the aids of inferior lords at 20 shillings, or the supposed 20th part of every knight's fee, for making the eldest son a knight or marrying the eldest daughter, and the same was done with regard to the king's tenants in capite by statute 25 Edward III C11. The other aid, for ransom of the Lord's person, being not in its nature capable of any certainty, was therefore never ascertained. 2. Relief, relevium, was before mentioned as incident to every feudal tenure, by way of fine or composition with the Lord, for taking up the estate which was lapsed or fallen in by the death of the last tenant. But though reliefs had their original, while feuds were only life estates, yet they continued after feuds became hereditary, and were therefore looked upon very justly as one of the greatest grievances of tenure, especially when at first they were merely arbitrary and at the will of the Lord, so that, if he pleased to demand an exorbitant relief, it was in effect to disinherit the heir. The English ill-brooked this consequence of their new adopted policy, and therefore William the Conqueror, by his laws, ascertained the relief, by directing, in imitation of the Danish Harriots, that a certain quantity of arms and habiliments of war should be paid by the earls, barons, and vavasors respectively, and, if the latter had no arms, they should pay one hundred shillings. William Rufus broke through this composition, and again demanded arbitrary uncertain reliefs as due by the feudal laws thereby, in effect, obliging every heir to new purchase or redeem his land. But his brother Henry I, by the charter before mentioned, restored his father's law, and ordained that the relief to be paid should be according to the law so established, and not an arbitrary redemption. But afterwards, when by an ordinance in 27 Henry II, called the Assize of Arms, it was provided that every man's armor should descend to his heir for defense of the realm, and thereby it became impracticable to pay these acknowledgments in arms, according to the laws of the conqueror, and the composition was universally accepted of a hundred shillings for every knight's fee, as we find it ever established. But it must be remembered that this relief was only then payable if the heir at the death of his ancestor had attained his full age of one and twenty years. 3. Premier Sison was a feudal burden, only incident to the king's tenants in capite, and not to those who held of inferior or mean lords. It was a right which the king had, when any of his tenants in capite died seized of a knight's fee, to receive of the heir, provided he were of full age, one whole year's profits of the lands if they were in immediate possession, and half a year's profits if the lands were in reversion expectant on the estate for life. This seems to be little more than an additional relief, but grounded upon this feudal reason, that by the ancient law of feuds, immediately upon the death of a vassal, the superior was entitled to enter and take sizin or possession of the land by way of protection against intruders, till the heir appeared to claim it, and receive investiture, and, for the time the Lord so held it, he was entitled to take the profits, and unless the heir claimed within a year and a day, it was by strict law of forfeiture. This practice, however, seems not to have long obtained in England, if ever, with regard to tenures under inferior lords. But as to the king's tenures in capite, this prima sesina was expressly declared under Henry III and Edward II to belong to the king by prerogative in contradistinction to other lords. And the king was entitled to enter and receive the whole profits of the land till livery was sued, which suit 
being commonly within a year and day next after the death of the tenant. Therefore, the king used to take, at an average, the first fruits, that is to say, one year's profits of the land. And this afterwards gave a handle to the popes, who claimed to be feudal lords of the church, to claim in like manner from every clergyman in England the first year's profits of his benefice by way of primitia, or first fruits. End of chapter 5, part 1. Chapter 5, Part 2 of the Commentaries on the Laws of England by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes. Of the Ancient English Tenures, Part 2. 4. These payments were only due if the heir was of full age, but if he was under the age of twenty-one, being a male, or fourteen, being female, the lord was entitled to the wardship of the heir, and was called the guardian in chivalry. This wardship consisted in having the custody of the body and lands of such heir, without any account of the profits, till the age of twenty-one in males and sixteen in females. For the law supposed the heir male unable to perform night service till twenty-one. But as for the female, she was supposed capable at fourteen to marry, and then her husband might perform the service. The lord, therefore, had no wardship if at the death of the ancestor the heir male was of full age of twenty-one, or the heir female of fourteen. Yet, if she was then under fourteen, and the Lord once had her in ward, he might keep her so till sixteen, by virtue of the statute of Westminster 1.3, Edward I, C. 22, the two additional years being given by the legislature for no other reason but merely to benefit the Lord. This wardship, so far as it related to land, though, it was not nor could be part of the law of feuds so long as they were arbitrary, temporary, or for life only. Yet, when they became hereditary, and did consequently often descend upon infants, who by reason of their age could neither perform nor stipulate for the services of the feud, does not seem upon feudal principles to have been unreasonable. For the wardship of the land or custody of the feud, was retained by the Lord, that he might, out of the profits thereof, provide a fit person to supply the infant's services, till he should be of age to perform them himself. And if we consider a feud, in its original import, as a stipend, fee, or reward for actual service, it could not be thought hard that the Lord should withhold the stipend so long as the service was suspended though undoubtedly to our English ancestors, where such stipendary donation was a mere supposition or figment, it carried abundance of hardship, and accordingly it was relieved by the charter of Henry I before mentioned, which took this custody from the Lord and ordained that the custody both of the land and the children should belong to the widow or next of kin. But this noble immunity did not continue many years. The wardship of the body was a consequence of the wardship of the land, for he who enjoyed the infant's estate was the properest person to educate and maintain him in his infancy, and also, in a political view, the Lord was most concerned to give his tenant a suitable education in order to qualify him the better to perform those services which in his maturity he was bound to render. When the male heir arrived to the age of twenty-one, or the heir female to that of sixteen, they might sue out their livery or ousterlermain, that is, the delivery of their lands out of their guardian's hands. For this they were obliged to pay a fine, namely, half a year's profits of the land, though this seems expressly contrary to Magna Carta. However, in consideration of their lands having been so long in ward, 
they were excused all reliefs and the king's tenants also all premier sizes. In order to ascertain the profits that arose to the crown by these fruits of tenure and to grant the heir his livery, the itinerant justices or justices in ire had it formally in charge to make inquisition concerning them by a jury of the county, commonly called an inquisitio post mortem, which was instituted to inquire at the death of any man of fortune the value of his estate, the tenure by which it was holden, and who and of what age his heir was, thereby to ascertain the relief and value of the premier sizen or the wardship and livery accruing to the king thereupon, a manner of proceeding that came in process of time to be greatly abused, and at length an intolerable grievance, it being one of the principal accusations against Empson and Dudley, the wicked engines of Henry the Seventh, that by color of false inquisitions they compelled many persons to sue out livery from the crown, who by no means were tenants thereunto and afterwards a court of wards and liveries was erected for conducting the same inquiries in a more solemn and legal manner. When the heir thus came full of age, provided he held a knight's fee, he was to receive the order of knighthood, and was compellable to take it upon him, or else pay a fine to the king. For in those heroical times no person was qualified for deeds of arms and chivalry, who had not received this order, which was conferred with much preparation and solemnity. We may plainly discover the footsteps of a similar custom in what Tacitus relates of the Germans, who, in order to qualify their young men to bear arms, presented them in a full assembly with a shield and a lance, which ceremony, as was formally hinted, is supposed to have been the original of the feudal knighthood. This prerogative of compelling the vassals to be knighted or pay a fine was expressly recognized in Parliament by the statute De Militibus, 1 Edward II, was exerted as an expedient of raising money by many of our best princes, particularly Edward VI and Queen Elizabeth, but yet was the occasion of heavy murmurs when exerted by Charles I among whose many misfortunes it was that neither himself nor his people seemed able to distinguish between the arbitrary stretch and the legal exertion of prerogative. However, among the other concessions made by that unhappy prince, before the fatal recourse to arms, he agreed to divest himself of this undoubted flower of his crown, and it was accordingly abolished by Statute 16, Charles I, C. 20. 5. Before they came of age, there was still another piece of authority which the guardian was at liberty to exercise over his infant wards. I mean the right of marriage, maritagium, as contradistinguished from matrimonium, which in its feudal sense signifies the power which the lord or guardian in chivalry had of disposing of his infant ward in matrimony. For while the infant was in ward, the guardian had the power of tendering him or her a suitable match without disparagement or inequality, which if the infants refused, they forfeited the value of marriage, valorum maritagi, to the guardian, that is, so much as a jury would assess, or any one would bona fide give to the guardian for such an alliance. And if the infants married themselves without the guardian's consent, they forfeited double the value, duplicem valorum maritagi. This seems to have been one of the greatest hardships of our ancient tenures. There are indeed substantial reasons why the Lord should have the restraint and control of the ward's marriage, especially of his female ward, because of their tender years and the danger of such female wards intermarrying with the Lord's enemy. But no tolerable pretense could be assigned why the Lord should have the sale or value of the marriage. Nor indeed is this claim of strictly feudal original, the most probable account of it seeming to be this, that by the custom of Normandy the Lord's consent was necessary 
to the marriage of his female wards, which was introduced into England together with the rest of Norman doctrine of feuds, and it is likely that the lords usually took money for such their consent, since in the often cited charter of Henry I he engages for the future to take nothing for his consent, which he also promises in general to give, provided such female ward were not married to his enemy. But this, among other beneficial parts of that charter, being disregarded, and guardians still continue to dispose of their wards in a very arbitrary, unequal manner, it was provided by King John's great charter that heirs should be married without disparagement, the next of kin having previous notice of the contract, or, as it was expressed in the first draft of that charter, marigentor ni disparagentor et de per concilium propinquorum de consanguinitate sua. But these provisions in behalf of the relations were omitted in the charter of Henry the Third, wherein the clause stands merely thus, Ares maritentur absque disparagatione, meaning certainly by Ares, heirs female, as there are no traces before this to be found of the lords claiming the marriage of heirs male and as Glanville expressly confines it to heirs female. But the king and his great lords thenceforward took a handle from the ambiguity of this expression to claim them both. Sive sita mascula sive soemina, as Bracton more than once expresses it. And also, as nothing but disparagement was restrained by Magna Carta, they thought themselves at liberty to make all other advantages that they could and afterwards this right of selling the ward in marriage or else receiving the price or value of it was expressly declared by the statute of Merton, which is the first direct mention of it that I have met with in our own or in any other law. 6. Another attendant or consequence of tenure by night service was that of fines due to the Lord for every alienation whenever the tenant had occasion to make over his land to another. This depended on the nature of the feudal connection, it not being reasonable nor allowed, as we have before seen, that a feudatory should transfer his lord's gift to another and substitute a new tenant to do the service in his own stead without the consent of the lord. And, as the feudal obligation was considered as reciprocal, the lord also could not alienate his seigneury without the consent of his tenant which consent of his was called an atonement. This restraint upon the lords soon wore away, that upon the tenants continued longer. For when everything came in process of time to be bought and sold, the lords would not grant the license to their tenants to alien without a fine being paid, apprehending that, if it was reasonable for the heir to pay a fine or relief on the renovation of his paternal estate, it was much more reasonable that a stranger should make the same acknowledgment on his admission to a newly purchased feud. With us in England, these fines seem only to have been exacted from the king's tenants in capite, who were never able to alien without a license. But as to common persons, they were at liberty by Magna Carta and the statute of Cuya Emptores, if not earlier, to alien the whole of their estate to be holden of the same lord as they themselves held it of before. But the king's tenants in capite, not being included under the general words of these statutes, could not alien without a license. Or if they did, it was in ancient strictness an absolute forfeiture of the lands, though some have imagined otherwise. But this severity was mitigated by the statute 1 Edward III, C. 12, which ordained that in such case the land should not be forfeited, but a reasonable fine be paid to the king. Upon which statute it was settled that one-third of the yearly value should be paid for a license of alienation, but if the tenant presumed to alien without a license, a full year's value should be paid. 7. The last consequence of tenure in chivalry was a shet, which is the determination of the tenure 
or dissolution of the mutual bond between the lord and tenant from the extinction of the blood of the latter by either natural or civil means if he died without heirs of his blood or if his blood was corrupted and stained by commission of treason or felony whereby every inheritable quality was entirely blotted out and abolished in such cases the land is shedded or fell back to the lord of the fee that is the tenure was determined by breach of the original condition expressed or implied in the feudal donation in the one case there were no heirs subsisting of the blood of the first feudatory or purchaser to which heirs alone the grant of the feud extended in the other the tenant by perpetrating an atrocious crime showed that he was no longer to be trusted as a vassal having forgotten his duty as a subject and therefore forfeited his feud which he held under the implied condition that he should not be a traitor or a felon the consequence of which in both cases was that the gift being determined resulted back to the lord who gave it these were the principal qualities fruits and consequences of tenure by night service a tenure by which the greatest part of the lands in this kingdom were holden and that principally of the king in capite till the middle of the last century and which was created as sir edward coke expressly testifies for a military purpose viz for the defence of the realm by the king's own principal subjects which was judged to be much better than to trust to hirelings or foreigners the description here given is that of knight service proper which was to attend the king in his wars there were also some other species of knight service so called though improperly because the service or render was of a free and honourable nature and equally uncertain as to the time of rendering as that of knight service proper and because they were attended with similar fruits and consequences such was the tenure by grand sergeanty per magnum servitium whereby the tenant was bound instead of serving the king generally in his wars to do some special honorary service to the king in person as to carry his banner his sword or the like or to be his butler champion or other officer at his coronation it was in most other respects like knight service only he was not bound to pay aid or esculage and when tenant by night service paid five pounds for relief on every night's fee tenant by grand sergeanty paid one year's value of his land were it much or little tenure by coinage which was to win the horn when the scots or other enemies entered the land in order to warn the king's subjects was like other services of the same nature a species of grand sergeanty these services both of chivalry and grand sergeanty were all personal and uncertain as to their quantity or duration but the personal attendance in night service growing troublesome and inconvenient in many respects the tenants found means of compounding for it by first sending others in their stead and in process of time making a pecuniary satisfaction to the lords in lieu of it this pecuniary satisfaction at last came to be levied by assessments at so much for every knight's fee and therefore this kind of tenure was called scutagium in latin or servitium scuti scutum being then a well-known denomination of money and in like manner it was called in our norman french escuage being indeed a pecuniary instead of a military service the first time this appears to have been taken was in five henry the second on account of his expedition to toulouse but it soon came to be so universal that personal attendance fell quite into disuse hence we find in our ancient histories that from this period when our kings went to war they levied scutages on their tenants that is on all the landholders of the kingdom to defray their expenses and to hire troops and these assessments in the time of henry the second seem to have been made arbitrarily and at the king's pleasure which prerogative being greatly abused by his successors it became a matter of national clamour and king john was obliged to consent by his magna carta 
that no scootage should be imposed without consent of Parliament. But this clause was omitted in his son Henry III's charter, where we only find that scootages or escuage should be taken as they were used to be taken in the time of Henry II, that is, in a reasonable and moderate manner. Yet afterwards, by statute 25 Edward I, C5 and 6, and many subsequent statutes, it was enacted that the king should take no aids or tasks, but by the common assent of the realm. Hence, it is held in our old books that escuage or scootage could not be levied but by consent of Parliament, such scootages being indeed the groundwork of all succeeding subsidies and the land tax of later times. Since, therefore, escuage differed from night service in nothing, but as a compensation differs from actual service, night service is frequently confounded with it. And thus Littleton must be understood when he tells us that tenant by homage, fealty, and escuage was tenant by night service, that is, that this tenure, being subservient to the military policy of the nation, was respected as a tenure in chivalry. But as the actual service was uncertain and depended upon emergencies, so it was necessary that this pecuniary compensation should be equally uncertain and depend upon the assessments of the legislature suited to those emergencies. For had the escuage been a settled, invariable sum, payable at certain times, it had been neither more nor less than a mere pecuniary rent, and the tenure, instead of night service, would have then been of another kind called sockage, of which we shall speak in the next chapter. For the present, I have only to observe that by the degenerating of night service or personal military duty into escuage or pecuniary assessments, all the advantages, either promised or real, of the feudal constitution were destroyed and nothing but the hardships remained. Instead of forming a national militia composed of barons, knights, and gentlemen bound by their interests, their honor, and their oaths to defend their king and country, the whole of this system of tenures now tended to nothing else but wretched means of raising money to pay an army of occasional mercenaries. In the meantime, the families of all our nobility and gentry groaned under the intolerable burdens which, in consequence of the fiction adopted after the conquest, were introduced and laid upon them by the subtlety and finesse of the Norman lawyers. Or, besides the scootages they were liable to in defect of personal attendance, which, however, were assessed by themselves in Parliament, they might be called upon by the King or Lord Paramount for aids whenever his eldest son was to be knighted or his eldest daughter married, not to forget the ransom of his own person. The heir, on the death of his ancestor, if of full age, was plundered of the first emoluments rising from his inheritance by way of relief and premier sizin, and if under age, of the whole of his estate during infancy. And then, as Sir Thomas Smith very feelingly complains, when he came to his own, after he was out of wardship, his woods decayed, houses fallen down, stock wasted and gone, lands let forth and ploughed to be barren. To make amend, he was yet to pay half a year's profits as a fine for suing out of his livery, and also the price or value of his marriage if he refused such wife as his lord and guardian had bartered for and imposed upon him, or twice that value if he married another woman. Add to this the untimely and expensive honor of knighthood to make his poverty more completely splendid. And, when by these deductions his fortune was so shattered and ruined that perhaps he was obliged to sell his patrimony, he had not even that poor privilege allowed him without paying an exorbitant fine for a license of alienation. A slavery so complicated and so extensive as this called aloud for a remedy in a nation that boasted of her freedom. Palliatives were from time to time applied by successive acts of Parliament, 
which assuaged some temporary grievances, till at length the humanity of King James I consented for a proper equivalent to abolish them all, though the plan then proceeded not to effect in the like manner as he had formed the scheme and began to put it in execution for removing the feudal grievance of heritable jurisdictions in Scotland, which has since been pursued and effected by the Statute 20, George II, C. 43. King James's plan for exchanging our military tenures seems to have been nearly the same as that which has been since pursued, only with this difference, that by way of compensation for the loss which the crown and other lords would sustain, an annual free farm rent should be settled and inseparably annexed to the crown and assured to the inferior lords payable out of every knight's fee within their respective seigneuries. An expedient seemingly much better than the hereditary excise which was afterwards made the principal equivalent for these concessions. Or at length the military tenures, with all their heavy appendages, were destroyed at one blow by the statute 12 Charles II, C. 24, which enacts that the court of wards and liveries, and all wardships, liveries, premier sizens, and austerlemains, values and forfeitures of marriages, by reason of any tenure of the king or others, be totally taken away, and that all fines for alienation, tenures by homage, night service, and escuage, and also aids for marrying the daughter or knighting the son, and all tenures of the king in capite be likewise taken away. And that all sorts of tenures held of the king or others be turned into free and common sockage, save only tenures in francolamine, copy holds, and the honorary services without the slavage part of grand sergeanty. A statute which was a greater acquisition to the civil property of this kingdom than even Magna Carta itself, since that only pruned the luxuriances that had grown out of the military tenures and thereby preserved them in vigor. But the statute of King Charles extirpated the whole and demolished both root and branches. End of chapter 5, part 2「Chapter Six, Part One of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book Two, by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes of the Modern English Tenures, Part One. Although by the means that were mentioned in the preceding chapter, the oppressive or military part of the feudal constitution was happily done away, yet we are not to imagine that the constitution itself was utterly laid aside and a new one introduced in its room, since by the statute 123 Charles II, the tenures of Sockage and Frankelmoyne, the honorary services of Grand Sergeanty and the tenure by copy of court roll were reserved. Nay, all tenures in general, except Frankelmoyne, Grand Sergeanty, and copy hold, were reduced to one general species of tenure, then well known and subsisting, called free and common sockage. And this, being sprung from the same feudal original as the rest, demonstrates the necessity of fully contemplating that ancient system, since it is that alone to which we can recur to explain any seeming or real difficulties that may arise in our present mode of tenure. The military tenure, or that by night service, consisted of what were reputed the most free and honorable services, but which in their nature were unavoidably uncertain in respect of the time of their performance. The second species of tenure, or free sockage, consisted also of free and honorable services, but such as were liquidated and reduced to an absolute certainty. And this tenure, 
not only subsists to this day, but has in manner absorbed and swallowed up, since the statute of Charles II, almost every other species of tenure, and to this we are next to proceed. 2. Sockage, in its most general and extensive signification, seems to denote a tenure by any certain and determined service, and in this sense it is by our ancient writers constantly put in opposition to chivalry or knight service where the render was precarious and uncertain. Thus, Bracton, if a man holds by a rent in money without any escuage or sergeanty, ide tenementum dici potest socagium. But if you add thereto any royal service or escuage to any, the smallest amount, Ili duduci poteret nufiudem militare. So too, the author of Fleta, ex edonationibus servitia militaria vel maniae, seriente e non contentibus, oritor nois quadem nomen generale, quodesta socagium. Littleton also defines it to be where the tenant holds his tenement of the Lord by any certain service in lieu of all other services, so that they be not services of chivalry or knight service. And therefore afterwards he tells us that whatsoever is not tenure in chivalry is tenure in sockage. In like manner, as it is defined by Finch, a tenure to be done out of war. The service must therefore be certain in order to denominate it sockage, as to hold by fealty and twenty shillings rent, or by homage, fealty and twenty shillings rent, or by homage and fealty without rent, or by fealty and certain corporal service as ploughing the Lord's land for three days, or by fealty only without any other service, for all these are tenures in sockage. But sockage, as was hinted in the last chapter, is of two sorts. Free sockage, where the services are not only certain, but honorable, and villain sockage, where the services, though certain, are of a baser nature. Such as hold by the former tenure are called in Glanville and other subsequent authors by the name of liberi socimane, or tenants in free sockage. Of this tenure, we are first to speak, and this, both in the nature of its service and the fruits and consequences appertaining thereto, was always by much the most free and independent species of any. And therefore, I cannot but assent to Mr. Sumner's etymology of the word, who derives it from the Saxon appellation so, which signifies liberty or privilege and, being joined to a usual termination, is called sockage. In Latin, socagium, signifying thereby a free or privileged tenure. This etymology seems to be much more just than that of our common lawyers in general, who derive it from soca, an old Latin word denoting, as they tell us, a plow. For that in ancient time, this sockage tenure consisted in nothing else but services of husbandry, which the tenant was bound to do to his lord, as to plow, sow, or reap for him, but that, in process of time, this service was changed into an annual rent by consent of all parties, and that, in memory of its original, it still retains the name of sockage or plow service. But this by no means agrees with what Littleton himself tells us, that to hold by fealty only, without paying any rent, is tenure in sockage. For here is plainly no commutation for plough service. Besides, even services confessed of a military nature and original, as escuage itself, which while it remained uncertain was equivalent to night service, the instant they were reduced to a certainty changed both their name and nature, and were called sockage. It was the certainty, therefore, that denominated it a sockage tenure, and nothing sure could be a greater liberty or privilege 
than to have the service ascertained and not left to the arbitrary calls of the Lord, as in the tenures of chivalry. Wherefore also Britain, who describes Sockage tenure under the name Franke Ferme, tells us that they are lands and tenements, whereof the nature of the fee is changed by fiefment out of chivalry for certain yearly services, and in respect whereof neither homage, ward, marriage, nor relief can be demanded. Which leads us also to another observation, that if sockage tenures were of such base and servile original, it is hard to account for the very great immunities which the tenants of them always enjoyed, so highly superior to those of tenants by chivalry, that it was thought in the reigns of both Edward I and Charles II, a point of the utmost importance and value to the tenants to reduce the tenure by night service to franke firmer or tenure by sockage. We may therefore, I think, fairly conclude in favor of Sumner's etymology and the liberal extraction of the tenure and free sockage against the authority of even Littleton himself. Taking this, then, to be the meaning of the word, it seems probable that the sockage tenures were the relics of Saxon liberty retained by such persons as had neither forfeited them to the king nor been obliged to exchange their tenure for the more honorable, as it was called, but at the same time more burdensome tenure of knight service. This peculiarly remarkable in the tenure which prevails in Kent called gavelkind, which is generally acknowledged to be a species of sockage tenure, the preservation whereof inviolate from the innovations of the Norman conqueror is a fact universally known. And those who thus preserved their liberties were said to hold in free and common socket. As, therefore, the grand criterion and distinguishing mark of this species of tenure are the having its renders or services ascertained, it will include under it all other methods of holding free lands, by certain and invariable rents and duties, and, in particular, petite sergeanty, tenure in burgage, and gavel kind. We may remember that by the statute 12, Charles II, grand sergeanty is not itself totally abolished, but only the slavish appendages belonging to it. For the honorary services, such as carrying the king's sword or banner, officiating as his butler, carver, etc., at the coronation, are still reserved. Now petite sergeanty bears a great resemblance to grand sergeanty, for as the one is personal service, so the other is a rent or render, both tending to some purpose relative to the king's person. Petite sergeanty, as defined by Littleton, consists in holding lands of the king by the service of rendering to him annually some small implement of war, as a bow, a sword, a lance, an arrow, or the like. This, he says, is but sockage in effect, for it is no personal service but a certain rent. And, we may add, it is clearly no predial service or service of the plow, but in all respects Liberum et commune socagium, only being held of the king, it is by way of eminence dignified with the title of parvum servitium regis, or petite sergeanty. And Magna Carta respects it in this light when it enacts that no wardship of the lands or body shall be claimed by the king in virtue of a tenure by petite sergeanty. Tenure in burgage is described by Glanville, and is expressly said by Littleton, to be but tenure in sockage, and it is where the king or other person is lord of an ancient borough in which the tenements are held by a rent certain. It is indeed only a kind of town sockage, as common sockage, by which other lands are holden, is usually of a rural nature. A borough, as we have formerly seen, is distinguished from other towns by the right of sending members to Parliament, and where the right of election is by burgage tenure, that alone is a proof of the antiquity of the borough. Tenure in burgage, therefore, or burgage tenure, 
is where houses or lands which were formerly the site of houses in an ancient borough are held of some lord in common sockage by a certain established rent. And these seem to have withstood the shock of the Norman encroachments principally on account of their insignificance, which made it not worth while to compel them to an alteration of tenure, as an hundred of them put together would scarce have amounted to a knight's fee. Besides, the owners of them, being chiefly artificers and persons engaged in trade, could not with any tolerable propriety be put on such a military establishment as the tenure in chivalry was. And here also we have again an instance where tenure is confessedly in sockage and yet is impossible ever to have been held by plough service since the tenants must have been citizens or burghers the situation frequently a wall town the tenement the single house so that none of the owners was probably master of a plough or was able to use one if he had it the free sockage therefore in which these tenements are held seems to be plainly a remnant of Saxon liberty, which may also account for the great variety of customs affecting these tenements so held in ancient burgage, the principal and most remarkable of which is that called Borough English, so named in contradistinction, as it were, to the Norman customs, and which is taken notice of by Glanville and Littleton, viz., that the youngest son, and not the eldest, succeeds to the burgage tenement on the death of his father, for which Littleton gives this reason, because the youngest son, by reason of his tender age, is not so capable as the rest of his brethren to help himself. Other authors have indeed given a much stranger reason for this custom, as if the lord of the fee had anciently a right to break the seventh commandment with his tenant's wife on her wedding night, and that therefore the tenement descended not to the eldest, but the youngest son, who was more certainly the offspring of the tenant. But I cannot learn that ever this custom prevailed in England, though it certainly did in Scotland, under the name Merchetta or Marchetta, till abolished by Malcolm the Third and perhaps a more rational account than either may be fetched, though at a sufficient distance, from the practice of the Tartars, among whom, according to the father Duhald, this custom of descent of the youngest son also prevails. That nation is composed totally of shepherds and herdsmen, and the elder sons, as soon as they are capable of leading a pastoral life, migrate from their father with a certain allotment of cattle, and go to seek new habitation. The youngest son, therefore, who continues latest with the father, is naturally the heir of his house, the rest being already provided for. And thus we find that, among many other northern nations, it was the custom for all the sons but one to migrate from the father, which one became his heir so that possibly this custom, wherever it prevails, may be the remnant of that pastoral state of our British and German ancestors which Caesar and Tacitus describe. Other special customs there are in burgage tenures, as that the wife shall be endowed of all her husband's tenements, and not of the third part only, as at the common law, and that a man might dispose of his tenements by will, which, in general, was not permitted after the conquest till the reign of Henry the Eighth, though in the Saxon times it was allowable. A pregnant proof that these liberties of sockage tenure were fragments of Saxon liberty. The nature of the tenure in Gavelkind affords us a still stronger argument. It is universally known what struggles the Kentish men made to preserve their ancient liberties, and with how much success those struggles were attended. And it is principally here that we meet with the custom of Gavelkind, though it was and is to be found in other parts of the kingdom. We may fairly conclude that this was a part of those liberties, agreeably to Mr. Selden's opinion, that Gavelkind, before the Norman conquest, was the general custom of the realm. 
the distinguishing properties of this tenure are various. Some of the principal are these. 1. The tenant is of age sufficient to alien his estate by fiefment at the age of 15. 2. The estate does not achet in case of an attainder an execution for felony, their maxim being the father to the bow, the son to the plow. 3. In most places he had a power of devising land by will before the statute for that purpose was made. 4. The lands descend not to the eldest, youngest, or any one son only, but to all the sons together, which was indeed anciently the most usual course of descent all over England, though in particular places particular customs prevailed. These, among other properties, distinguish this tenure in a most remarkable manner, and yet it is held to be only a species of a sockage tenure modified by the custom of the country, being held by suit of court and fealty, which is a service in its nature certain. Wherefore, by a charter of King John, Hubert, Archbishop of Canterbury, was authorized to exchange the gavelkind tenures holding of the fee of Canterbury into tenures by night service, and by statute 31 Henry VIII, C3, for disgaveling the lands of diverse lords and gentlemen in the county of Kent, they are directed to be descendable for the future like other lands, which were never holden by service of sockage. Now the immunities which the tenants in Gabalkind enjoyed were such as we cannot conceive should be conferred upon mere plowmen or peasants, from all which I think it sufficiently clear that tenures in free sockage are in general of a nobler original than is assigned by Littleton and after him by the bulk of our common lawyers. End of chapter 6, part 1「Chapter 6, Part 2 of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book 2, by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes. Of the Modern English Tenures, Part 2. Having thus distributed and distinguished the several species of tenure in free sockage, I proceed next to show that this also partakes very strongly of the feudal nature, which may probably arise from its ancient Saxon original, since, as was before observed, feuds were not unknown among the Saxons, though they did not form a part of their military policy, nor were drawn out into such arbitrary consequences as among the Normans. It seems therefore reasonable to imagine that sockage tenure existed in much the same state before the conquest as after, that in Kent it was preserved with a high hand as our histories inform us it was, and that the rest of the sockage tenures differed through England, escaped the general fate of other property, partly out of favor and affection to their particular owners, and partly from their own insignificance. Since I do not apprehend the number of sockage tenures soon after the conquest to have been very considerable, nor their value by any means large, till, by successive charters of enfranchisement granted to the tenants, which are particularly mentioned by Britain, their number and value began to swell so far as to make a distinct and justly envied part of our English system of tenures. However this may be, the tokens of their feudal original will evidently appear from a short comparison of the incidents and consequences of sockage tenure with those of tenure in chivalry, remarking their agreement or difference as we go along. 1. In the first place, then both were held by superior lords, of the king as lord paramount, and sometimes of a subject or mean lord between the king and the tenant. 2. Both were subject to the feudal return, render, rent, or service, or some sort or other, 
which arose from a supposition of an original grant from the lord to the tenant. In the military tenure, or more proper feud, this was from its nature uncertain. In sockage, which was a feud of the improper kind, it was certain, fixed, and determinate, though perhaps nothing more than bare fealty, and so continues to this day. 3. Both were, from their constitution, universally subject, over and above all other render, to the oath of fealty or mutual bond of obligation between the lord and tenant, which oath of fealty usually draws after it suit to the lord's court. This oath every lord, of whom tenements are holden at this day, may and ought to call upon his tenants to take in his court baron, if it be only for the reason given by Littleton, that if it be neglected, it will by long continuance of time grow out of memory, as doubtless it frequently has, whether the land be holden of the Lord or not, and so he may lose his seigneury and the profit which may accrue to him by his shets and other contingencies. 4. The tenure in Sockage was subject, of common right, to aids for knighting the son and marrying the eldest daughter, which were fixed by the statute Westminster 1 C36 at 20 shillings for every 20 pounds per annum so held as in night service. These aids, as a tenure by chivalry, were originally mere benevolences, though afterwards claimed as a matter of right, but were all abolished by the statute 12, Charles II. 5. Relief is due upon sockage tenure as well as upon tenure in chivalry, but the manner of taking it is very different. The relief on a knight's fee was five pounds or one quarter of the supposed value of the land, but a sockage relief is one year's rent or render payable by the tenant to the lord be the same either great or small, and therefore Bracton will not allow this to be properly a relief, but Praedum questatia loco relevi in recognition in domini. So, too, the statute 28 Edward I c1 declares that a free soakman shall give no relief but shall double his rent after the death of his ancestor according to that which he hath used to pay his lord and shall not be grieved above measure. Reliefs in night service were only payable if the heir at the death of his ancestor was of full age, but in sockage they were due even though the heir was under age because the Lord has no wardship over him. The statute of Charles II reserves the reliefs incident to sockage tenures, and therefore, wherever lands in fee simple are holden by a rent, relief is still due of common right upon the death of the tenant. 6. Premier Sizen was incident to the king's sockage tenants in capite, as well as those by night service. But tenancy in capite, as well as premier Sizen's, are also, among the other feudal burdens, entirely abolished by the statute. 7. Wardship is also incident to tenure in sockage but of a nature very different from that incident to night service. For if the inheritance descend to an infant under fourteen, the wardship of him shall not belong to the lord of the fee. Because in this tenure, no military or other personal service being required, there is no occasion for the lord to take the profits in order to provide a proper substitute for his infant tenant. But his nearest relation to whom the inheritance cannot descend, shall be his guardian in sockage, and have the custody of his land and body till he arrives at the age of fourteen. The guardian must be such a one to whom the inheritance by no possibility can descend, as was fully explained together with the reasons for it in the former book of these commentaries. At fourteen, this wardship in sockage ceases, and the heir may oust the guardian and call him to account for the rents and profits, for at this age the law supposes him capable of choosing a guardian for himself. It was in this particular of wardship, as also in that of marriage, and in the certainty 
of the render or service that the Sockage tenures had so much the advantage of the military ones. But as the wardship ceased at 14, there was this disadvantage attending it, that young heirs, being left at so tender an age to choose their own guardians till 21, they might make an improvident choice. Therefore, when almost all the lands of the kingdom were turned into Sockage tenures, the same statute, 12 Charles II, C. 24, enacted that it should be in the power of any father by will to appoint a guardian till his child should attain the age of 21. And if no such appointment be made, the court of chancery will frequently interpose to prevent an infant heir from improvidently exposing himself to ruin. 8. Marriage, or the valor maritagi, was not in Sakic tenure any perquisite or advantage to the guardian, but rather the reverse. For if the guardian married his ward under the age of fourteen, he was bound to account to the ward for the value of the marriage, even though he took nothing for it, unless he married him to advantage. For the law, in favor of infants, is always jealous of guardians, and therefore, in this case, it made them account not only for what they did, but also for what they might receive on the infant's behalf, lest by some collusion the guardian should have received the value and not brought it to account. But the statute, having destroyed all values of marriages, this doctrine, of course, hath ceased with them. At fourteen years of age, the ward might have disposed of himself in marriage without any consent of his guardian till the late act for preventing clandestine marriages. These doctrines of wardship and marriage in Sockage tenure were so diametrically opposite to those in knight service, and so entirely agree with those parts of King Edward's laws, that they were restored by Henry I's charter, as might alone convince us that Sockage was of a higher original than the Norman conquest. 9. Fines for alienations were, I apprehend, due for lands holden of the king in capite by Sockage tenure, as well as in case of tenure by night service. For the statutes that relate to this point, and Sir Edward Coke's comment on them, speaks generally of all tenants in capite, without making any distinction, though now all fines for alienation are demolished by the statute of Charles II. 10. Achets are equally incident to tenure and sockage as they were to tenure by night service, except only in Gavilkind lands, which are, as before mentioned, subject to no achets for felony, though they are to achets for want of heirs. Thus much for the two granted species of tenure, under which almost all the free lands of the kingdom were holden till the restoration in 1660, when the former was abolished and sunk into the latter, so that lands of both sorts are now holden by the one universal tenure of free and common sockage. The other grand division of tenure, mentioned by Bracton as cited in the preceding chapter, is that of villainage, as contradistinguished from liberum tenementum or frank tenure. And this, we may remember, he subdivides into two classes, pure and privileged villainage, from whence have arisen two other species of our modern tenures. From the tenure of pure villainage have sprung our present copyhold tenures, or tenure by copy of court roll, at the will of the Lord, in order to obtain a clear idea of which, it will be previously necessary to take a short view of the original and nature of manners. Manners are, in substance, as ancient as the Saxon constitution, though perhaps differing a little, in some immaterial circumstances, from those that exist at this day, just as we observed of feuds that they were partly known to our ancestors even before the Norman conquest. A manner, manarium amenendo, because the usual residence of the owner seems to have been a district of ground held by lords or great personages who kept in their own hands so much land as was necessary for the use of their families, which were called 
terre dominicales or demean lands, being occupied by the Lord or dominus manere and his servants. The other tenemental lands they distributed among their tenants, which from the different modes of tenure were called and distinguished by two different names. First, book land or charter land, which was held by deed under certain rents and free services, and in effect differed nothing from free sockage lands. And from hence have arisen all the freehold tenants which hold of particular manners and owe suit and service to the same. The other species was called folk land, which was held by no assurance in writing, but distributed among the common folk or people at the pleasure of the Lord, and resumed at his discretion, being indeed land held in villainage, which we shall presently describe more at large. The residue of the manor, being uncultivated, was termed the Lord's waste, and served for public roads and for common of pasture to the Lord and his tenants. Manors were formerly called baronies, as they still are lordships, and each lord or baron was empowered to hold a domestic court called the court baron for redressing misdemeanors and nuances within the manor and for settling disputes of property among the tenants. This court is an inseparable ingredient of every manor, and if the number of suitors should so fail as not to leave sufficient to make a jury or homage, that is, two tenants at the least, the manor itself is lost. Before the statute of Chia M. Torres, 18 Edward I, the king's greater barons, who had a large extent of territory held under the crown, granted out frequently smaller manors to inferior persons to be held of themselves, which do therefore now continue to be held under a superior lord, who is called in such cases the lord paramount over all these manors. And his seigneury is frequently termed an honor, not a manor, especially if it hath belonged to an ancient feudal baron, or hath been at any time in the hands of the crown in imitation whereof these inferior lords began to carve out and grant to other still more minute states to be held as of themselves, and were so proceeding downwards in infinitum, till the superior lords observed that by this method of sub-infudation they lost all their feudal profits of wardships, marriages, and eschets, which fell into the hands of these mean or middle lords, who were the immediate superiors of the terra tenant, or him who occupied the land. This occasioned the statute of Westminster III, or Chia M. Torres, 18 Edward I, to be made, which directs that upon all sales or fiefments of land, the fifi shall hold the same, not of his immediate fifor, but of the chief lord of the fee, of whom such fee for himself held it. And from hence it is held that all manner existing at this day must have existed by immemorial prescription, or at least ever since the 18 Edward I, when the statute of Chia M. Torres was made. For no new manner can have been created since that statute, because it is essential to a manner that there be tenants who hold of the Lord, and that statute enacts that for the future no subject shall create any new tenants to hold of himself. Now with regard to the folk land, or estates held in villainage, this was a species of tenure, neither strictly feudal, Norman, or Saxon, but mixed and compounded of them all, and which also, on account of the heriots that usually attend it, may seem to have somewhat Danish in its composition. Under the Saxon government there were, as Sir William Temple speaks, a sort of people in a condition of downright servitude, used and employed in the most servile works, and belonging, both they, their children, and effects, to the lord of the soil, like the rest of the cattle or stock upon it. These seem to have been those who held what was called Oakland, from which they were removable at the Lord's pleasure. On the arrival of the Normans here, it seems not improbable 
that they, who were strangers to any other than a feudal state, might give some sparks of enfranchisement to such wretched persons as fell to their share by admitting them, as well as others, to the oath of fealty, which conferred a right of protection and raised the tenant to a kind of estate superior to downright slavery, but inferior to every other condition. This they called villainage, and the tenants villains, either from the word vilis, or else, as Sir Edward Coke tells us, a villa, because they lived chiefly in villages and were employed in rustic works of the most sordid kind, like the Spartan Belots, to whom alone the culture of the lands was consigned, their rugged masters, like our northern ancestors, esteeming war the only honorable employment of mankind. These villains, belonging principally to lords of manors, were either villains regardant, that is, annexed to the manor or land, or else they were in gross, or at large, that is, annexed to the person of the lord, and transferable by deed from one owner to another. They could not leave their lord without his permission, but if they ran away, or were purloined from him, might be claimed and recovered by action like beasts or other chattels. They held indeed small portions of land by way of sustaining themselves and families, but it was at the mere will of the Lord who might dispossess them whenever he pleased, and it was upon villain services, that is, to carry out dung, to hedge and ditch the Lord's demeans, and any other the meanest offices. And these services were not only base, but uncertain both as to their time and quantity. A villain, in short, was in much in the same state with us, as Lord Molesworth describes to be that of the Boers in Denmark, and Steyrhook attributes to the trials or slaves in Sweden, which confirms the probability of their being in some degree monuments of the Danish tyranny. A villain could acquire no property either in lands or goods, but if he purchased either, the Lord might enter upon them, oust the villain, and seize them to his own use, unless he contrived to dispose of them again before the Lord had seized them, for the Lord had then lost his opportunity. In many places also a fine was payable to the Lord if the villain presumed to marry his daughter to any one without leave from the Lord, and, by the common law, the Lord might also bring an action against the husband for damages in thus purloining his property. For the children of villains were also in the same state of bondage with their parents, whence they were called in Latin nativi, which gave rise to the female appellation of a villain who was called a naif. In case of a marriage between a freeman and a naif, or a villain and a free woman, the issue followed the condition of the father, being free if he was free, and villain if he was villain. Contrary to the maxim of civil law, that parta sequitur ventrum, but no bastard could be born a villain, because by another maxim of law he is nullius filius and as he can gain nothing by inheritance, it were hard that he should lose his natural freedom by it. The law, however, protected the persons of villains as the king's subjects against atrocious injuries of the lord, for he might not kill or maim his villain, though he might beat him with impunity, since the villain had no action or remedy at law against his lord, but in case of the murder of his ancestor or the maim of his own person. Naifs, indeed, had also an appeal of rape, in case the Lord violated them by force. End of chapter 6, part 2
of the Modern English Tenures, Part 3. Villains might be enfranchised by manumission, which is either express or implied. Express, as where a man granted to the villain a deed of manumission. Implied, as where a man bound himself in a bond to his villain for a sum of money, granted him an annuity by deed, or gave him an estate in fee for life or years. For this was dealing with his villain on the footing of a freeman. It was in some of the instances giving him an action against his lord, and in others vesting an ownership in him entirely inconsistent with his former state of bondage. So also, if the lord brought an action against his villain, this enfranchised him. For, as the lord might have a short remedy against his villain by seizing his goods, which was more than equivalent to any damages he could recover, the law which is always ready to catch at anything in favor of liberty, presume that by bringing this action he meant to set his villain on the same footing with himself, and therefore held it an implied manumission. But in case the Lord indicted him for felony, it was otherwise, for the Lord could not inflict a capital punishment on his villain without calling in the assistance of the law. Villains, by this and many other means, in process of time, gain considerable ground on their lords, and, in particular, strengthen the tenure of their estates to that degree that they came to have in them an interest in many places full as good in others better than their lords. For the good nature and benevolence of many lords of manners having, time out of mind, permitted their villains and their children to enjoy their possessions without interruption, in a regular course of descent, the common law, of which custom is the life, now gave them title to prescribe against their lords, and on performance of the same services to hold their lands in spite of any determination of the lord's will. For, though in general they are still said to hold their estates at the will of the lord, Yet it is such a will as is agreeable to the custom of the manor, which customs are preserved and evidenced by the rolls of the several courts barren in which they are entered, or kept on foot by the constant immemorial usage of the several manors in which the lands lie. And, as such tenants had nothing to show for their estates but these customs and admissions in pursuance of them, entered on those rolls or the copies of such entries witnessed by the steward, they now began to be called tenants by copy of court roll, and their tenure itself a copyhold. Thus, copyhold tenures, as Sir Edward Coke observes, although very meanly descended, yet come of an ancient house, for, from what has been premised, it appears that copyholders are in truth no other but villains who, by a long series of immemorial encroachments on the Lord, have at last established a customary right to those estates which before were held absolutely at the Lord's will, which affords a very substantial reason for the great variety of customs that prevail in different manners with regard both to the descent of the states and the privileges belonging to the tenants. And these encroachments grew to be so universal that when tenure in villainage was virtually abolished, although copyholds were reserved by the statute of Charles II, there was hardly a pure villain left in the nation. For Sir Thomas Smith testifies that in all his time, and he was secretary to Edward the Sixth, he never knew any villain engrossed throughout the realm, and the few villains regarded that were then remaining were such only as had belonged to bishops, monasteries, or other ecclesiastical corporations in the preceding times of popery. For, he tells us, that the holy fathers, monks, and friars had their confessions, and specially in their extreme and deadly sickness, convinced the laity how dangerous a practice it was for one Christian man to hold another in bondage, so that temporal men, little by little, by reason of that terror in their consciences, 
were glad to manumit all their villains. But the said holy fathers, with the abbots and priors, did not in like sort by theirs. For they also had a scruple in conscience to impoverish and despoil the church so much as to manumit such as were bond to their churches or to the manners which the church had gotten, and so kept their villains still. By these several means, the generality of villains in the kingdom have long ago sprouted up into copyholders, their persons being enfranchised by manumission or long acquiescence, but their estates in strictness remaining subject to the same servile conditions and forfeitures as before, though, in general, the villain services are usually commuted for a small pecuniary quit-rent. As a farther consequence of what has been premised, we may collect these two main principles which are held to be the supporters of a copyhold tenure and without which it cannot exist. 1. That the lands be a parcel of and situate within that manner under which it is held. 2. That they have been demised or demisable by copy of court roll immemorially. For immemorial custom is the life of all tenures by copy, so that no new copyhold can, strictly speaking, be granted at this day. In some manners, where the custom hath been to permit the heir to succeed the ancestor in his tenure, the estates are styled copyholds of inheritance. In others, where the lords have been more vigilant to maintain their rights, they remain copyholds for life only. For the custom of the manor has in both cases so far superseded the will of the Lord that, provided the services be performed or stipulated for by fealty, he cannot, in the first instance, refuse to admit the heir of his tenant upon his death, nor, in the second, can he remove his present tenant so long as he lives, though he holds nominally by the precarious tenure of his Lord's will. The fruits and appendages of a copyhold tenure that it hath in common with free tenures are fealty, services, as well in rents as otherwise, reliefs and achets. The two latter belong only to copyholds of inheritance, the former to those for life only. But besides these, copyholds have also heriots, wardship, and fines. Heriots, which I think are agreed to be a Danish custom, and of which we shall say more hereafter, are a render of the best beast or other good, as the custom may be, to the Lord on the death of the tenant. This is plainly a relic of villain tenure, there being originally less hardship in it, when all the goods and chattels belong to the Lord, and he might have seized them even in the villain's lifetime. These are incident to both species of copyhold, but wardship and fines to those of inheritance only. Wardship in copyhold estates partakes both of that in chivalry and that in sockage. Like that in chivalry, the Lord is the legal guardian who usually assigns some relation of the infant tenant to act in his stead, and he, like guardian in sockage, is accountable to his ward for the profit. Of fines, some are in the nature of premier sizes, due on the death of each tenant. Others are mere fines for alienation of the lands, and in some manners only one of these sorts can be demanded, in some both, and in others neither. They are sometimes arbitrary and at the will of the Lord, sometimes fixed by custom. But, even when arbitrary, the courts of law, in favor of the liberty of copyholders, have tied them down to be reasonable in their extent. Otherwise, they might amount to a disherogen of the estate. No fine, therefore, is allowed to be taken upon dissents and alienation, unless in particular circumstances, of more than two years' improved value of the estate. From this instance, we may judge of the favorable disposition that the law of England, which is a law of liberty, hath always shown to this species of tenants, by removing, as far as possible, 
every real badge of slavery from them, however some nominal ones may continue. It suffered custom very early to get the better of the express terms upon which they held their lands, by declaring that the will of the Lord was to be interpreted by the custom of the manor, and, where no custom has been suffered to grow up to the prejudice of the Lord, as in this case of arbitrary fines, the law itself interposes an equitable method and will not suffer the Lord to extend his power so far as to disinherit the tenant. Thus much for the ancient tenure of pure villainage and the modern one of copyhold at the will of the Lord, which is lineally descended from it. Or, there is yet a fourth species of tenure described by Bracton under the name sometimes of privileged villainage and sometimes a villain sockage. This, he tells us, is such as has been held of the kings of England from the conquest downward, that the tenants herein, vilana facunti servitia, said certa et determinata, that they cannot alien or transfer their tenements by grant or fiefment any more than pure villains can, but must surrender them to the lord or his steward to be again granted out and held in villainage. And from these circumstances we may collect that what he here describes is no other than exalted species of copyhold subsisting at this day, viz. the tenure in ancient demean, to which, as partaking of the baseness of villainage in the nature of its services and the freedom of sockage in their certainty, he has therefore given a name compounded out of both and calls it Villanum Socagium. Ancient demean consists of those lands or manors which, though now perhaps granted out to private subjects, were actually in the hands of the crown in the time of Edward the Confessor or William the Conqueror, and so appear to have been by the great survey in the Exchequer called Doomsday Book. The tenants of these lands under the crown were not all of the same order or degree. Some of them, as Britain testified, continued for a long time pure and absolute villains dependent on the will of the Lord, and those who have succeeded them in their tenures now differ from common copyholders in only a few points. Others were in great measure enfranchised by the royal favor, being only bound in respect of their lands to perform some of the better sort of villain services, but those determinate and certain, as to plow the king's land, to supply his court with provisions and the like, all of which are now changed into pecuniary rents, and, in consideration hereof, they had many immunities and privileges granted to them, as to try the right of their property in a peculiar court of their own, called a court of ancient demean, by a peculiar process denominated a writ of right close, not to pay toll or taxes, not to contribute to the expenses of knights of the shire, not to be put on juries, and the like. These tenants, therefore, though their tenure be absolutely copyhold, yet have an interest equivalent to a freehold, for, though their services were of a base and villainous original, yet the tenants were esteemed in all other respects to be highly privileged villains, and especially in this, that their services were fixed and determinate, and they could not be compelled, like pure villains, to relinquish these tenements at the Lord's will, or to hold them against their own itidio, says Bracton, di conte liberi. Britain also, from such their freedom, calls them absolutely soakmans, and their tenure soakmanries, which he describes to be lands and tenements which are not held by night service, nor by grand sergeanty, nor by petite, but by simple services, being, as it were, lands enfranchised by the king or his predecessors from their ancient demean. And the same name is also given to them in Fleda. Hence, Fitzherbert observes that no lands are ancient demean, but lands holden in sockage, that is, not in free and common sockage, but in this amphibious subordinate class of villain sockage. And it is possible 
that as the species of sockage tenure is plainly founded upon predial services or services of the plow, it may have given cause to imagine that all sockage tenures arose from the same original, for want of distinguishing with Bracton between free sockage or sockage of frank tenure, and villain sockage or sockage of ancient demean. Lands held by this tenure are therefore a species of copyhold, and as such preserved and exempted from the operation of the statute of Charles the Second. Yet they differ from common copyholds, principally in the privileges before mentioned, as also they differ from freeholders by one especial mark and tincture of villainage, noted by Bracton and remaining to this day, viz. that they cannot be conveyed from man to man by the general common law conveyances of fiefment and the rest but must pass by surrender to the Lord or his steward in the manner of common copyholds. Yet with this difference, that in these surrenders of lands in ancient demeans of frank tenure, it is not used to say, to hold at the will of the Lord in their copies, but only to hold according to the custom of the manner. Thus we have taken a compendious view of the principal and fundamental points of the doctrine of tenures, both ancient and modern, in which we cannot but remark the mutual connection and dependence that all of them have upon each other. And upon the whole it appears that whatever changes and alterations these tenures have in process of time undergone, from the Saxon era to the twelve Charles the Second, all lay tenures are now in effect reduced to two species, free tenure in common sockage and base tenure by copy of court roll. I mentioned lay tenures only because there is still behind one other species of tenure reserved by the statute of Charles II, which is of a spiritual nature and called the tenure in Franco Moyne. 5. Tenure in Frankel Moyne in Libera Elemosina, or free arms, is that whereby a religious corporation, aggregate or soul, holdeth lands of the donor to them and their successors for ever. The service which they were bound to render for these lands was not certainly defined, but only in general to pray for the souls of the donor and his heirs, dead or alive, and therefore they did no fealty which is incident to all other services but this, because this divine service was of a higher and more exalted nature. This is the tenure by which almost all the ancient monasteries and religious houses held their lands, and by which the parochial clergy and very many ecclesiastical and eleemosynary foundations hold them at this day. The nature of the service being upon the Reformation altered, and made conformable to the pure doctrines of the Church of England. It was an old Saxon tenure, and continued under the Norman Revolution, through the great respect that was shown to religion and religious men in ancient times, which is also the reason that tenants in Frankelmoyne were discharged of all other services except the Trinoda Necessitas, of repairing the highways, building castles, and repelling invasions, just as the Druids among the ancient Britons had ammonium rerum immunitatem. And, even at present, this is a tenure of a nature very distinct from all others, being not in the least feudal, but merely spiritual. For if the service be neglected, the law gives no remedy by distress or otherwise to the Lord of whom the lands are holden, but merely a complaint to the ordinary or visitor to correct it. Wherein it materially differed from what was called tenure by divine service, in which the tenants were obliged to do some special divine services in certain as to sing so many masses, to distribute such a sum in alms, and the like, which, being expressly defined and prescribed, could with no kind of propriety be called free arms, especially as for this, if unperformed, the Lord might distrain without any complaint to the visitor. All such donations are indeed now out of use, for, 
since the statute of Quia Emptores, 18 Edward I, none but the king can give lands to be holden by this tenure, so that I only mention them because Frankelmoyne is accepted by name in the statute of Charles II, and therefore subsists in many instances at this day, which is all that shall be remarked concerning it, herewith concluding our observations on the nature of tenures. End of chapter 6, part 3Chapter 7, Part 1 of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book 2, by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes. Of Freehold Estates of Inheritance, Part 1. The next objects of our disquisitions are the nature and properties of estates. An estate in lands, tenements, and hereditaments signifies such interest as the tenant hath therein, so that if a man grants all his estate in Dale to A and his heirs, everything that he can possibly grant shall pass thereby. It is called in Latin flatus, it signifying the condition or circumstance in which the owner stands with regard to his property. And, to ascertain this with proper precision and accuracy, estates may be considered in a threefold view. First, with regard to the quantity of the interest which the tenant has in the tenement. Secondly, with regard to the time at which the quantity of interest is to be enjoyed. And, thirdly, with regard to the number and connections of the tenants. First, with regard to the quantity of interest which the tenant has in the tenement, this is measured by its duration and extent. Thus, either his right of possession is to subsist for an uncertain period during his own life or the life of another man, to determine at his own decease or to remain to his descendants after him, or it is circumscribed within a certain number of years, months, or days, or Lastly, it is infinite and unlimited, being vested in him and his representatives forever. And this occasions the primary division of estates into such as are freehold and such as are less than freehold. An estate of freehold, liberum tenementum, or frankentenement, is defined by Britain to be the possession of the soil by a free man. And St. German tells us that the possession of the land is called in the law of England the Frankentenement, or freehold. Such a state, therefore, and no other, as requires actual possession of the land, is legally speaking freehold, which actual possession can, by the course of the common law, be only given by the ceremony called livery of fifen, which is the same as the feudal investiture. And from these principles we may extract this description of a freehold, that it is such an estate in lands as is conveyed by libri of fifen, or in tenements of an incorporeal nature, by what is equivalent thereto. And accordingly, it is laid down by Littleton, that where a freehold shall pass, it behoveth to have livery of fifen. As, therefore, estates of inheritance and estates for life could not by common law be conveyed without livery of fifen, these are properly estates of freehold, and as no other estates were conveyed with the same solemnity, therefore no others are properly freehold estates. Estates of freehold, then, are divisible into estates of inheritance and estates not of inheritance. The former are again divided into inheritances absolute or fee simple, and inheritances limited, one species of which we usually call freetail. 1. Tenant in fee simple, or as he is frequently styled, tenant in fee, is he that hath lands, tenements, or hereditaments to hold to him and his heirs forever, generally, absolutely, and simply, without mentioning what heirs, 
but referring that to his own pleasure or to the disposition of the law. The true meaning of the word fee, theodem, is the same with that of feud or fife, and in its original sense it is taken in contradistinction to a lodium, which latter the writers on this subject define to be every man's own land which he possesseth merely in his own right, without owing any rent or service to any superior. This is property in its highest degree, and the owner thereof hath absolutum et directum dominium, and therefore is said to be fife thereof absolutely in dominica sua, in his own demean. But fiordum, or fee, is that which is held of some superior, on condition of rendering him service, in which the superior, the ultimate property of the land, resides. And therefore, Sir Henry Spellman defines a feud or fee to be the right which the vassal or tenant hath in lands to use the same, and take the profits thereof to him and his heirs, rendering to the Lord his due services, the mere allodial property of the soil always remaining in the Lord. This allodial property no subject in England has, it being a received and now undeniable principle in the law that all the lands in England are holden immediately or immediately of the king. The king, therefore, only hath absolutum et directum dominium, but all subjects' lands are in the nature of feodum, or fee, whether derived to them by descent from their ancestors or purchased for a valuable consideration, for they cannot come to any man by either of those ways unless accompanied with those feudal clogs which were laid upon the first feudatory when it was originally granted. A subject, therefore, hath only the usufruct and not the absolute property of the soil, or, as Sir Edward Coke expresses it, he hath dominium utili, but not dominium directum. And hence it is that in the most solemn acts of law, we express the strongest and highest estate that any subject can have by these words. He is fife thereof in his demean, as of fee. It is a man's demean, dominicum, or property, since it belongs to him and his heirs forever. Yet this dominicum, property, or demean, is strictly not absolute or allodial, but qualified or feudal. It is his demean, as of fee. That is, it is not purely and simply his own, since it is held of a superior lord in whom the ultimate property resides. This is the primary sense and acceptation of the word fee. But, as Sir Martin Wright very justly observes, the doctrine that all lands are holden, having been for so many ages a fixed and undeniable axiom, our English lawyers do very rarely, of late years especially, use the word fee in this its primary original sense, in contradistinction to a lodium or absolute property, with which they have no concerns, but generally use it to express the continuance or quantity of a state. A fee, therefore, in general, signifies an estate of inheritance, being the highest and most extensive interest that a man can have in a feud, and, when the term is used simply, without any other adjunct, or has the adjunct of simple annexed to it, as a fee or fee simple, it is used in contradistinction to a fee conditional at the common law, or a fee tail by the statute, importing an absolute inheritance clear of any condition, limitation, or restrictions to particular heirs, but descendable to the heirs general, whether male or female, lineal or collateral. And in no other sense than this is the king said to be fiefed in fee, he being the feudatory of no man. Taking, therefore, fee for the future, unless we're otherwise explained, in this its secondary sense, as a state of inheritance, it is applicable to, and may be had in, any kind of hereditaments, either corporeal or incorporeal. But there is this distinction between the two species of hereditaments. That of a corporeal inheritance, a man shall be said to be fiefed in his demean, as of fee. 
of an incorporeal one, he shall only be said to be fiefed as of fee, and not in his demean. For, as incorporeal hereditaments are in their nature collateral to, and issue out of, lands and houses, their owner hath no property, dominicum, or demean, in the thing itself, but hath only something derived out of it, resembling the servitudes, or services, of the civil law. The dominicum, or property, is frequently in one man, while the appendage, or service, in another. Thus Gaius may be fiefed as a fee of a way going over the land, of which Titius is fiefed in his demean as of fee. The fee simple, or inheritance of lands and tenements, is generally vested and resides in some person or other, though diverse inferior estates may be carved out of it. As if one grants a lease for twenty-one years, or for one or two lives, the fee simple remains vested in him and his heirs, and after the determination of those years or lives, the land reverts to the grantor or his heirs, who shall hold it again in fee simple. Yet sometimes the fee may be in abeyance, that is, as the word signifies, in expectation, remembrance, and contemplation in law there being no person in esse in whom it can vest and abide, though the law considers it as always potentially existing and ready to vest whenever a proper owner appears. Thus, in a grant to John for life and afterwards to the heirs of Richard, the inheritance is plainly neither granted to John nor Richard, nor can it vest in the heirs of Richard till his death Nam neno este aeres viventi. It remains, therefore, in waiting or abeyance during the life of Richard. This is likewise always the case of a parson of a church who hath only an estate therein for the term of his life, and the inheritance remains in abeyance. And not only the fee, but the freehold also may be in abeyance, as when a parson dies, the freehold of his glebe is in abeyance until a successor be named, and then it vests in the successor. The word heirs is necessary in the grant or donation in order to make a fee or inheritance. For if land be given to a man forever, or to him and his assigns forever, this vests in him but an estate for life. This very great nicety about the insertion of the word heirs in all fiefments and grants in order to vest the fee is plainly a relic of the feudal strictness by which we may remember it was required that the form of the donation should be punctually purified, or that, as Craig expresses it, in the words of Baldus, Donations e sinte stricti juris, nequis plusse donasse presumator quam in donatione expresserit. And therefore, as the personal abilities of the donee were originally supposed to be the only inducements to the gift, the donee's estate in the lands extended only to his own person, and subsisted no longer than his life, unless the donor, by express provision in the grant, gave it a longer continuance and extended it also to his heirs. But this rule is now softened by many exceptions. 4. 1. It does not extend to the devisy by will, in which, as they were introduced at the time of the feudal Grigor was a pace wearing out, a more liberal construction is allowed, and therefore by a devisy to a man forever, or to one and his assigns forever, or to one in fee simple, the devisy hath an estate of inheritance. For the intention of the devisor is sufficiently plain from the words of perpetuity annexed, though he hath omitted the legal words of inheritance. But if the devisy be to a man and his assigns, without annexing the words of perpetuity, there the devisy shall take only an estate for life, for it does not appear that the devisor intended any more. 2. Neither does this rule extend to fines or recoveries considered as a species of conveyance, for thereby an estate in fee passes by act and operation of law without the word heirs, as it does also, for particular reasons, by certain other methods of conveyance, 
which have relation to a former grant or estate wherein the word heirs was expressed. 3. In creations of nobility by writ, the peer so created hath an inheritance in his title without expressing the word heirs, for they are implied in the creation unless it be otherwise specifically provided. But in creations by patent, which are stricti juris, the word heirs must be inserted, otherwise there is no inheritance. 4. In grants of lands to sole corporations and their successors, the word successors supplies the place of heirs. For as heirs take from the ancestor, so doth the successor from the predecessor. Nay, in a grant to a bishop or other sole spiritual corporation in Frankelmoyne, the word Frankelmoyne supplies the place of both heirs and successors ex fee termini, and in all these cases a fee simple vests in such sole corporation. But in a grant of lands to a corporation aggregate, the word successors is not necessary, though usually inserted. For, albeit such simple grant be strictly only in a state for life, Yet, as that corporation never dies, such a state for life is perpetual, or equivalent to a fee simple, and therefore the law allows it to be one. Lastly, in the case of the king, a fee simple will vest in him without the words heirs or successors in the grant, partly from the prerogative royal, and partly from a reason similar to the last, because the king, in judgment of law, never dies. But the general rule is that the word heirs is necessary to create an estate of inheritance. 2. We are next to consider limited fees or such estates of inheritance as are clogged and confined with conditions or qualifications of any sort. And these we may divide into two sorts. 1. Qualified or base fees and 2. Fees conditional, so called at the common law and afterwards fees tail in consequence of the statute de donis. 1. A base or qualified fee is such a one as has qualifications subjoined thereto, and which must be determined whenever the qualification annexed to it is at an end. As, in the case of a grant to A and his heirs, tenants of the manor of Dale, in this instance, whenever the heirs of A cease to be tenants of that manor, the grant is entirely defeated. So, when Henry the Sixth granted to John Talbot, lord of the manor of Kingston Lyle in Berks, that he and his heirs, lords of said manor, should be peers of the realm by the title of barons of Lyle. Here John Talbot had a base or qualified fee in that dignity, and the instant he or his heirs quitted the seigneury of this manor, the dignity was at an end. This estate is a fee, because by possibility it may endure forever in a man and his heirs, yet as the duration depends upon the concurrence of collateral circumstances which qualify and debase the purity of the donation, it is therefore a qualified or base fee. 2. A conditional fee at the common law was a fee restrained to some particular heirs exclusive of others. Donatio stricta et cortata, sicut certes aredibus, qui bustarnas a successione exclusis. As to the heirs of a man's body, by which only his lineal descendants were admitted, in exclusion of collateral heirs, or to the heirs male of his body, in exclusion both of collaterals and lineal females also. It was called the conditional fee, by reason of the condition expressed or implied in the donation of it, that if the donee died without such particular heirs, the land should revert to the donor. For this was a condition annexed by law to all grants whatsoever, that on failure of the heirs specified in the grant, the grant should be at an end and the land returned to its ancient proprietor. Such conditional fees were strictly agreeable to the nature of feuds when they first ceased to be mere estates for life and were not yet arrived to be absolute estates in fee simple. And we find strong traces of these limited, conditional fees, which could not be alienated from the lineage of the first purchaser in our earliest Saxon laws. Now, 
With regard to the condition annexed to these fees by the common law, our ancestors held that such a gift to a man and his heirs of his body was a gift upon condition that it should revert to the donor if the donee had no heirs of his body, but if he had, it should then remain to the donee. They therefore called it a fee simple on condition that he had issue. Now we must observe that when any condition is performed, it is thenceforth entirely gone, and the thing to which it was before annexed becomes absolute and wholly unconditional. So that, as soon as the grantee had any issue born, his estate was supposed to become absolute by the performance of the condition, at least for these three purposes. 1. To enable the tenant to alien the land, and thereby to bar not only his own issue, but also the donor of his interest in the reversion. 2. To subject him to forfeit it for treason, which he could not do, till issue born, longer than for his life, lest thereby the inheritance of the issue and reversion of the donor might have been defeated. 3. To empower him to charge the land with rents, commons, and certain other encumbrances, so as to bind his issue. And this was thought the more reasonable, because, by the birth of issue, the possibility of the donor's reversion was rendered more distant and precarious, and his interest seems to have been the only one which the law, as it then stood, was solicitous to protect, without much regard to the right of succession intended to be vested in the issue. However, if the tenant did not in fact alien the land, the course of descent was not altered by this performance of the condition. For if the issue had afterwards died, and then the tenant or original grantee had died without making any alienation, the land, by the terms of the donation, could descend to none but the heirs of his body, and therefore, in default of them, must have reverted to the donor. For which reason, in order to subject the lands to ordinary course of descent, the donees of these conditional fee simples took care to alien as soon as they had performed the condition by having issue, and afterwards repurchased the lands which gave them a fee simple absolute that would descend to the heirs general according to the course of the common law. And thus stood the old law with regard to conditional fees, which things, says Sir Edward Coke, though they seem ancient, are yet necessary to be known as well for the declaring how the common law stood in such cases, as for the sake of annuities and such like inheritances are not within the statutes of entail, and therefore remain as at the common law. The inconvenience which attended these limited and fettered inheritances were probably what induced the judges to give way to this subtle finesse, for such it undoubtedly was, in order to shorten the duration of these conditional estates. But on the other hand, the nobility, who are willing to perpetuate their possessions in their own families, to put a stop to this practice, procured the statute of Westminster II, commonly called the statute de donis conditionibus, to be made, which pays a greater regard to the private will and intentions of the donor than to the propriety of such intentions or any public considerations whatsoever. This statute revives in some sort the ancient feudal restraints which were originally laid on alienations by enacting that from thenceforth the will of the donor be observed, and that the tenements so given to a man and the heirs of his body should at all events go to the issue if there were any, or if none, should revert to the donor. End of chapter 7, part 1「Chapter 7, Part 2 of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book 2, by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes. Of Freehold Estates of Inheritance, Part 2. Upon the construction of this Act of Parliament, 
the judges determined that the donee had no longer a conditional fee simple, which became absolute and at his own disposal the instant any issue was born. But they divided the estate into two parts, leaving in the donee a new kind of particular estate, which they denominated a fee tail, and vesting in the donor the ultimate fee simple of the land expectant on the failure of the issue, which expectant estate is what we now call a reversion. And hence it is that Littleton tells us that tenant in fee tail is by virtue of the statute of Westminster the second. Having thus shown the original of a state's tale, I now proceed to consider what things may or may not be entailed under the statute de donis. Tenements is the only word used in the statute, and this Sir Edward Coke expounds to comprehend all corporeal hereditaments whatsoever, and also all incorporeal hereditaments which favor of the realty, that is, which issue out of corporeal ones, or which concern, or are annexed to, or may be exercised within the same, as rents, estovers, commons, and the like. Also, offices and dignities, which concern lands, or have relation to fixed in certain places, may be entailed. But mere personal chattels, which favor not at all of the realty, cannot be entailed. Neither can an office, which merely relates to such personal chattels, nor an annuity, which charges only the person and not the lands of the grantor. But in them, if granted to a man and the heirs of his body, the grantee hath still a fee conditional at common law, as before the statute, and by his alienation may bar the heir or reversioner. An estate to a man and his heirs for another's life cannot be entailed. For this is strictly no estate of inheritance, as will appear hereafter, and therefore not within the statute de donis. Neither can a copyhold estate be entailed by virtue of the statute, for that would tend to encroach upon and restrain the will of the Lord. But, by the special custom of the manor, a copyhold may be limited to the heirs of the body, for here the custom ascertains and interprets the Lord's will. Next, as to the several species of estates' tale and how they are respectively created. Estates' tale are either general or special. Tale general is where lands and tenements are given to one and the heirs of his body begotten, which is called tale general because how often soever such donee in tale be married, his issue in general by all and every such marriage is in successive order capable of inheriting the estate tail per forma doni. Tenant in tail special is where the gift is restrained to certain heirs of the donee's body and does not go to all of them in general. And this may happen several ways. I shall instance in only one, as where lands and tenements are given to a man and the heirs of his body on Mary, his now wife, to be begotten. Here no issue can inherit, but such special issue as is engendered between them two, not such as the husband may have by another wife, and therefore it is called special tale. And here we may observe that the words of inheritance to him and his heirs give him an estate in fee, but they being heirs to be by him begotten, this makes it a fee tale and the person being also limited on whom such heirs shall be begotten, viz. Mary, his present wife, this makes it a fee tale special. Estates, in general and special tale, are farther diversified by the distinction of sexes in such entails, for both of them may be either entail male or tail female. As if lands be given to a man, and his heirs male of his body begotten, this is an estate in tail male general, but if to a man and the heirs female of his body on his present wife begotten, this is an estate in tail female special. And, in case of entail male, the heirs female shall never inherit, nor any derived from them, nor, a converso, the heirs male, in case of a gift in tail female. Thus, 
If the donee and tail male hath a daughter, who dies leaving a son, such grandson, in this case, cannot inherit the estate tail, for he cannot deduce his descent wholly by heirs male. And, as the heir male must convey his descent wholly by males, so must the heir female wholly by females. And therefore, if a man hath two estates tail, the one in tail male and the other in tail female, and he hath issue a daughter, which daughter hath issue a son, this grandson can succeed to neither of the estates, for he cannot convey his descent wholly in either the male or female line. As the word heirs is necessary to create a fee, so, in farther imitation of the strictness of the feudal donation, the word body, or some other words of procreation, are necessary to make it a fee tail and ascertain to what heirs in particular the fee is limited. If, therefore, either the words of inheritance or words of procreation be omitted, albeit the others are inserted in the grant, this will not make an estate tail. As, if the grant be to a man and his issue of his body, to a man and his seed, to a man and his children or offspring, all these are only estates for life, there wanting the words of inheritance, his heirs. So, on the other hand, a gift to a man and his heirs male or female is an estate in fee simple and not in fee tail, for there are no words to ascertain the body out of which they shall issue. Indeed, in last wills and testaments, wherein greater indulgence is allowed, an estate tail may be created by a devisee to a man and his seed, or to a man and his heirs male, or by other irregular modes of expression. There is still another species of entailed estates, now indeed grown out of use, yet still capable of subsisting in law, which are estates in libero maritagio, or frank marriage. These are defined to be where tenements are given by one man to another, together with a wife, who is the daughter or cousin of the donor, to hold in frank marriage. Now by such gift, though nothing but the word frank marriage is expressed, the donees shall have the tenements to them and the heirs of their two bodies begotten, that is, they are tenants in special tale. For this one word, frank marriage, does ex vi termini, not only create an inheritance, like the word Frankelmoin, but likewise limits that inheritance, supplying not only words of descent, but of procreation also. Such donees in frank marriage are liable to no service but fealty, for a rent received thereon is void until the fourth degree of consanguinity be passed between the issues of the donor and the donee. The incidents to a tenancy entail under the statute Westminster II are chiefly these. 1. That a tenant in tail may commit waste on the estate tail by felling timber, pulling down houses, or the like, without being impeached or called to account for the same. 2. That the wife of the tenant in tail shall have her dower, or thirds, of the estate tail. 3. That the husband of a female tenant in tail may be tenant by the courtesy of the estate tail. 4. That an estate tail may be barred or destroyed by a fine, by a common recovery, or by lineal warranty descending with assets to the heir. All of which will hereafter be explained at large. Thus much for the nature of estate's tail, the establishment of which family law, as it is properly styled by Pigot, occasioned infinite difficulties and disputes. Children grew disobedient when they knew they could not be set aside. Farmers were ousted of their leases made by tenants in tail. For, if such leases had been valid, then, under cover of long leases, the issue might have been virtually disinherited. Creditors were defrauded of their debts. For, if tenant in tail could have charged his estate with their payment, he might also have defeated his issue, by mortgaging it for as much as it was worth. Innumerable latent entails were produced to deprive purchasers of the lands they had fairly bought, of suits in consequence of which our ancient books are full. 
and treasons were encouraged. As a state's tail were not liable to forfeiture longer than the tenant's life, so that they were justly branded as the source of new conventions and mischiefs unknown to the common law, and almost universally considered as the common grievance of the realm. But, as the nobility were always fond of this statute because it preserved their family estates from forfeiture, there was little hopes of procuring a repeal by the legislature, and therefore, by the connivance of an active and politic prince, a method was devised to evade it. About two hundred years intervened between the making of the statute de donis and the application of common recoveries to this intent in the twelfth year of Edward the Fourth, which were then openly declared by the judges to be a sufficient bar of an estate tale. For though the courts had, so long before as the reign of Edward the Third, very frequently hinted their opinion that a bar might be effected upon these principles, yet it never was carried into execution. Till, Edward the Fourth observing, in the disputes between the houses of York and Lancaster, how little effect attainders for treason had on families, whole classes were protected by sanctuary of entails, gave his countenance to this proceeding, and suffered Taltarum's case to be brought before the court, wherein, in consequence of the principles then laid down, it was in effect determined that a common recovery suffered by tenant in tail should be an effectual destruction thereof. What common recoveries are, both in their nature and consequences, and why they are allowed to be a bar to the estate tail, must be reserved to a subsequent inquiry. At present, I shall only say that they are fictitious proceedings introduced by a kind of pia fraus to elude the statute de donis, which was found so intolerably mischievous, and which yet one branch of the legislature would not then consent to repeal and that these recoveries, however clandestinely begun, are now become, by long use and acquiescence, a most common assurance of lands, and are looked upon as the legal mode of conveyance by which tenant and tail may dispose of his lands and tenements, so that no court will suffer them to be shaken or reflected on, and even acts of Parliament have by a side wind countenanced and established them. This expedient Having greatly abridged a state's tale with regard to their duration, others were soon invented to strip them of other privileges. The next that was attacked was their freedom from forfeitures for treason. For, notwithstanding the large advances made by recoveries in the compass of about threescore years towards unfettering these inheritances and thereby subjecting the lands to forfeiture, the rapacious prince then reigning finding them frequently resettled in a familiar manner to suit the convenience of families, had address enough to procure a statute, whereby all estates of inheritance, under which general words a state's tale were covertly included, are declared to be forfeited to the king upon any conviction of high treason. The next attack which they suffered, in order of time, was by the statute 32 Henry VIII C. 28 whereby certain leases made by tenants in tail, which do not tend to the prejudice of the issue, were allowed to be good in law and to bind the issue in tail. But they received a more violent blow in the same session of Parliament by the construction put upon the Statute of Fines by the Statute 32 Henry VIII C. 36, which declares a fine duly levied by tenant in tail to be a complete bar to him and his heirs and all other persons claiming under such entail. This was evidently agreeable to the intention of Henry the Seventh, whose policy it was, before common recoveries had obtained their full strength and authority, to lay the road as open as possible to the alienation of landed property in order to weaken the overgrown power of his nobles. But as they, from the opposite reasons, were not easily brought to consent to such a provision, it was therefore couched in his act under covert and obscure expressions. And the judges, though willing to construe that statute as favorably as possible for the defeating of entailed estates, 
yet hesitated at giving fines so extensive a power by mere implication when the statute Bedonis had expressly declared that they should not be a bar to a state's tail. But the statute of Henry VIII, when the doctrine of alienation was better received and the will of the prince more implicitly obeyed than before, avowed and established that intention. Yet, in order to preserve the property of the crown from any danger of infringement, all a state's tale created by the crown, and of which the crown has reversion, are accepted out of this statute. And the same was done with regard to common recoveries by the statute 34 and 35 Henry VIII C. 20, which enacts that no feigned recovery had against the tenants in tail, where the estate was created by the crown, and the remainder or reversion continues still in the crown, shall be of any force or effect, which is allowing, indirectly and collaterally, their full force and effect with respect to ordinary estates tail, where the royal prerogative is not concerned. Lastly, by a statute of the succeeding year, all estates tail are rendered liable to be charged for payment of debts due to the king by record or special contract, as, since, by the bankrupt laws, they are also subjected to be sold for the debts contracted by a bankrupt, and, by the construction put upon the statute 43 Elizabeth C. 4, an appointment by tenant in tail of the lands in tail to a charitable use is good without fine or recovery. The state's tail, being thus by degrees unfettered, are now reduced again to almost the same state even before the issue born as conditional fees were in at common law after the condition was performed by the birth of issue. For, first, the tenant in tail is now enabled to alien his lands and tenements by fine, by recovery, or by certain other means, and thereby to defeat the interest as well of his own issue, though unborn, as also of the reversioner, except in the case of the crown. Secondly, he is now liable to forfeit them for high treason. And lastly, he may charge them with reasonable leases, and also with such of his debts, as are due to the crown on specialties, or have been contracted with his fellow subjects in a course of extensive commerce. End of Chapter 7, Part 2Chapter 8, Part 1 of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book 2, by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes. Of Freeholds, Not of Inheritance, Part 1. We are next to discourse of such estates of freehold as are not of inheritance, but for life only. And of these estates for life, some are conventional or expressly created by the act of the parties, others merely legal or created by construction and operation of law. We will consider them both in their order. 1. Estates for life, expressly created by deed or grant, which alone are properly conventional, are where a lease is made of lands or tenements to a man to hold for the term of his own life or for that of any other person or for more lives than one, in any of which cases he is styled tenant for life. Only when he holds the estate by the life of another, he is usually called tenant pur arte vie. These estates for life are, like inheritances, of a feudal nature, and were, for some time, the highest estate that any man could have in a feud, which, as we have before seen, was not in its original hereditary. They are given or conferred by the same feudal rights and solemnities, the same investiture or livery of fifen as fees themselves are, and they are held by fealty, if demanded, and such conventional rents and services as the lord or lessor and his tenant or lessee have agreed on. 
Estates for life may be created not only by the express words before mentioned, but also by a general grant without defining or limiting any specific estate. As if one grants to A, B, the manor of Dale, this makes him a tenant for life. For though, as there are no words of inheritance or heirs mentioned in the grant, it cannot be construed to be a fee, it shall, however, be construed to be as large an estate as the words of the donation will bear, and therefore be an estate for life. Also, such a grant at large, or a grant for a term of life generally, shall be construed to be as an estate for the life of the grantee, in case the grantor hath authority to make such a grant, for an estate for a man's own life is more beneficial and of higher nature than for any other life. And the rule of law is that all grants are to be taken most strongly against the grantor unless in the case of the king. Such estates for life will, generally speaking, endure as long as the life for which they are granted. But there are some estates for life which may determine upon future contingencies before the life for which they are created expires. As, if an estate be granted to a woman during her widowhood, or to a man until he be promoted to a benefice, in these and similar cases, whenever the contingency happens, when the widow marries, or when the grantee obtains a benefice, the respective estates are absolutely determined and gone. Yet, while they subsist, they are reckoned estates for life, because the time for which they will endure being uncertain, they may possibly last for life, if the contingencies upon which they are to determine do not sooner happen. And, moreover, in case an estate be granted to a man for his life, generally it may also determine by his civil death, as if he enters into a monastery whereby he is dead in law for which reason in conveyances the grant is usually made for the term of a man's natural life, which can only be determined by his natural death. The incidents to an estate for life are principally the following, which are applicable not only to that species of tenants for life which are expressly created by deed, but also to those which are created by an act and operation of law. 1. Every tenant for life, unless restrained by covenant or agreement, may of common right take upon the land demise to him reasonable estovers or boats. For he hath a right to the full enjoyment and use of the land and all its profits during his estate therein. But he is not permitted to cut down timber or do other waste upon the premises for the destruction of such things as are not the temporary profits of the tenement is not necessary for the tenant's complete enjoyment of his estate, but tends to the permanent and lasting loss of the person entitled to the inheritance. 2. Tenant for life or his representatives shall not be prejudiced by any sudden determination of his estate because such determination is contingent and uncertain. Therefore, if a tenant for his own life sows the lands and dies before the harvest, his executors shall have the implements or profits of the crop. For the estate was determined by the act of God, and its maxim in law, Actus de Nemini Facet Injurium. The representatives, therefore, of the tenant for life shall have the implements to compensate for the labor and expense of tilling, manuring, and sowing the lands, and also for the encouragement of husbandry, which being a public benefit, tending to the increase and plenty of provisions, ought to have the utmost security and privilege that the law can give it. Wherefore, by the feudal law, if a tenant for life died between the beginning of September and the end of February, the Lord, who was entitled to the reversion, was also entitled to the profits of the whole year. But if he died between the beginning of March and the end of August, the heirs of the tenant received the whole. From hence our law of emblemence seems to have been derived, but with very considerable improvements. So it is also, if a man be tenant for the life of another, and, 
Chestuit Covie, or he on whose life the land is held, dies after the corn sown, the tenant, Pour Arter V, shall have the emblements. The same is also the rule if the estate be determined by an act of law. Therefore, if a leaf be made to husband and wife during coverture, which gives them a determinable estate for life, and the husband sows the land, and afterwards they are divorced, a vinculo matrimoni, the husband shall have the emblems in this case, for the sentence of divorce is the act of law. But if an estate for life be determined by the tenant's own act, as by forfeiture for waste committed, or if a tenant during widowhood thinks proper to marry, in these and similar cases the tenants, having thus determined the estate by their own acts, shall not be entitled to take the emblems. The doctrine of emblems extends not only to corn sown, but to roots planted or other annual artificial profit but it is otherwise of fruit trees, grass, and the like, which are not planted annually at the expense and labor of the tenant, but are either the permanent or natural profit of the earth. For even when a man plants a tree, he cannot be presumed to plant it in contemplation of any present profit, but merely with a prospect of it being useful to future successions of tenants. The advantages also of emblems are particularly extended to the parochial clergy by the statute 28 Henry VIII C2. For all persons who are presented to any ecclesiastical benefice or to any civil office are considered as tenants for their own lives unless the contrary be expressed in the form of donation. 3. A third incident to estates for life relates to the under-tenants or lessees, for they have the same, nay greater indulgences than their lessors, the original tenants for life. The same, for the law of estovers and emblems with regard to a tenant for life, is also law with regard to his under-tenant, who represents him and stands in his place, and greater for in those cases where a tenant for life shall not have the emblems, because the estate determines by his own act, the exception shall not reach his lessee, who is a third person. As in the case of a woman who holds durante viduitate, her taking a husband is her own act, and therefore deprives her of the emblems. But if she leaves her estate to an undertenant who sows the land, and she then marries, this, her act, shall not deprive the tenant of his emblems, who is a stranger and could not prevent her. The lessees of tenants for life had also at the common law another most unreasonable advantage. For at the death of their lessors, the tenants for life, these under-tenants might, if they pleased, quit the premises and pay no rent to anybody for the occupation of the land since the last quarter day or other day assigned for payment of rent, to remedy which it is now enacted that the executors or administrators of tenant for life, on whose death any lease determined, shall recover of the lessee a rateable proportion of rent from the last day of payment to the death of such lessor. 2. The next estate for life is of the legal kind, as contradistinguished from conventional, viz., that of a tenant entail after possibility of issue extinct. This happens where one is a tenant in special tail, and a person from whose body the issue was to spring dies without issue, or, having left issue, that issue becomes extinct. In either of these cases, the surviving tenant in special tail becomes tenant in tail after possibility of issue extinct. As where one has an estate to him and his heirs on the body of his present wife to be begotten, and the wife dies without issue. In this case, the man has an estate tale which cannot possibly descend to anyone, and therefore the law makes use of this long periphrasis as absolutely necessary to give an adequate idea of his estate. For if it had called him barely tenant in fee tale special, that would not have distinguished him from others, 
and besides, he has no longer an estate of inheritance or fee, for he can have no heirs capable of taking per formam doni. Had it called him tenant and tail without issue, this had only related to the present fact, and would not have excluded the possibility of future issue. Had he been styled tenant and tail without possibility of issue, this would exclude time past as well as present, and he might, under this description, never have had any possibility of issue. No definition, therefore, could so exactly mark him out as this of tenant and tail after possibility of issue extinct, which, with a precision peculiar to our own law, not only takes in the possibility of issue in tail which he once had, but also states that this possibility is now extinguished and gone. This estate must be created by the act of God, that is, by the death of that person out of whose body the issue was to spring. For no limitation, conveyance, or other human act can make it. For, if land be given to a man and his wife, and the heirs of their two bodies begotten, and they are divorced, a vinculo matrimoni, they shall neither of them have this estate, but be barely tenants for life, notwithstanding the inheritance once vested in them. Possibility of issue is always supposed to exist in law, unless extinguished by the death of the parties, even though the donees be each of them an hundred years old. This estate is of an amphibious nature, partaking partly of an estate tale and partly of an estate for life. The tenant is, in truth, only tenant for life, but with many of the privileges of a tenant in tail, as not to be punishable for waste, etc., or he is tenant and tail with many of the restrictions of a tenant for life, as to forfeit his estate if he aliens it in fee simple, whereas such alienation by tenant and tail, though voidable by the issue, is no forfeiture of the estate to the reversioner, who is not concerned in interest till all possibility of issue be extinct. But in general, the law looks upon this estate as equivalent to an estate for life only, and, as such, will permit this tenant to exchange his estate with a tenant for life, which exchange can only be made, as we shall see hereafter, of estates that are equal in their nature. 3. Tenants by the courtesy of England is where a man marries a woman seized of lands or tenements in fee simple or fee tail that is, of any estate of inheritance, and has by her issue born alive, which was capable of inheriting her estate. In this case, he shall, on the death of his wife, hold the lands for his life as tenant by the courtesy of England. This estate, according to Littleton, has its denomination because it is used within the realm of England only, and it is said in the mirror to have been introduced by King Henry I, but it appears also to have been the established law of Scotland, wherein it was called curialitas, so that probably our word courtesy was understood to signify rather an attendance upon the Lord's court or curtis, that is, being his vassal or tenant, than to denote any particular favor belonging to this island. And therefore, it is laid down that, by having issue, the husband shall be entitled to do homage to the Lord for the wife's lands alone. It is likewise used in Ireland by virtue of an ordinance of King Henry III. It also appears to have obtained in Normandy, and was likewise used among the ancient Almains or Germans. And yet it is not generally apprehended to have been a consequence of feudal tenure, though I think some substantial feudal reasons may be given for its introduction. For if a woman seized of lands hath issue by her husband and dies, the husband is the natural guardian of the child, and as such is in reason entitled to the profits of the lands in order to maintain it, and therefore the heir apparent of a tenant by the courtesy, could not be in ward to the lord of the fee during the life of such tenant. 
As soon, therefore, as any child was born, the father began to have a permanent interest in the lands. He became one of the pares curtis, and was called tenant by the courtesy initiate. And this estate, being once vested in him by the birth of the child, was not liable to be determined by the subsequent death and coming of age of the infant. There are four requisites necessary to make a tenancy by the courtesy. Marriage, sizing of the wife, issue, and death of the wife. 1. The marriage must be canonical and legal. 2. The sizing of the wife must be an actual sizing or possession of the lands, not a bare right to possess, which is a sizing in law, but an actual possession, which is a sizing in deed. And therefore, a man shall not be tenant by the courtesy of a remainder or reversion. But of some incorporeal hereditaments, a man may be tenant by the courtesy, though there have been no actual sizing of the wife. As in case of an advowson, where the church has not become void in the lifetime of the wife, which a man may hold by the courtesy, because it is impossible to have had the actual sizing of it and impotentia excusat legem. If the wife be an idiot, the husband shall not be tenant by the courtesy of her lands, for the king is by prerogative entitled to them, the instant she herself has any title. And since she could never be rightfully seized of these lands, and the husband's title depends entirely upon her sizing, the husband can have no title as tenant by the courtesy. 3. The issue must be born alive. Some have had a notion that it must be heard to cry, but that is a mistake. Crying, indeed, is the strongest evidence of its being born alive, but it is not the only evidence. The issue also must be born during the life of the mother, for if the mother dies in labor and the caesarean operation is performed, the husband, in this case, shall not be tenant by the courtesy because at the instant of the mother's death, he was clearly not entitled as having had no issue born, but the land descended to the child while he was yet in his mother's womb, and the estate, being once so vested, shall not afterwards be taken from him. In Gabalkine lands, a husband may be tenant by the courtesy without having any issue. But in general, there must be issue born, and such issue must also be capable of inheriting the mother's estate. Therefore, if a woman be tenant in tail male, and hath only a daughter born, the husband is not thereby entitled to be tenant by the courtesy, because such issue female can never inherit the estate in tail male. And this seems to be the true reason why the husband cannot be tenant by the courtesy of any lands of which the wife was not actually seized because in order to entitle himself to such a state, he must have begotten issue that be heir to the wife. But no one, by the standing rule of law, can be heir to the ancestor of any land whereof the ancestor was not actually sized, and therefore, as the husband hath never begotten any issue that can be heir to those lands, he shall not be tenant of them by the courtesy. And hence we may observe with how much nicety and consideration the old rules of law were framed, and how closely they are connected and interwoven together, supporting, illustrating, and demonstrating one another. The time when the issue was born is immaterial, providing it were during the coverture. For, whether it was born before or after the wife's sizing of the lands, whether it be living or dead at the time of the sizing, or at the time of the wife's decease, the husband shall be tenant by the courtesy. The husband, by the birth of the child, becomes, as was before observed, tenant by the courtesy initiate, and may do many acts to charge the lands. But his estate is not consummate until the death of the wife, which is the fourth and last requisite to make a complete tenant by the courtesy. End of chapter 8, part 1. Chapter 8, Part 2 
of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book 2, by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes. Of Freeholds, Not of Inheritance. Part 2. 4. Tenant and dower is where the husband of a woman is seized of an estate of inheritance and dies. In this case, the wife shall have the third part of all lands and tenements whereof he was seized during the coverture to hold to herself for the term of her natural life. Dower is called in Latin by the foreign jurists doarium, but by Bracton and our English writers dos which among the Romans signified the marriage portion which the wife brought to her husband, but with us is applied to signify the kind of estate to which the civil law in its original state had nothing that bore resemblance. Nor indeed is there anything in general more different than the regulation of landed property according to the English and Roman laws. Dower out of land seems also to have been unknown in the earliest part of our Saxon constitution, for in the laws of King Edmund the wife is directed to be supported wholly out of the personal estate. Afterwards, as may be seen in Gavilkind tenure, the widow became entitled to a conditional estate in one half of the lands with the proviso that she remained chaste and unmarried as is usual also in copyhold dowers or free bench. Yet some have ascribed the introduction of dower to the Normans as a branch of their local tenures, though we cannot expect any feudal reason for its invention, since it was not a part of the pure, primitive, simple law of feuds, but was first of all introduced to that system wherein it was called Rean Tertia in Dotalitium, by the Emperor Frederick II, who was contemporary with our King Henry III. It is possible, therefore, that it might be with us the relic of a Danish custom, since, according to the historians of that country, Dower was introduced into Denmark by Swine, the father of our Canute the Great, out of gratitude to the Danish ladies who sold all their jewels to ransom him when taken prisoner by the Vandals. However this may be, the reason which our law gives for adopting it is a very plain and sensible one, for the sustenance of the wife and the nurture and education of the younger children. In treating of this estate, let us first consider who may be endowed, secondly, of what she may be endowed, thirdly, the manner how she shall be endowed, and fourthly, how dower may be barred or prevented. 1. Who may be endowed? She must be the actual wife of the party at the time of his decease. If she be divorced, a veculo matrimoni, she shall not be endowed. 4. Ubi nullum matrimonium, ibi nulla dos. But a divorce, a mensa a toro only, doth not destroy the dower. No, not even for adultery itself, by the common law. Yet now, by the statute Westminster II, if a woman elopes from her husband and lives with an adulterer, she shall lose her dower unless her husband be voluntarily reconciled to her. It was formerly held that the wife of an idiot might be endowed, though the husband of an idiot could not be tenant by the courtesy. But as it seems to be at present agreed, upon principles of sound sense and reason that an idiot cannot marry, being incapable of consenting to any contract, this doctrine cannot now take place. By the ancient law, the wife of a person attainted of treason or felony could not be endowed. To the intent, says Stoneford, that if the love of a man's own life cannot restrain him from such atrocious acts, the love of his wife and children may. Though Britain gives it another turn, viz., that it is presumed that the wife was privy to her husband's crime. However, 
the Statute 1, Edward VI, C-12, abated the rigor of the common law in this particular and allowed the wife her dower. But a subsequent statute revived this severity against the widows of traitors who are now barred of their dower, but not the widows of felons. An alien also cannot be endowed, unless she be the queen consort, for no alien is capable of holding lands. The wife must be above nine years old at her husband's death, otherwise she shall not be endowed, though in Bracton's time the age was indefinite, and dower was then only due se user puxit dotem promerere et virum sustinere. 2. We are next to inquire of what a wife may be endowed. And she is now by law entitled to be endowed of all lands and tenements of which her husband was seized in fee simple or fee tail at any time during the coverture, and of which any issue which she might have had might by possibility have been heir. Therefore, if a man seized in fee simple hath a son by his first wife, and after marries a second wife, she shall be endowed of his lands, for her issue might by possibility have been heir on the death of the son by the former wife. But if there be a donee in special tale, who holds lands to him and the heirs of his body begotten on Jane his wife, though Jane may be endowed of these lands, Yet, if Jane dies and he marries a second wife, that second wife shall never be endowed of the lands entailed, for no issue that she could have could by any possibility inherit them. A sizing in law of the husband will be as effectual as a sizing in deed, in order to render the wife dowable, for it is not in the wife's power to bring the husband's title to an actual sizing as it is in the husband's power to do with regard to the wife's lands, which is one reason why he shall not be tenant of the courtesy, but of such lands whereof the wife or he himself in her right was actually seized indeed. The sizing of the husband for a transitory instant only, when the same act which gives him the estate also conveys out of him again, as where by a fine land is granted to a man, and he immediately renders it back by the same fine, such a sizing will not entitle the wife to dower, for the land was merely in transitu, and never rested in the husband. But if the land abides in him for a single moment, it seems that the wife shall be endowed thereof. And, in short, a widow may be endowed of all her husband's lands, tenements, and hereditaments, corporeal or incorporeal, under the restrictions before mentioned, unless there be some special reason to the contrary. Thus, a woman shall not be endowed of a castle built for defense of the realm, nor of a common without stint, for, as the heir would then have one portion of this common, and the widow another, and both without stint, the common would be doubly stocked. Copyhold estates also are not liable to dower, being only estates at the Lord's will, unless by the special custom of the manor, in which case it is usually called the widow's free bench. But where dower is allowable, it matters not though the husband alien the lands during the coverture, for he aliens them liable to dower. 3. Next, as to the manner in which a woman is to be endowed. There are now subsisting four species of dower, the fifth, mentioned by Littleton, de la plus belle, having been abolished altogether with the military tenures, of which it was a consequence. 1. Dower by the common law, or that which is before described. 2. Dower by custom as that the wife shall have half the husband's lands, or in some places the whole, in some only a quarter. 3. Dower ad osium ecclesia, which is where the tenant in fee simple of full age, openly at the church door, where all marriages were formally celebrated, after affiance made, and, Sir Edward Coke in his translation adds, troth plighted between them, doth endow his wife with the whole, 
or such quantity as he shall please of his lands at the same time specifying and ascertaining the same on which the wife after her husband's death may enter without farther ceremony or dower ex ascensu patris which is only a species of dower ad astium ecclesia made when the husband's father is alive and the son by his consent expressly given endows his wife with parcel of his father's lands in either of these cases they must to prevent frauds be made in faci ecclesia et ostium ecclesia non em in valent facta in lecto mortali nec in camera alta libe ube clandestina fuere conjugia it is curious to observe the several revolutions which the doctrine of dower has undergone since its introduction into england it seems first to have been of the nature of the dower in gavelkind before mentioned viz a moiety of the husband's lands but forfeitable by incontinency or a second marriage by the famous charter of henry i this condition of widowhood and chastity was only required in case the husband left any issue and afterwards we hear no more of it under henry the second according to glanville the dower of ad astium ecclesia was the most usual species of dower and here as well as in normandy it was binding upon the wife if by her consented to at the time of marriage neither in those days of feudal rigor was the husband allowed to endow her ad astium ecclesia with more than the third part of the lands whereof when he was seized though he might endow her with less lest by such liberal endowments the lord should be defrauded of his wardships and other feudal profits but if no specific dotation was made at the church porch then she was endowed by the common law of the third part which was called her dos rationa bilis of such lands and tenements as the husband was seized at the time of the espousals and no other unless he specially engaged before the priest to endow her of his future acquisitions and if the husband had no lands an endowment in goods chattels or money at the time of espousals was a bar of any dower in lands which he afterwards acquired in king john's magna carta and the first charter of henry the thirds no mention is made of any alteration of the common law in respect of the lands subject to dower but in those of twelve seventeen and twelve twenty four it is particularly provided that a widow shall be entitled for her dower to the third part of all such lands as the husband had held in his lifetime yet in case of a specific endowment of less ad officium ecclesiasi the widow still had no power to waive it after her husband's death and this continued to be law during the reigns of henry the third and edward the first in henry the fourth's time it was denied to be law that a woman can be endowed of her husband's goods and chattels and under edward the fourth littleton lays it down expressly that a woman may be endowed ad officium ecclesiae with more than a third part and shall have her election after her husband's death to accept such dower or refuse it and betake herself to her dower at common law which state of uncertainty was probably the reason that these specific dowers ad ostium ecclesiae and ex ascensu patris have since fallen into total disuse i proceed therefore to consider the method of endowment or assigning dower by the common law which is now the only usual species by the old law grounded on the feudal exactions a woman could not be endowed without a fine paid to the lord neither could she marry again without his license lest she should contract herself and so convey part of the feud to the lord's enemy this license the lords took care to be well paid for and as it seems would sometimes force the dowager to a second marriage in order to gain the fine but to remedy these oppressions it was provided first by the charter of henry the first 
and afterwards by Magna Carta, that the widow shall pay nothing for her marriage, nor shall be distrained to marry afresh, if she chooses to live without a husband, but shall not, however, marry against the consent of the Lord. And farther, that nothing shall be taken for assignment of the widow's dower, but that she shall remain in her husband's capital mansion house for forty days after his death, during which time her dower shall be assigned. These forty days are called the widow's quarantine, a term made use of in law to signify the number of forty days, whether applied to this occasion or any other. The particular lands to be held in dower must be assigned by the heir of the husband or his guardian, not only for the sake of notoriety, but also to entitle the lord of the fee to demand his services of the heir in respect of the lands so held. For the heir by this entry becomes tenant thereof to the lord, and the widow is immediate tenant to the heir by a kind of sub-infudation or under-tenancy completed by this investiture or assignment, which tenure may still be created, notwithstanding the statute of Kia Emptores, because the heir parts not with the fee simple, but only with an estate for life. If the heir or his guardian do not assign her dower within the term of quarantine, or do assign it unfairly, she has her remedy at law, and the sheriff is appointed to assign it. If the thing of which she is endowed be divisible, her dower must be set out by meets and bounds. But, if it be indivisible, she must be endowed specifically, as of the third presentation to a church, the third toll dish of a mill, the third part of the profits of an office, the third sheaf of tithe, and the like. Upon preconcerted marriages, and in estates of considerable consequence, tenancy in dower happens very seldom. For the claim of the wife to her dower at the common law diffusing itself so extensively, it became a great clog to alienations and was otherwise inconvenient to families. Wherefore, since the alteration of the ancient law respecting dower ad ostium ecclesiae, which hath occasioned the entire disuse of that species of dower, jointures have been introduced in their stead as a bar to the claim at common law, which leads me to inquire lastly, or how dower may be barred or prevented. A widow may be barred of her dower not only by elopement, divorce, being an alien, the treason of her husband, and other disabilities before mentioned, but also by detaining the title deeds or evidences of the estate from the heir, until she restores them, and, by the statute of Gloucester, if a dowager aliens the land assigned her for dower, she forfeits it ipso facto, and the heir may recover it by action. A woman also may be barred of her dower by levying a fine or suffering a recovery of the lands during her coverture. But the most usual method of barring dowers is by jointures, as regulated by the statute 27 Henry VIII, C. 10. A jointure, which strictly speaking signifies a joint estate, limited to both husband and wife, but in common acceptation extends also to a sole estate, limited to the wife only, is thus defined by Sir Edward Coke, a competent livelihood of freehold for the wife of lands and tenements to take effect in profit or possession presently after the death of the husband for the life of the wife at least. This description is framed from the purview of the statute 27 Henry VIII C. 10 before mentioned, commonly called the statute of uses, of which we shall speak fully hereafter. At present, I have only to observe that, before the making of that statute, the greatest part of the land of England was conveyed to uses, the property or possession of the soil being vested in one man, and the use or profits thereof in another. Whole directions, with regard to the disposition thereof, 
the former was in conscience obliged to follow and might be compelled by a court of equity to observe. Now, though a husband had the use of lands in absolute fee simple, yet the wife was not entitled to any dower therein, he not being seized thereof, wherefore it became usual on marriage to settle by express deed some special estate to the use of the husband and his wife for their lives in joint tenancy or jointure, which settlement would be a provision for the wife in case she survived her husband. At length, the statute of uses ordained that such as had the use of lands should, to all intents and purposes, be reputed and taken to be absolutely sized and possessed of the soil itself. In consequence of which legal sizing, all wives would have become dowable of such lands as were held to the use of their husbands, and also entitled at the same time to any special lands that might be settled in jointure, had not the same statute provided that upon making such an estate in jointure to the wife before marriage, she shall be forever precluded from her dower. But then these four requisites must be punctually observed. 1. The jointure must take effect immediately on the death of the husband. 2. It must be for her own life at least, and not pur autar vie, or for any term of years, or other smaller estate. 3. It must be made to herself, and no other in trust for her. 4. It must be made, and so in the deed particularly expressed to be, in satisfaction of her whole dower, and not of any particular part of it. If the jointure be made to her after marriage, she has her election after the husband's death, as in dower ad officium ecclesiae, and may either accept it or refuse it, and betake herself to her dower at common law for she was not capable of consenting to it during coverture. And if, by any fraud or accident, a jointure made before marriage proves to be on a bad title, and the jointress is evicted or turned out of possession, she shall then, by the provisions of the same statute, have her dower pro tanto at the common law. There are some advantages attending tenants in dower that do not extend to jointresses, and so, vice versa, jointresses are in some respects more privileged than tenants in dower. Tenants in dower, by the old common law, is subject to no tolls or taxes, and hers is almost the only estate on which, when derived from the king's debtor, the king cannot distrain for his debt if contracted during the coverture. But on the other hand, a widow may enter at once without any formal process on her jointure land, as also might have done the dower ad officium ecclesiae, which a jointure in many points resembles, and the resemblance was still greater while that species of dower continued in its primitive state, whereas no small trouble and a very tedious method of proceeding is necessary to compel a legal assignment of dower. And, what is more, though dower be forfeited by the treason of the husband, yet lands settled in jointure remain unimpeached to the widow. Wherefore, Sir Edward Coke very justly gives it the preference as being more sure and safe to the widow than even dower ad officium ecclesiae, the most eligible species of any. End of chapter 8, part 2《ハプター9の文章の文章の文章の文章の文章の文章の文章の文章の文章の文章の文章の文章の文章の文章の文章の文章の文章の文章の文章の文章の文章の文章の文章の文章の文章の文章の文章の文章の文章の文章の文章の文章の文章の文章の文章の文章の Of estates that are less than freehold, there are three sorts. 1. Estates for years. 2. Estates at will. 3. 
the states by sufferance. 1. An estate for years is a contract for the possession of lands or tenements for some determinate period, and it happens where a man letteth them to another for the term of a certain number of years, agreed upon between the lessor and the lessee, and the lessee enters thereon. If the lease be but for half a year, or a quarter, or any less time, the lessee is respected as a tenant for years, and is styled so in some legal proceedings, a year being the shortest term which the law in this case takes notice of. And this may, not improperly, lead us to a short explanation of the division and calculation of time by the English law. The space of a year is a determinate and well-known period, consisting commonly of 365 days. For though in bisextile or leap years it consists properly of 366, yet by the statute 21 Henry III, the increasing day in the leap year, together with the preceding day, shall be accounted for one day only. That of a month is more ambiguous, there being, in common use, two ways of calculating months, either as lunar, consisting of 28 days, the supposed revolution of the moon, 13 of which make a year, or as calendar months of unequal lengths according to the Julian division in our common almanacs, commencing at the calends of each month, whereof in a year there are only twelve. A month in law is a lunar month, or twenty-eight days, unless otherwise expressed, not only because it's always one uniform period, but because it falls naturally into quarterly division by weeks. Therefore, a lease for 12 months is only for 48 weeks, but if it be for a 12 month in the singular number, it is good for a whole year. For herein the law recedes from its usual calculation, because the ambiguity between the two methods of computation ceases, it being generally understood that by the space of time called thus, in the singular number, a twelve-month is meant the whole year consisting of one solar revolution. In the space of a day, all the twenty-four hours are usually reckoned, the law generally rejecting all fractions of a day in order to avoid disputes. Therefore, if I am bound to pay money on any certain day, I discharge the obligation if I pay it before twelve o'clock at night, after which the following day commences, but to return to estates for years. These estates were originally granted to mere farmers or husbandmen, who every year rendered some equivalent in money, provisions, or other rent to the lessors or landlords, but, in order to encourage them to manure and cultivate the ground, they had a permanent interest granted them, not determinable at the will of the Lord and yet their possession was esteemed of so little consequence that they were rather considered as the bailiffs or servants of the Lord, who were to receive an account for the profits at a settled price than as having any property of their own. And therefore they were not allowed to have a freehold estate, but their interest, such as it was, vested after their deaths in their executors, who were to make up the accounts of their testator with the Lord and with his other creditors, and were entitled to the flock upon the farm. The lessee's estate might also, by the ancient law, be at any time defeated by a common recovery suffered by the tenant of the freehold, which annihilated all leases for years then subsisting, unless afterwards renewed by the recoverer, whose title was supposed superior to his by whom those leases were granted. While estates for years were thus precarious, it is no wonder that they were usually very short, like our modern leases upon rack rent. And indeed, we are told that by the ancient law no leases for more than forty years were allowable, because any longer possession, especially when given without any livery declaring the nature and duration of the estate, might tend to defeat the inheritance. Yet this law, if it ever existed, was soon antiquated, for we may observe in Maddox's collection of ancient instruments 
some leases for years of a pretty early date, which considerably exceeded that period, and long terms for 300 years at least was certainly in use at the time of Edward III and probably Edward I. But certainly, when by the statute 21 Henry VIII, C15, the term or, that is, he who is entitled to the term of years, was protected against these fictitious recoveries, and his interest rendered secure and permanent, long terms began to be more frequent than before, and were afterwards extensively introduced, being found extremely convenient for family settlements and mortgages, continuing, subject, however, to the same rules of succession and with the same inferiority to freeholds as when they were little better than tenancies at the will of the landlord. Every estate which must expire at a certain period and prefixed by whatever words created is an estate for years. And therefore, this estate is frequently called a term, terminus, because its duration or continuance is bounded, limited, and determined. For every such estate must have a certain beginning and a certain end. But, id certum est, quod certum redi potest. Therefore, if a man make a lease to another, for so many years as J.S. shall name, it is a good lease for years. For though it is at present uncertain, yet when J.S. hath named the years, it is then reduced to a certainty. If no day of commencement is named in the creation of this estate, it begins from the making or delivery of the lease. A lease for so many years as J.S. shall live is void from the beginning, for it is neither certain nor can ever be reduced to a certainty during the continuance of the lease. And the same doctrine holds if a parson make a lease of his glebe for so many years as he shall continue parson of Dale, for this is still more uncertain. But a lease for twenty or more years, if J.S. shall so long live, or if he shall so long continue parson, is good. For there is a certain period fixed beyond which it cannot last, though it may determine sooner on the death of J.S. or his ceasing to be parson there. We have before remarked and endeavored to assign the reason of the inferiority in which the law places an estate for years when compared with an estate for life or an inheritance, observing that an estate for life, even if it be pur arter vie, is a freehold, but that an estate for a thousand years is only a chattel and reckoned part of the personal estate. Hence it follows that a lease for years may be made to commence in futuro, though a lease for life cannot. As, if I grant lands to Titius to hold from Michaelmas next for twenty years, this is good. But to hold from Michaelmas next for the term of his natural life is void. For no estate of freehold can commence in futuro because it cannot be created at common law without livery of sizen, or corporal possession of the land, and corporal possession cannot be given of an estate now which is not to commence now, but hereafter. And because no livery of sizen is necessary to lease for years, such lessee is not said to be sized or to have true legal sizen of the lands. Nor indeed does the bare lease vest any estate in the lessee, but only gives him a right of entry on the tenement, which right is called his interest in the term, or interesse termini. But when he is actually so entered, and thereby accepted the grant, the estate is then and not before vested in him, and he is possessed not properly of the land, but of the term of years. The possession or sizen of the land remaining still in him who hath the freehold. Thus, the word term does not merely signify the time specified in the lease, but the estate also and interest that passes by that lease, and therefore the term may expire during continuance of time as by surrender, forfeiture, and the like. For which reason, 
If I grant the lease to A for the term of three years, and after the expiration of said term to B for six years, and A surrenders or forfeits his lease at the end of one year, B's interest shall immediately take effect. But if the remainder had been to B from and after the expiration of said three years, or from and after the expiration of the said time, in this case, B's interest will not commence till the time is fully elapsed, whatever may become of A's term. Tenant for term of years hath incident to, and inseparable from his estate, unless by special agreement, the same as Stover's, which we formerly observed that the tenant for life was entitled to, that is to say, houseboat, fireboat, plowboat, and hayboat, terms which have already been explained. With regard to emblements or profits of land sowed by tenant for years, there is this difference between him and the tenant for life, that where the term of tenant for years depends on a certainty, as if he holds from midsummer for ten years, and in the last year he sows a crop of corn, and it is not right and cut before midsummer, the end of his term, the landlord shall have it. For the tenant knew the expiration of his term, and therefore it was his own folly to sow what he could never reap the profits of. But where the lease for years depends upon an uncertainty, as upon the death of the lessor, being himself only a tenant for life, or being a husband seized in right of his wife, or if the term of years be determinable upon a life or lives, in all these cases the estate for years, not being certainly to expire at a time foreknown, but merely by the act of God, the tenant or his executors, shall have the emblements in the same manner that a tenant for life or his executors shall be entitled thereto. Not so, if it determined by the act of the party himself, as if the tenant for years does anything that amounts to a forfeiture, in which case the emblements shall go to the lessor and not to the lessee, who hath determined his estate by his own default. 2. The second species of estates not freehold are estates at will. An estate at will is where lands and tenements are let by one man to another, to have and to hold at the will of the lessor, and the tenant by force of this lease obtains possession. Such tenant hath no certain indefeasible estate, nothing that can be assigned by him to another, for that the lessor may determine his will, and put him out whenever he pleases. But every estate at will is at the will of both parties, landlord and tenant, so that either of them may determine his will, and quit his connections with the other at his own pleasure. Yet this must be understood with some restriction. For if the tenant at will sows his land, and the landlord before the corn is ripe or before it is reaped puts him out, yet the tenant shall have the emblems and free ingress, egress, and regress to cut and carry away the profits. And this for the same reason upon which all cases of emblems turn, viz., the point of uncertainty. Since the tenant could not possibly know when his landlord would determine his will, and therefore could make no provision against it, and having sown the land, which is for the good of the public, upon a reasonable presumption, the law will not suffer him to be a loser by it. But it is otherwise, and upon reason equally good, where the tenant himself determines the will, for in this case the landlord shall have the profits of the land. What act does or does not amount to determination of the will on either side has formerly been a matter of great debate in our courts. But it is now, I think, settled that, besides the express determination of the lessor's will by declaring that a lessee shall hold no longer, which must either be made upon the land or notice must be given to the lessee, the exertion of any act of ownership by the lessor as entering upon the premises and cutting timber, taking a distress for rent and impounding them thereon, or making a fiefment or lease for years of the land to commence immediately, any act of desertion by the lessee as assigning his estate to another or committing waste, 
which is an act inconsistent with such tenure, or which is instaramnium, the death or outlawry of either lessor or lessee, puts an end to or determines the estate at will. The law is, however, careful that no sudden determination of the will by one party shall tend to the manifest and unforeseen prejudice of the other. This appears in the case of emblements before mentioned, and, by a parity of reason, the lessee, after the determination of the lessor's will, shall have reasonable ingress and egress to fetch away his goods and utensils. And if rent be payable quarterly or half-yearly, and the lessee determines the will, the rent shall be paid to the end of the current quarter or half-year. And upon the same principle, courts of law have of late years lent as much as possible against construing demises where no certain term is mentioned to be tenancies at will, but have rather held them to be tenancies from year to year, so long as both parties please, especially where an annual rent is reserved in which case they will not suffer either party to determine the tenancy even at the end of the year without reasonable notice to the other. There is one species of estate at will that deserves a more particular regard than any other, and that is an estate held by copy of court roll, or, as we usually call it, a copyhold estate. This, as was before observed, was in its original and foundation nothing better than a mere estate at will. But the kindness and indulgence of successive lords of manors, having permitted these estates to be enjoyed by the tenants and their heirs according to their particular customs established in their respective districts, therefore, though they are still held at the will of the lord, and so are in general expressed in the court rolls to be, Yet that will is qualified, restrained, and limited to be exerted according to the custom of the manor. This custom, being suffered to grow up by the Lord, is looked upon as the evidence and interpreter of his will. His will is no longer arbitrary and precarious, but fixed and ascertained by the custom to be the same and no other that has time out of mind been exercised and declared by his ancestors. A copyhold tenant is therefore now full as properly a tenant by the custom as a tenant at will, the custom having arisen from a series of uniform wills. And therefore, it is rightly observed by Calithorpe that copyholders and customary tenants differ not so much in nature as in name. For although some be called copyholders, some customary, some tenants by the verge, some base tenants, some bond tenants, and some by one name and some by another, yet do they all agree in substance and kind of tenure. All the said lands are holden in one general kind, that is, by custom and continuance of time, and the diversity of their names doth not alter the nature of their tenure. Almost every copyhold tenant being therefore thus tenant at the will of the Lord according to the custom of the manor, which customs differ as much as the humor and temper of the respective ancient lords, from whence we may account for their great variety, such tenant, I say, may have, so far as custom warrants, any other of the estates or quantities of interest which we have hitherto considered, or may hereafter consider, to hold united with this customary estate at will. A copyholder may, in many manners, be tenant in fee simple, in fee tail, for life, by the courtesy, in dower, for years, at sufferance, or on condition, subject, however, to be deprived of these estates upon concurrence of those circumstances which the will of the Lord, promulgated by immemorial custom, has declared to be a forfeiture or absolute determination of those interests, as in some manners the want of issue mail, in others cutting down timber, the non-payment of a fine, and the like. Yet none of these interests amount to a freehold, for the freehold of the whole manner abides always in the Lord only, 
who hath granted out the use and occupation, but not the corporal sizing or true possession of certain parts and parcels thereof, to these his customary tenants at will. The reason of originally granting out this complicated kind of interest, so that the same man shall, with regard to the same land, be at one and the same time tenant in fee simple, and also tenant at the Lord's will, seems to have arisen from the nature of village tenure, in which a grant of any estate of freehold, or even for years, absolutely, was an immediate enfranchisement of the villain. The Lords, therefore, though they were willing to enlarge the interest of their villains by granting them estates which might endure for their lives or sometimes be descendable to their issue, yet did not care to manumit them entirely. And for that reason it seems to have been contrived that a power of resumption at the will of the Lord should be annexed to these grants, whereby the tenants were still kept in a state of villainage, and no freehold at all was conveyed to them in their respective lands. And, of course, as the freehold of all lands must necessarily rest and abide somewhere, the law supposes it to continue and remain in the Lord. Afterwards, when these villains became modern copyholders, and had acquired by custom a sure and indefeasible estate in their lands, on performing the usual services, but yet continued to be styled in their admissions tenants at the will of the Lord, the law still supposed it an absurdity to allow that such as were thus nominally tenants at will could have any freehold interest, and therefore continued, and still continues to determine, that the freehold of land so holden abides in the Lord of the manor, and not in the tenant. For though he really holds to him and his heirs forever, yet he is also said to hold at another's will. But with regard to certain other copyholders of free or privileged tenure, which are derived from the ancient tenants in villain sockage, and are not said to hold at the will of the Lord, but only according to the custom of the manor, there is no such absurdity in allowing them to be capable of enjoying a freehold interest. And therefore, the law doth not suppose the freehold of such lands to rest in the Lord of whom they are holden, but in the tenants themselves, who are allowed to have a freehold interest, though not a freehold tenure. However, in common cases, copyhold estates are still ranked, for the reasons above mentioned, among tenancies at will, though custom, which is the life of the common law, has established a permanent property in the copyholders, who were formerly nothing better than bondmen, equal to that of the Lord himself in the tenements holden of the manor, nay, sometimes even superior. For we may now look upon a copyholder of inheritance with a fine certain to be little inferior to an absolute freeholder in point of interest, and in other respects, particularly in the clearness and security of his title, to be frequently in a better situation. 3. An estate at sufferance is where one comes into possession of land by lawful title, but keeps it afterwards without any title at all. As if a man takes a lease for a year, and after the year is expired, continues to hold the premises without any fresh lease from the owner of the estate. Or if a man maketh a lease at will, and dies, the estate at will is thereby determined. But if the tenant continueth possession, he is tenant at sufferance. But no man can be tenant at sufferance against the king, to whom no laches or neglect in not entering and ousting the tenant is ever imputed by law. But his tenant, so holding over, is considered an absolute intruder. But in the case of a subject, This estate may be destroyed whenever the true owner shall make an actual entry on the lands and oust the tenant. For, before entry, he cannot maintain an action of trespass against the tenant by sufferance, as he might against a stranger. And the reason is, because the tenant being once in by a lawful title, the law, which presumes no wrong in any man, will suppose him to continue upon a title equally lawful, 
unless the owner of the land by some public and avowed act such as entry is will declare his continuance to be torturous or in common language wrongful thus stands the law with regard to tenants by sufferance and landlords are obliged in these cases to make formal entries upon their lands and recover possession by the legal process of ejectment and at the utmost by the common law the tenant was bound to account for the profits of the land so by him detained but now by statute four george the second c twenty eight in case any tenant for life or years or other person claiming under or by collusion with such tenant shall wilfully hold over after the determination of the term and demand made in writing for recovering the possession of the premises by him to whom the remainder or reversion thereof shall belong such person so holding over shall pay for the time he continues at the rate of double the yearly value of the land so detained this has almost put an end to the practice of tenancy by sufferance unless with the tacit consent of the owner of the tenement end of chapter nine chapter ten of the commentaries on the laws of england book two by william blackstone this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes Of Estates Upon Condition Besides the several divisions of estates in point of interest, which we have considered in the three preceding chapters, there is also another species still remaining, which is called an estate upon condition, being such whose existence depends upon the happening or not happening of some uncertain event, whereby the estate may be either originally created or enlarged or finally defeated. And these conditional estates I have chosen to reserve till last, because they are indeed more properly qualifications of other estates than a distinct species of themselves, seeing that any quantity of interest, a fee, a freehold, or a term of years may depend upon these provisional restrictions. Estates then upon condition, thus understood, are of two sorts. One, estates upon condition implied. Two, estates upon condition expressed, under which last may be included. Three, estates held in vagio, gage, or pledge, four, estates by statute merchant or statute staple, five, estates held by elegit. 1. Estates upon condition implied in law are where a grant of an estate has a condition annexed to it inseparably from its essence and constitution, although no condition be expressed in words as if a grant be made to a man of an office generally, without adding other words. The law tacitly annexes here too a secret condition that the grantee shall duly execute his office, on breach of which condition it is lawful for the grantor or his heirs to oust him and grant it to another person. For an office, either public or private, may be forfeited by misuses or non-uses, both of which are breaches of this implied condition. 1. By misuses or abuse, as if a judge takes a bribe or a park keeper kills deer without authority. 2. By non-uses or neglect, which in public offices that concern administration of justice or the commonwealth is of itself direct and immediate cause of forfeiture. But non-uses of a private office is no cause of forfeiture unless some special damage is proved to be occasioned thereby. For in the one case, delay must necessarily be occasioned in the affairs of the public, which require a constant attention. But private offices, not requiring so regular and unremitted a service, the temporary neglect of them is not necessarily productive of mischief. 
upon which account some special loss must be proved in order to vacate these. Franchises also, being regal privileges in the hands of a subject, are held to be granted on the same condition of making a proper use of them, and therefore they may be lost and forfeited like offices either by abuse or by neglect. Upon the same principle proceed all the forfeitures which are given by law of life estates and others for any act done by the tenant himself that are incompatible with the estate which he holds. As if tenants for life or years in fee for stranger in fee simple. This is, by common law, a forfeiture of their several estates, being a breach of the condition which the law annexes thereto, viz., that they shall not attempt to create a greater estate than they themselves are entitled to. So if any tenants for years, for life, or in fee commit a felony, the king or other lord of the fee is entitled to have their tenements, because their estate is determined by the breach of the condition that they shall not commit a felony, which the law tacitly annexes to every feudal donation. 2. An estate on condition expressed in the grant itself is where an estate is granted, either in fee simple or otherwise, with an express qualification annexed, whereby the estate granted shall either commence, be enlarged, or be defeated upon performance or breach of such qualification or condition. These conditions are therefore either precedent or subsequent. Precedent are such as must happen or be performed before the estate can vest or be enlarged. Subsequent are such by the failure or non-performance of which an estate already vested may be defeated. Thus, if an estate for life be limited to A upon his marriage with B, the marriage is a precedent condition, and till that happens no estate is vested in A. Or, if a man grant to his lessee for years that upon payment of a hundred marks within the term he shall have the fee, this is also a condition precedent, and the fee simple passeth not till the hundred marks be paid. But if a man grant an estate in fee simple, reserving to himself and his heirs a certain rent, and that, if such rent not be paid at the times limited, it shall be lawful for him and his heirs to re-enter and avoid the estate. In this case, the grantee and his heirs have an estate upon condition subsequent, which is defeasible if the condition be not strictly performed. To this class may also be referred all base fees and fee simples conditional at the common law. Thus an estate to a man and his heirs, tenants of the manor dale, is an estate on condition that he and his heirs continue tenants of that manor. And so, if a personal annuity be granted at this day to a man and the heirs of his body, as this is no tenement within the statute of Westminster the second, it remains, as at common law, a fee simple on condition that the grantee has heirs of his body. Upon the same principle depend all the determinable estates of freehold, which we mentioned in the eighth chapter, as durante viduitate, etc. These are estates upon condition that the grantees do not marry and the like. And, on the breach of any of these subsequent conditions by the failure of these contingencies, by the grantees not continuing tenant of the manor of Dale, by not having heirs of his body, or by not continuing soul, the estates which were respectively vested in each grantee are wholly determined and void. A distinction is, however, made between a condition indeed and a limitation which Littleton denominates also a condition in law. For when an estate is so expressly confined and limited by the words of its creation that it cannot endure for any longer time than till the contingency happens upon which the estate is to fail, this is denominated a limitation. As when land is granted to a man, so long as he is parson of Dale, 
or while he continues unmarried, or until out of the rents and profits he shall have made five hundred pounds and the like. In such cases the estate determines as soon as the contingency happens, when he ceases to be parson, marries a wife, or has received the five hundred pounds, and the next subsequent estate, which depends upon such determination, becomes immediately vested without any act to be done by him who is next in expectancy. But when an estate is, strictly speaking, upon condition indeed, as if granted expressly upon condition to be void upon the payment of forty pounds by the grantor, or so that the grantee continues unmarried, or provided he goes to York, etc., the law permits it to endure beyond the time when such contingency happens, unless the grantor or his heirs or assigns take advantage of the breach of the condition and make either an entry or a claim in order to avoid the estate. But, though strict words of condition be used in the creation of the estate, yet if on breach of the condition the estate be limited over to a third person and does not immediately revert to the grantor or his representatives, as if an estate be granted A to B, on condition that within two years B intermarry with C, and on failure thereof then to D and his heirs, this law continues to be a limitation and not a condition, because, if it were a condition, then upon the breach thereof only A or his representatives could avoid the estate by entry, and so D's remainder might be defeated by their neglecting to enter. But when it is a limitation, the estate of B determines, and that of D commences, the instant that the failure happens. So also, if a man by his will devises land to his heir at law, on condition that he pays a sum of money, and for non-payment devises it over, this shall be considered as a limitation. Otherwise, no advantage could be taken of the non-payment, for none but the heir himself could have entered for a breach of condition. In all these instances of limitations or conditions subsequent, it is to be observed that so long as the condition, either express or implied, either in deed or in law, remains unbroken, the grantee may have an estate of freehold, provided the estate upon which such condition is annexed be in itself of a freehold nature as if the original grant express, either an estate of inheritance or for life, or no estate at all, which is constructively an estate for life. For the breach of these conditions being contingent and uncertain, this uncertainty preserves the freehold, because the estate is capable to last forever, or at least for the life of the tenant, supposing the condition to remain unbroken. But where the estate is at the utmost a chattel interest, which must determine at a time certain, and may determine sooner, as a grant for ninety-nine years, provided A, B, and C, and the survivor of them, shall so long live, this still continues a mere chattel, and is not, by its uncertainty, ranked among estates of freehold. These express conditions, if they be impossible at the time of their creation, or afterwards become impossible by the act of God, or the act of the fee for himself, or if they be contrary to law, or repugnant to the nature of the estate, are void. In any of which cases, if they be conditions subsequent, that is, to be performed after the estate is vested, the estate shall become absolute in the tenant. As, if a fiefment be made to a man in fee simple, on condition that unless he goes to Rome in twenty-four hours, or unless he marries with Jane S. by such a day, within which time the woman dies, or the fee for marries her himself, or unless he kills another, or in case he aliens in fee, then, and in any such cases, the estate shall be vacated and determined. Here, the condition is void, and the estate made absolute in the fee-fee. For he hath by the grant the estate vested in him, which shall not be defeated afterwards, 
by a condition either impossible, illegal, or repugnant. But if the condition be precedent, or to be performed before the estate vests, as a grant to a man that, if he kills another, or goes to Rome in a day, he shall have an estate in fee. Here, the void condition being precedent, the estate which depends thereon is also void, and the grantee shall take nothing by the grant, for he hath no estate until the condition be performed. There are some estates defeasible upon conditional subsequent that require a more peculiar notice. Such are 3. Estates held in vadio, engage, or pledge, which are of two kinds, vivum vadium, or living pledge, and mortum vadium, dead pledge, or mortgage. Vivum vadium, or living pledge, is when a man borrows a sum, suppose 200 pounds, of another, and grants him an estate as of 20 pounds per annum, to hold till the rents and profits shall repay the sum so borrowed. This is an estate conditioned to be void as soon as such sum is raised. And in this case, the land or pledge is said to be living. It subsists and survives the debt, and immediately on the discharge of that, results back to the borrower. But mortum vadium, a dead pledge or mortgage, which is much more common than the other, is where a man borrows of another a specific sum, e.g. 200 pounds, and grants him an estate in fee on condition that if he, the mortgagor, shall repay the mortgagee the said sum of 200 pounds on a certain day mentioned in the deed, that then the mortgagor may re-enter on the estate so granted in pledge. Or, as is now the more usual way, that the mortgagee shall reconvey the estate to the mortgagor. In this case, the land, which is so put in pledge, is by law, in case of non-payment at the time limited, forever dead and gone from the mortgagor, and the mortgagee's estate in the lands is then no longer conditional, but absolute. But so long as it continues conditional, that is, between the time of lending the money and the time allotted for payment, the mortgagee is called tenant in mortgage. But, as it was formerly a doubt whether, by taking such a state and fee, it did not become liable to the wife's dower and other encumbrances of the mortgage, though that doubt has been long ago overruled by our courts of equity, it therefore became usual to grant only a term of years by way of mortgage, with condition to be void on repayment of the mortgage money which course has since continued principally because on the death of the mortgagee such term becomes vested in his personal representatives who alone are entitled in equity to receive the money lent of whatever nature the mortgage may happen to be. As soon as the estate is created, the mortgagee may immediately enter on the lands, but is liable to be dispossessed upon performance of the condition by payment of the mortgage money at the day limited. And therefore, the usual way is to agree that the mortgagor shall hold the land till the day assigned for payment, when, in case of failure, whereby the estate becomes absolute, the mortgagee may enter upon it and take possession without any possibility at law of being afterwards evicted by the mortgagor to whom the land is now forever dead. But here again the courts of equity interpose, and though a mortgage be thus forfeited, and the estate absolutely vested in the mortgagee at the common law, yet they will consider the real value of the tenements compared with the sum borrowed. And, if the estate be of greater value than the money lent thereon, they will allow the mortgagor at any reasonable time to recall or redeem his estate, paying to the mortgagee his principal interest and expenses. For otherwise, in strictness of law, an estate worth a thousand pounds might be forfeited for non-payment of a hundred pounds or a less sum. This reasonable advantage allowed to mortgagors is called the equity of redemption. 
and this enables a mortgagor to call on the mortgagee who has possession of his estate to deliver it back and account for the rents and profits received on payment of his whole debt and interest, thereby turning the mortum into a kind of vivum badium. But, on the other hand, the mortgagee may either compel the sale of the estate in order to get the whole of his money immediately, or else call upon the mortgagor to redeem his estate presently, or, in default thereof, to be forever foreclosed from redeeming the same, that is, to lose his equity of redemption without possibility of recall. And also, in some cases of fraudulent mortgages, the fraudulent mortgagor forfeits all equity of redemption whatsoever. It is not therefore usual for mortgagees to take possession of the mortgaged estate unless where the security is precarious or small, or where the mortgagor neglects even payment of interest when the mortgagee is frequently obliged to bring an injectment and take the land into his own hands in the nature of a pledge or the pinus of Roman law. Whereas, while it remains in the hands of the mortgagor, it resembles their hypotheca, which was where the possession of the thing pledged remained with the debtor. But by the statute 7, George II, C. 20, after payment or tender by the mortgagor of principal interest and costs, the mortgagee can maintain no ejectment, but may be compelled to reassign his securities. In Glanville's time, when the universal method of conveyance was by livery of sizen or corporal tradition of the lands, no gauge or pledge of lands was good unless possession was also delivered to the creditor. Si non si quattro itsus vadi traditio, curia domini rege sujus modi, privatas conventions tuere non solet. For which the reason given is, to prevent subsequent and fraudulent pledges of the same land, whom in tali casu posset etem res pluribus, alis creditorius tum prius tum posterius invadiari. And the frauds which have arisen since the exchange of these public and notorious conveyances for more private and secret bargains have well evinced the wisdom of our ancient law. 4. A fourth species of estates, defeasible on conditions subsequent, are those held by statute merchant and statute staple, which are very nearly related to the vivum vadium before mentioned, or estate held till the profits thereof shall discharge your debt liquidated or ascertained. For both the statute merchant and statute staple are securities for money. The one entered into pursuant to the statute 13 Edward I, the Mercataribus, and thence called a statute merchant. The other, pursuant to the statute 27 Edward III, C9, before the mayor of the staple, that is to say, the grand mart for the principal commodities or manufacturers of the kingdom, formerly held by act of parliament in certain trading towns, and thence this security is called a statute staple. They are both, I say, securities for debts, originally permitted only among traders for the benefit of commerce, whereby the lands of the debtor are conveyed to the creditor, till out of the rents and profits of them his debt may be satisfied, and during such time as the creditor so holds the lands, he is tenant by the statute merchant or statute staple. There is also a similar security, the recognizance in the nature of the statute staple, which extends the benefit of this mercantile transaction to all the king's subjects in general, by virtue of the statute 23 Henry VIII, C6. 5. Another familiar conditional estate, created by the operation of law, for security and satisfaction of debts, is called an estate by elegit. What an elegit is, and why so called, will be explained in the third part of these commentaries. At present, I need only mention that it is the name of a writ founded on the statute of Westminster II, by which 
After a plaintiff has obtained judgment for his debt at law, the sheriff gives him possession of one half of the defendant's lands and tenements to be held, occupied, and enjoyed until his debt and damages are fully paid, and during the time he so holds them, he is called tenant by elegit. It is easy to observe that this is also a mere conditional estate, defeasible as soon as the debt is levied. But it is remarkable that the feudal restraints of alienating lands and charging them with the debts of the owner were softened much earlier and much more effectually for the benefit of trade and commerce than for any other consideration. Before the statute of Chia Emptores, it is generally thought that the proprietor of lands was enabled to alienate no more than a moiety of them. The statute, therefore, of Westminster II permits only so much of them as to be affected by the process of law as a man was capable of alienating by his own deed. But by the statute de mercatoribus, passed in the same year, the whole of a man's lands was liable to be pledged in a statute merchant, for a debt contracted in trade, though only half of them was liable to be taken in execution for any other debt of the owner. I shall conclude what I had to remark of these estates by statute merchant, statute staple, and elegit with the observation of Sir Edward Coke. These tenants have uncertain interests in lands and tenements, and yet have but chattels and no freeholds which makes them an exception to the general rule, because though they may hold in a state of inheritance, or for life, ut liberum tenementum, until their debt be paid, yet it shall go to their executors, for it is simultudinary, and though to recover their estates, they shall have the same remedy, by a size, as a tenant of freehold shall have, yet it is but the similitude of a freehold, and nullum simili et idem. This indeed proves only them to be chattel interests, because they go to the executors, which is inconsistent with the nature of a freehold. But it does not assign the reason why these estates, in contradistinction to other uncertain interests, shall vest in the executors of the tenant and not the heir, which is probably owing to this that being a security and remedy provided for for personal debts owing to the deceased, to which debts the executor is entitled, the law has therefore thus directed their succession, as judging it reasonable from a principle of natural equity that the security and remedy should be vested in them to whom the debts, if recovered, would belong. And upon the same principle, if lands be devised to a man's executor, until out of their profits the debts due from the testator be discharged, this interest in the lands shall be a chattel interest, and on the death of such executor shall go to his executors, because they, being liable to pay the original testator's debts so far as his assets will extend, are in reason entitled to possess that fund out of which he has directed them to be paid. End of chapter 10。e v e n Part 1 of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book 2, by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes. Of Estates in Possession, Remainder, and Reversion, Part 1. Hitherto, we have considered estates solely with regard to their duration, or the quantity of interest which the owners have therein. We are now to consider them in another view with regard to the time of their enjoyment, when the actual pertinency of the profits, that is, the taking, perception, or receipt of the rents and other advantages arising therefrom, begins. States, therefore, with respect to this consideration, 
may be either in possession or in expectancy. And of expectancies, there are two sorts, one created by the act of the parties called a remainder, the other by act of law called a reversion. 1. Of estates in possession, which are sometimes called estates executed, whereby a present interest passes to and resides in the tenant, not depending on any subsequent circumstance or contingency, as in the case of estates executory, there is little or nothing peculiar to be observed. All the estates we have hitherto spoken of are of this kind. For, in laying down general rules, we usually apply them to such estates as are then actually in the tenant's possession. But the doctrine of estates in expectancy contains some of the nicest and most abstruse learning in the English law. These will therefore require a minute discussion and demand some degree of attention. 2. An estate then in remainder may be defined to be an estate limited to take effect and be enjoyed after another estate is determined. As if a man fiefed in fee simple granteth lands to A for twenty years, and, after the determination of the said term, then to B and his heirs forever. Here A is tenant for years, remainder to B in fee. In the first place, an estate for years is created or carved out of the fee and given to A, and the residue or remainder of it is given to B. But both these interests are in fact only one estate. The present term of years and the remainder afterwards, when added together, being equal only to one estate in fee. They are indeed different parts, but they constitute only one whole. They are carved out of one and the same inheritance. They are both created and may both subsist together, the one in possession, the other in expectancy. So if land be granted to A for twenty years, and after the determination of the said term to B for life, and, after the determination of B's estate for life, it be limited to C and his heirs forever. This makes A tenant for years, with the remainder to B for life, remainder over to C in fee. Now here the estate of inheritance undergoes a division into three portions. There is first A's estate for years carved out of it, and after that B's estate for life. And then, the whole that remains is limited to C and his heirs. And here also, the first estate and both the remainders, for life and in fee, are one estate only, being nothing but parts or portions of one entire inheritance. And if there were a hundred remainders, it would still be the same thing, upon a principle grounded on mathematical truth, that all the parts are equal, and no more than equal, to the whole. And hence also it is easy to collect that no remainder can be limited after the grant of an estate in fee simple. Because fee simple is the highest and largest estate that a subject is capable of enjoying, and he that is tenant in fee hath in him the whole of the estate. A remainder, therefore, which is only a portion or residuary part of the estate cannot be reserved after the whole is disposed of. A particular estate, with all the remainders expectant thereon, is only one fee simple, as 40 pounds is part of 100 pounds, and 60 pounds is the remainder of it. Wherefore, after a fee simple once vested, there can no more be a remainder limited thereon than after the whole 100 pounds is appropriated, there can be any residue subsisting. Thus much being premised, we shall be the better enabled to comprehend the rules that are laid down by law to be observed in the creation of remainders and the reasons upon which those rules are founded. 1. And, first, there must necessarily be some particular estate precedent to the estate in remainder. As, an estate for years to A, remainder to B for life, or an estate for life to A, remainder to B entail. 
This precedent estate is called the particular estate as being only a small part or particula of the inheritance, the residue or remainder of which is granted over to another. The necessity of creating this preceding particular estate in order to make a good remainder arises from this plain reason. That remainder is a relative expression and implies that some part of the thing is previously disposed of. For, where the whole is conveyed at once, there cannot possibly exist a remainder. But the interest granted, whatever it be, will be an estate in possession. An estate created to commence at a distant period of time, without any intervening estate, is therefore properly no remainder. It is the whole of the gift, and not a residuary part. And such future estates can only be made of chattel interests, which were considered in the light of mere contracts by the ancient law, to be executed either now or hereafter, as the contracting parties should agree. But an estate of freehold must be created to commence immediately. For it is an ancient rule of the common law, that no estate of freehold can be created to commence in futuro, but ought to take effect presently, either in possession or remainder, because at common law no freehold in lands could pass without livery of sizin, which must operate either immediately or not at all. It would therefore be contradictory if an estate, which is not to commence till hereafter, could be granted by a conveyance which imports an immediate possession. Therefore, though a lease to A for seven years, to commence from next Michaelmas is good, yet a conveyance to B of lands, to hold to him and his heirs forever from the end of three years next ensuing, is void. So that when it is intended to grant an estate of freehold, whereof the enjoyment shall be deferred till a future time, it is necessary to create a previous particular estate which may subsist till that period of time is completed, and for the grantor to deliver immediate possession of the land to the tenant of this particular estate, which is continued to be giving possession to him in remainder since his estate and that of the particular tenant are one and the same estate in law. As where one leases to A for three years, with remainder to B in fee, and makes livery of sizin to A. Here by the livery, the freehold is immediately created and vested in B during the continuance of A's term of years. The whole estate passes at once from the grantor to the grantees, and the remainder man is fifth of his remainder at the same time that the term or is possessed of his term. The enjoyment of it must indeed be deferred till hereafter, but it is, to all intents and purposes, an estate commencing in presenti, though to be occupied and enjoyed in futuro. As no remainder can be created without such a precedent particular estate, therefore the particular estate is said to support the remainder. But a lease at will is not held to be such a particular estate as will support a remainder over. For an estate at will is of a nature so slender and precarious that it is not looked upon as a portion of the inheritance, and a portion must first be taken out of it in order to constitute a remainder. Besides, if it be a freehold remainder, livery of sizin must be given at the time of its creation and the entry of the grantor to do this determines the estate at will in the very instant in which it is made, or if it to be a chattel interest, though perhaps it might operate as a future contract, if the tenant for years be a party to the deed of creation, yet it is void by way of remainder, or it is a separate independent contract distinct from the precedent estate at will and every remainder must be part of one and the same estate out of which the preceding particular estate is taken. And hence, it is generally true that if the particular estate is void in its creation, or by any means is defeated afterwards, 
the remainder supported thereby shall be defeated also, as where the particular estate is an estate for the life of a person not in esse, or an estate for life upon condition, on breach of which condition the grantor enters and avoids the estate, in either of these cases the remainder over is void. 2. A second rule to be observed is this, that the remainder must commence or pass out of the grantor at the time of the creation of the particular estate. As, where there is an estate to A for life, with remainder to B in fee. Here B's remainder in fee passes from the grantor at the same time that Sizen is delivered to A of his estate in possession. And it is this which induces the necessity at common law of livery of Sizen being made on the particular estate whenever a freehold remainder is created. For, if it be limited even on an estate for years, it is necessary that the lessee for years should have livery of sizen in order to convey the freehold from and out of the grantor, otherwise the remainder is void. Not that the livery is necessary to strengthen the estate for years, but as livery of the land is requisite to convey the freehold and yet cannot be given to him in remainder without infringing the possession of the lessee for years, therefore, the law allows such livery made to the tenant of the particular estate to relate and inure him in remainder as both are but one estate in law. 3. A third rule respecting remainders is this, that the remainder must vest in the grantee during the continuance of the particular estate or eo instante that it determines. As... If A be tenant for life, remainder to B in tail, here B's remainder is vested in him at the creation of the particular estate to A for life. Or, if A and B be tenants for their joint lives, remainder to the survivor in fee, here, though during their joint lives the remainder is vested in neither, yet on the death of either of them, the remainder vests instantly in the survivor, wherefore both these are good remainders. But if an estate be limited to A for life, remainder to the eldest son of B in tail, and A dies before B hath any son, here the remainder will be void, for it did not vest in any one during the continuance, nor at the determination of the particular estate. And, even supposing that B should afterwards have a son, he shall not take by this remainder. For, as it did not vest at or before the end of the particular estate, it never can vest at all, but is gone forever. And this depends upon the principle before laid down, that the precedent particular estate and the remainder are one estate in law. They must therefore subsist and be in esse at one and the same instant of time, either during the continuance of the first estate or at the very instant when that determines, so that no other estate can possibly come between them. For there can be no intervening estate between the particular estate and the remainder supported thereby. The thing supported must fall to the ground if once its support be severed from it. It is upon these rules, but principally the last, that the doctrine of contingent remainders depends. For remainders are either vested or contingent. Vested remainders, or remainders executed, whereby a present interest passes to the party, though to be enjoyed in futuro, are where the estate is invariably fixed to remain to a determinate person after the particular estate is spent. As if A be tenant for twenty years, remainder to be in fee. Here B's is a vested remainder, which nothing can defeat or set aside. Contingent or executory remainders, whereby no present interest passes, are where the estate and remainder is limited to take effect, either to a dubious and uncertain person, or upon a dubious and uncertain event, so that the particular estate may chance to be determined, and the remainder never take effect. First, 
they may be limited to a dubious and uncertain person. As if A be tenant for life, with remainder to B's eldest son then unborn in tail. This is a contingent remainder, for it is uncertain whether B will have a son or no, but the instant that a son is born, the remainder is no longer contingent, but vested. Though, if A had died before the contingency happened, that is, before B's son was born, the remainder would have been absolutely gone, for the particular estate was determined before the remainder could vest. Nay, by the strict rule of law, if A were tenant for life, remainder to his own eldest son and tail, and A died without issue born, but leaving his wife and faint or big with child, and after his death a posthumous son was born, this son could not take the land by virtue of this remainder. For the particular estate determined before there was any person in essay in whom the remainder could vest. But to remedy this hardship, it is enacted by statute 10 and 11, William III, C16, that posthumous children shall be capable of taking in remainder in the same manner as if they had been born in their father's lifetime. That is, the remainder is allowed to vest in them while yet in their mother's womb. This species of contingent remainders to a person not in being must, however, be limited to someone that may by common possibility or potentia propinqua be in esse at or before the particular estate determines. As if an estate be made to A for life, remainder to the heirs of B. Now, if A dies before B, the remainder is at an end for during B's life he has no heir, nema est aeris viventis. But if B dies first, the remainder then immediately vests in his heir, who will be entitled to the land on the death of A. This is a good contingent remainder, for the possibility of B's dying before A is potentia propinqua, and therefore allowed in law. But a remainder to the right heirs of B if there be no such person as B in esse, is void. For here, there must two contingencies happen. First, that such a person as B shall be born, and secondly, that he shall also die during the continuance of the particular estate, which make it a potentia remotissima, a most improbable possibility. A remainder to a man's eldest son, who hath none, we have seen is good, for by common possibility he may have one. But if it be limited in particular to his son John or Richard, it is bad if he have no son of that name, for it is too remote a possibility that he should not only have a son, but a son of a particular name. A limitation of a remainder to a bastard before it is born is not good. For though the law allows the possibility of having bastards, it presumes it to be a very remote and improbable contingency. Thus may a remainder be contingent on account of uncertainty of the person who is to take it. A remainder may also be contingent where the person to whom it is limited is fixed and certain, but the event upon which it is to take effect is vague and uncertain. As where land is given to A for life, and in case B survives him, then with the remainder to B in fee. Here B is a certain person, but the remainder to him is a contingent remainder dependent upon a dubious event, the uncertainty of his surviving A. During the joint lives of A and B, it is contingent, and if B dies first, it never can vest in his heirs, but is forever gone. But if A dies first, the remainder to B becomes vested. Contingent remainders of either kind, if they amount to a freehold, cannot be limited on an estate for years or any other particular estate less than a freehold. Thus, if land be granted to A for ten years, with remainder in fee to the right heirs of B, this remainder is void. But if granted to A for life, with a like reminder, it is good. 
or unless the freehold passes out of the grantor at the time when the remainder is created, such freehold remainder is void. It cannot pass out of him without vesting somewhere, and in the case of a contingent remainder, it must vest in the particular tenant, else it can vest nowhere, unless, therefore, the estate of such particular tenant be of a freehold nature, the freehold cannot vest in him, and consequently, the remainder is void. End of chapter 11, part 1. Chapter 11, part 2 of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, book 2, by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes. Of Estates in Possession, Remainder and Reversion, Part 2. Contingent remainders may be defeated by destroying or determining the particular estate upon which they depend before the contingency happens whereby they become vested. Therefore, when there is tenant for life, with diverse remainders in contingency, he may, not only by his death, but by alienation, surrender, or other methods, destroy and determine his own life estate before any of those remainders vest, the consequence of which is that he utterly defeats them all. As, if there be a tenant for life, with remainder to his eldest son unborn in tail, and the tenant for life, before any son is born, surrenders his life estate, he by that means defeats the remainder in tail to his son. For his son not being in esse, when the particular estate determined, the remainder could not then vest, and, as it could not vest then, by the rules before laid down, it never can vest at all. In these cases, therefore, it is necessary to have trustees appointed to preserve the contingent remainders, in whom there is vested an estate and remainder for the life of the tenant for life, to commence when his determines. If, therefore, his estate for life determines otherwise than by his death, their estate, for the residue of his natural life, will then take effect and become a particular estate in possession, sufficient to support the remainders depending in contingency. This method is said to have been invented by Sir Orlando Bridgman, Sir Geoffrey Palmer, and other eminent counsel who betook themselves to conveyancing during the time of the civil wars, in order thereby to secure in family settlements a provision for the future children of an intended marriage who before were usually left at the mercy of particular tenant for life, and when, after the restoration, those gentlemen came to fill in the first offices of the law, they supported this invention within reasonable and proper bounds and introduced it into general use. Thus, the student will observe how much nicety is required in creating and securing a remainder and I trust he will in some measure see the general reasons upon which this nicety is founded. It were endless to attempt to enter upon the particular subtleties and refinements into which this doctrine, by the variety of cases which have occurred in the course of many centuries, has been spun out and subdivided. Neither are they consonant to the design of these elementary disquisitions. I must not, however, omit that in devices by last will and testament, which, being often drawn up when the party is in ops concili, are always more favored in the construction than formal deeds, which are presumed to be made with great caution, forethought, and advice. In these devices, I say, remainders may be created in some measure contrary to the rules before laid down though our lawyers will not allow such dispositions to be strictly remainders, but call them by another name, that of executory devices, or devices hereafter to be executed. 
an executory device of lands is such a disposition of them by will that thereby no estate vests at the death of the divisor, but only on some future contingency. It differs from a remainder in three very material points. 1. That it needs not any particular estate to support it. 2. That by it a fee simple or other less estate may be limited after a fee simple. 3. That by this means a remainder may be limited of a chattel interest after a particular estate for life created in the same. 1. The first case happens when a man devises a future estate to arise upon a contingency, and till that contingency happens, does not dispose of the fee simple, but leaves it to descend to his heir at law. As if one devises land to a femme soul and her heirs upon the day of her marriage, here is in effect a contingent remainder without any particular estate to support it, a freehold commencing in futuro. This limitation, though it would be void in a deed, yet is good in a will by way of executory device. 4. Since by a device a freehold may pass without corporal tradition or livery of sizen, as it must do if it passes at all, therefore it may commence in futuro because the principal reason why it cannot commence in futuro in other cases is the necessity of actual sizen, which always operates in presenti. And, since it may thus commence in futuro, there is no need of a particular state to support it, the only use of which is to make the remainder, by its unity with the particular estate, a present interest. And hence also it follows that such an executory device, not being a present interest, cannot be barred by a recovery suffered before it commences. 2. By executory device, a fee or other less estate may be limited after a fee. And this happens where a devisor devises his whole estate in fee, but limits a remainder thereon to commence on a future contingency as if a man devises land to A and his heirs, but he dies before the age of twenty-one, then to B and his heirs, the remainder, though void in a deed, is good by way of executory device. But, in both these species of executory devices, the contingencies ought to be such as may happen within a reasonable time, as within one or more life or lives in being, or within a moderate term of years. For courts of justice will not indulge even wills so as to create a perpetuity which the law abhors, because by perpetuities, or the settlement of an interest which shall go into the succession prescribed without any power of alienation, estates are made incapable of answering those ends of social commerce and providing for the sudden contingencies of private life for which property was at first established. The utmost length that has been hitherto allowed for the contingency of an executory device of either kind to happen in is that of a life or lives in being and one and twenty years afterwards. As when lands are devised to such unborn son of a femme covert as shall first attain the age of twenty one and his heirs, the utmost length of time that can happen before the estate can vest is the life of the mother and the subsequent infancy of her son, and this hath been decreed to be a good executory device. 3. By executory device, a term of years may be given to one man for his life, and afterwards limited over, in remainder to another, which could not be done by deed. For by law, the first grant of it, to a man for life, was a total disposition of the whole term, a life estate being esteemed of a higher and larger nature than any term of years. And, at first the courts were tender, even in cases of a will, of restraining the devisee for life from alienating the term, but only held that in case he died without exerting that act of ownership, the remainder over should then take place, 
For the restraint of the power of alienation, especially in very long terms, was introducing a species of perpetuity. But soon afterwards it was held that the devisee for life hath no power of alienating the term, so as to bar the remainder man. Yet, in order to prevent the danger of perpetuities, it was settled that, though such remainders may be limited to as many persons successively as the divisor thinks proper, yet they must all be in essay during the life of the first devisee. For then all the candles are lighted and are consuming together, and the ultimate remainder is in reality only to that remainder man who happens to survive the rest, or that such remainder may be limited to take effect upon such contingency only as must happen, if at all, during the life of the first devisee. Thus much for such estates in expectancy as are created by the express words of the parties themselves, the most intricate title in the law. There is yet another species which is created by the act and operation of the law itself, and this is called a reversion. 3. An estate in reversion is the residue of an estate left in the grantor to commence in possession after the determination of some particular estate granted out by him. Sir Edward Coke describes a reversion to be the returning of land to the grantor or his heirs after the grant is over. As, if there be a gift in tale, the reversion of the fee is, without any special reservation, vested in the donor by act of law. And so also, the reversion, after an estate for life, years, or at will, continues in the lessor. For the fee simple of all lands must abide somewhere, and if he, who was before possessed of the whole, carves out of it any smaller estate and grants it away, whatever is not so granted remains in him. A reversion is never, therefore, created by deed or writing, but arises from construction of law. A remainder can never be limited unless by either deed or device. But both are equally transferable when actually vested, being both estates in presenti, though taking effect in futuro. The doctrine of reversions is plainly derived from the feudal constitution. For when a feud was granted to a man for life, or to him and his issue male, rendering either rent or other services, then, on his death or the failure of issue male, the feud was determined and resulted back to the lord or proprietor to be again disposed of at his pleasure. And hence, the usual incidents to reversions are said to be fealty and rent. When no rent is reserved on the particular estate, fealty, however, results, of course, as an incident quite inseparable and may be demanded as a badge of tenure or acknowledgement of superiority, being frequently the only evidence that the lands are holden at all. Where rent is reserved, it is also incident, though not inseparably so, to the reversion. The rent may be granted away, reserving the reversion and the reversion may be granted away, reserving the rent, by special words. But by a general grant of the reversion, the rent will pass with it, as incident thereunto, though by grant of rent generally, the reversion will not pass. The incident passes by the grant of the principal, but not a converso. For the maxim of law is, accessorium non ducit, sed sequitur, Sum principali. These incidental rights of the reversioner and the respective modes of descent, in which remainders very frequently differ from reversions, have occasioned the law to be careful in distinguishing the one from the other, however inaccurately the parties themselves may describe them. For if one, seized of a paternal estate in fee, makes a lease for life, with remainder to himself and his heirs, this is properly a mere reversion to which rent and fealty shall be incident, and which shall only descend to the heirs of his father's blood, and not to his heirs general, 
as a remainder limited to him by a third person would have done. For it is the old estate which was originally in him, and never yet was out of him. And so likewise, if a man grants a lease for life to A, reserving rent, with reversion to B and his heirs, B hath a remainder, descendable to his heirs general, and not a reversion to which the rent is incident. But the grantor shall be entitled to the rent during the continuance of A's estate. In order to assist such persons as have any estate in remainder, reversion, or expectancy after the death of others against fraudulent concealments of their deaths, it is enacted by the statute 6 and C18 that all person on whose lives any lands or tenements are holden shall, upon application to the court of chancery and order made thereupon, once in every year, if required, be produced to the court or its commissioners, or, upon neglect or refusal, they shall be taken to be actually dead, and the person entitled to such expected estate may enter upon and hold the lands and tenements till the party shall appear to be living. Before we conclude the doctrine of remainders and reversions, it may be proper to observe that whenever a greater estate and a less coincide and meet in one and the same person, without any intermediate estate, the less is immediately annihilated, or, in the law phrase, is said to be merged, that is, sunk or drowned in the greater. Thus, if there be tenant for years, and the reversion in fee simple descends to or is purchased by him, the term of years is merged in the inheritance and shall never exist any more. But they must come to one in the same person in one in the same right, else if the freehold be in his own right, and he has a term of right in another, and out der droit, there is no merger. Therefore, if a tenant for years dies, and makes him who hath the reversion in fee his executor, whereby the term of years vests also in him, the term shall not merge, for he hath the fee in his own right, and the term of years in the right of the testator, and subject to his debts and legacies. So also, if he who hath reversion in fee marries the tenant for years, there is no merger. For he hath the inheritance in his own right, the lease in the right of his wife. An estate tale is an exception to this rule. For a man may have in his own right both the estate tale and the reversion in fee. And the estate tale, though a less estate, shall not merge in the fee. For estates tale are protected and preserved from merger by the operation and construction though not by the express words of the statute de donis, which operation and construction have probably arisen upon this consideration, that in the common cases of merger of estates for life or years, by uniting with the inheritance, the particular tenant hath the sole interest in them, and hath full power at any time to defeat, destroy, or surrender them to him that hath the reversion. Therefore, when such an estate unites with the reversion in fee, the law considers it in the light of a virtual surrender of the inferior estate. But in an estate tale, the case is otherwise. The tenant for a long time had no power at all over it, so as to bar or destroy it, and now can only do it by certain special modes, by a fine, a recovery, and the like. It would, therefore, have been strangely improvident to have permitted the tenant in tail, by purchasing the reversion in fee, to merge his particular estate and defeat the inheritance of his issue. And hence, it has become a maxim that a tenancy in tail, which cannot be surrendered, cannot also be merged in the fee. End of chapter 11, part 2.